Be Me, B15, 2009, Loved Call of Duty 4 so much, Loved All Gillied Up so much, Favorite Level, I would often reenact levels in my yard with imaginary guns and stuff. I was also abnormally tall for 15, this is important, like 6'2". Heard senior prom was coming up and since I was a sophomore I couldn't go. Girl across the street was having people over for pictures. Now at proms what happens is that when you go to take photos, people park their cars bumper to bumper. Reminded me of all gillied up when Macmillan and Price crawl under the cars. This gives me an idea JPEG. From what I learned from Stephanie, the girl across the street, they were going to go drinking and shit in the nature reserve after prom, maybe have some sex. Figure I might spy on them and pretend one is Zakhaev and shoot him. Borrow my friend's ghillie suit. Wait until prom. When everyone's taking photos, I put on the ghillie suit. It was a little dark by this time, 7 o'clock, and I had cover. Ah, it's a bloody convention out there. When they leave, crawl out and stay low, I say as I see the crowd. I wait for one of the dads to move. Hold. He moves. Okay, go. And so I ran, exactly as Macmillan does, while even making the sounds of the music from that level. Start crawling under the cars. Holy autism dot mosaic. It's a bit of a tighter squeeze than I thought. Pretty tough, but I'm skinny, so it works. When I get to one end of the cars, people are starting to leave. I say fuck it and run out from under the cars over to a tree in my neighbor's lawn. I hear someone say, what the fuck was that? I run back to the beginning of the woods and look back. People are looking in my direction, mostly kids, and they look sort of shaken. They keep wondering what it was that ran past them. I run back to my house when I see one of the dads and one of the seniors, named Jake, start to walk across the street. I say to myself, what the bloody hell was that? You trying to get us killed? Night comes. I pass the time playing Modern Warfare 2. No Macmillan. I'm sad. In the woods, I see lights. It's the seniors. No, it's the ultra-nationalists. Kill Zakhaev. Throw on my ghillie suit. Run into the forest. Stalk the seniors, about ten of them, through the trails. I'm snapping a lot of twigs and shit following them. What the fuck is that? One of them says. What? It's me. I run to a safer location. Hello? Stephanie calls out. If they see me, everyone will think I'm autistic. They keep walking, and I realize I got too close to them. I say in a horrible Scottish accent, Are you daft? Say the fuck out of the radioactive areas. No, that was terrible. That was horrid. What the fuck was that? One of them says. What was that? They're seriously scared. They book it to the campsite, and I tiptoe behind them. When they get there, they set up camp. I live in the south, so one of the guys brings a gun. His date is complaining. I brought it in case that thing from Stephanie's house comes back. What if that was it earlier on our way here? Oh my god, stop. The females whisper in unison like a choir of alley cats. The guy, Dave, looks into the woods with his guns while his date starts drinking and inviting him to join her. He's got his eyes fixed on the woods. I pretend he's an ultra-nationalist who spotted me. I run for cover. I heard something, he shouts. Everyone's getting scared. Girls want to go home. The men decide to be noble and go find the fucker stalking them. I bolt. An hour later, I'm still in the nature preserve, looking for a way out. All of a sudden, I run into the guys. I pretend it's that part of all gillied up when Price and Macmillan crawl through the grass past the ultra-nationalist patrol. I go prone and try to slip past them. Instead, I lay in deer shit and get it smeared on my friend's ghillie suit, but I continue. Macmillan would have wanted it. They pass me, talking about the creature they saw. Lol, what? What did you see, Jake? It was huge, like six feet, hairy as fuck, and it was like walking like it had a limp. I do not walk like that. I do not walk like that. I should probably point out that my Macmillan impression sounds like I have a bunch of marbles in my mouth while I get deep throated by Mandingo and Danny D at the same time. I do my accent and say with all my autism, Pooch doesn't look too friendly. They freak the fuck out and I run. I heard it, that's it. I keep running and see lights. Maybe I'm home? Nope, campsite. A girl shines a light into the woods, it hits me. Macmillan would be disappointed. Hello? Say nothing, just stare. Macmillan would have shot her. What do you want, creep? A girl waves to get my attention. Pull my mask down to see if she would recognize me from school so she wouldn't get scared. 
I smile, but due to autism, I smile really wide and with my eyes wide like a deer getting ass rammed. I wave, but it's cold as fuck so I'm shaking a ton and it looks like I'm having a seizure. They scream, it's mimicking us, the thing is here, Stephanie shouts. I run again. I kept running that night, but ran into the group again. Turns out they had split up to search for the creature, but two of them, Susie and Noah, got lost. They're calling out for Susie. I like Susie, and this fits, so I shout in my Scottish accent, Oi, Susie! A guy shoots at me with his AR. Macmillan would have topped him. He is shooting wildly. Kill that fucking monster, one shouts. I run out of there while screaming loudly, Susie! Susie! Hoping they'll know I'm helping. I slip and fall into a small pit. Did you smell that? One says. I'm still splattered in deer shit. They follow my trail, and Dave reaches the edge of the pit. Found it, he cries. Then he slips and falls, hits his head on a rock. Is out cold, bleeding. I scream and bolt. I can hear the group screaming, It got Dave! They think I killed Dave. Target neutralized, I say. Eventually, I realize I've been going in circles because I end up back at the camp. I get an idea. Trash it. Throw shit around and set things on fire. Then I say, Look at this place. 50,000 people used to live in the city. Now it's a ghost town. Never seen anything like it. When the group comes back, they see their camp trashed. They left Dave in the woods for some reason. I was really cold, so I threw on some of Noah's extra clothes to keep warm. They see me. Noah, one shouts. I'm confused. Noah? <laughs> they stop. My face when I'm still using my Scottish accent. They're frozen. One girl tries to approach me. Jake pulls her back. That's not Noah anymore, he says. Noah was the class clown and had a lot of funny catchphrases. So to calm them down, I do an impression of him and say, What's swaggin? This scares them even more. Apparently, he said that right before he disappeared. What? Jake charges me. I run. Getting sick of hearing that? He catches me. I'm bigger, so I punch him and he falls. I pull him by his leg into the dark to punch him more. The group is screaming. The others are too scared to help. I beat him up while shouting Macmillan lines in a Scottish accent. It sounds like William Wallace had suddenly come out of the trees and decided to savage one of the group members. He's bloody, and I run so I won't get in trouble. The group freaks out. I stagger a lot, leaving blood all over the trees and stuff. My hand hurts from punching him a ton. I scream, or screaming from the woods. I get back home, shower, and play all gillied up for real. When I return to my friend's ghillie suit, he tells me that apparently there's a hairy monster man in the woods. I'm scared until I read the newspaper. Bloody trails all over the woods, two teens beaten and bloodied. Susie was found stuck in the mud. They never found Noah. Jake and Dave ended up in the hospital. Friends say they saw Noah attack Jake and then disappear. Say the creature was dark, hairy, smelly, ran fast, was tall and gaunt, and mimicked humans. Two years later, some Anon posts about it on Kuk Chan's B-Board. Called it a skinwalker. My face won, I was a skinwalker. Macmillan would have been proud. Grow up in the countryside. Homeschooled, because my parents don't trust the government. Otherwise, they were great parents though. Don't have any neighbors or siblings, so no friends. Parents buy me comic books to spark my imagination. Start really enjoying Spider-Man. White Spider-Man becomes my favorite. Pick related, so my parents make me a costume for my 10th birthday. Wear it every day. Parents encourage me to play outside more. Nothing out there, dodge if. Whatever. Pretend to be Spider-Man while jumping around the forest. Fast forward a few years. Always been tall for my age, and by the time I'm 15, I'm 6 foot. Never really did sports though, except for running around the forest like Spider-Man, which I was getting pretty good at. So, pretty thin and lanky. One evening, around 6ish, while playing near the road into the town, I see a car's headlights stopped still on the road. Go to investigate. Peering from the trees, I see some teenagers, maybe 18 or so, standing around the car. First time I've seen people other than my parents in years. Can't make out what they're saying, but they seem distressed and jittery. Want to go ask if I could help, but scared they won't like me. One of them peers in my direction. It's around sunset, so there's not loads of light. Unsure if he can see me or not. Our eyes lock for what feels like hours. Hear boom and instinctively drop into a prone position. 
Guy looks away briefly as the car starts smoking. He looks back towards me, but his gaze never settles. Wonder what he's looking for. Another one loudly says a naughty word. They grab all their stuff from the car and carry on on foot. Want to learn more, so decide to follow them. Take off my Spider-Man mask so they'll know I'm not really Spider-Man if they see me, but try to stay hidden because I think they might not like me. In my head, I'm their guardian angel. After about an hour, they come to a clearing. They begin to set up camp. Realize this is the same clearing where I reenact my Justice League operas. My limited edition Superman action figure is still buried there in a stunning twist when Zod imprisoned him at the end of my last episode. Think I can casually walk over and explain the situation, but notice one of them is standing by their camp's outskirts looking pretty intimidatingly into the forest. It's the same guy who was staring in my direction earlier. Decide to call him Weird Al. Circle around the forest surrounding the opening, looking for the easiest way to sneak into the camp. A twig snaps beneath me. Suddenly, Weird Al reacts really fast. Notice he's holding a gun and pointing it in my direction. Don't think he can see me though since he keeps moving his aim around. Realize they're playing commandos. Pretty soon they get a fire going. It's pretty dark by now. Weird Al is sitting with the others in a circle around the fire. Can hear them talking and laughing. Want to know what they're saying, and still want my Superman figure back. Crawl on all fours towards their camp cause I'm still playing Spider-Man. Certain they can't see me in this dark. Get close enough to make out what they're saying. Talking about ghosts and urban legends. Never heard a good ghost story outside my comic books before. Lie on the ground listening. Eventually, fall asleep to their stories. Wake up a couple hours later. Fire's still burning, but they're all gone. Probably inside their tents. Stomach rumbling .jpg. See they left some bags of food around. Figure they won't mind if I take some. Some weird plastic wrapping with something crunchy inside. Have to rip it open, but inside is a salty treat. Remember to grab my Spider-Man. Dig around and retrieve it. Worry about the fire. Notice it's attracting moths. I don't want these guys to be attacked by a swarm of moths in the morning. Also, don't want to contribute to greenhouse gases unnecessarily. Use one of their water bottles to douse out the fire. Decide to head home for the night, but promise myself to visit them again tomorrow to see how they're doing. Scamper away on all fours because I remember I'm still supposed to be Spider-Man. The next day, don't tell my parents about the campers because I've never had real friends and I'm scared my parents will grow concerned. Return around 5 in the afternoon with binoculars this time so I can pretend I have Spidey vision. Just before sunset so it's still bright enough. Still wearing my Spider-Man suit without the mask. Again, wait at the edge of the clearing in the forest, spying on them through my binoculars. They've got new firewood. Lots of it. Appear to be cooking a rabbit. Not cool, guys. Rabbits are our friends. Begin to wonder what rabbit tastes like. Remember, I need to focus. Weird Owl is by their tent, looking at the forest gun by side. On the other side of the fire, one of his friends is looking out the other direction and appears to have a gun too. I see they're finally taking commando seriously. The other three people, two girls and a guy, are sitting close together. The guy is tending to a rabbit and the girls are wrapped up in a blanket. Watch them for a while. One of the girls reminds me of Mary Jane. Wonder if she could be my girlfriend, like in the comic. Eventually, go back to Weird Al. Feel something on my shoulder. Drop my binocs as I swat a spider away. Hear shouting. Look over at the camp. Weird Al is pointing his gun in my direction and shouting. The cooking trio back away. The other guy with the gun rushes to Weird Al's side. I'll call him Friendly Steve because he seems less tense. Friendly Steve points his gun in my direction too. What the fuck? Decide he's more like Angry Steve. Not entirely convinced they're actually aiming at me. Start circling the edge again like last night. They seem to move their aim with me. Hmm. Weird Al starts shouting at me. Can't make out what he's saying. It's better to say nothing and have people think you're stupid than open your mouth and confirm your stupidity. Shouts at me again. Have no idea what to do. Parents were right. I am too immature for social situations. Tony Stark would surely know what to do. Suddenly, hear a loud bang and the tree next to me explodes. Well, a chunk of it explodes off. Instinctively crouch in a prone position. Several more bangs. 
can't see Weird Al or Angry Steve very well because they're surrounded by smoke, but see a few flashes of light. Eventually realize they were shooting at me. What is, is this guy deaf? What the fuck? What did I ever do to them though? Run off on all fours again. With my experience, it's much faster than running. The fuck? What is he? Is, he is not human. This guy's actually a skinwalker. Get home and start crying. Parents ask me what's wrong. I tell them I met some cool youths and they didn't like me. Parents hug me and tell me maybe it's because of my costume. Mom thinks it's proof I'm not ready to have friends. Dad insists that this could be good since I'm showing initiative by going out to meet people. They settle on dressing me appropriately tomorrow so I could reintroduce myself. They assure me that if I just be myself, the kids will like me. Take comfort in their words. Next day, dress in an old t-shirt and sweatpants. Put on my best smile and head out to meet them. Mum offers me some cherries before I leave for good luck. Don't mind if I do. Must have eaten like 30 cherries. Had cherry juice all over my mouth. As I'm wandering through the forest, cherries attract flies which cause me to stop paying attention and I slip into deer feces. On the verge of tears cause I smell like deer shit. Wanna head back, but no. I have to be strong if I'm ready for friends. Heading towards camp, I see Mary Jane wandering around the forest. She keeps calling out a name. Ben, I think. Stand still watching her. She sees me. At first, she winces. Remember what my parents told me about being social. Smile at Mary Jane. Smile and the world smiles with you after all. She doesn't smile. She takes a step back. Have you seen my friend Ben? She says. She says it really fast. Repeat it back to her a couple of times to digest it and look down. Oh no. My parents say it's rude to break eye contact. Look back at her in the eye. Well? She says. Again, I repeat it. Think and then say, Your friend Ben, I have not seen. So she'll think I'm mysterious and mystic. Notice she's covering her nose. Why? She suddenly looks really scared. I go to comfort her and she immediately runs off into the forest. That was weird. Carry on and come to the old factory river. You should never swim in it because there was a factory upstream that leaked its sewage into it. My dad was really upset about it, but apparently it wasn't illegal due to some weird loophole or something. You're talking. Crouch low and walk downstream towards the voices, hiding behind the bushes. See Weird Al and Angry Steve playing in the water. See all their stuff about 100 meters away on the shore. They're guns. Guns are bad, my parents always say, and as the only resident on site, it's my duty to confiscate them until they're ready to leave. Walk over and take them. Weird Owl and Angry Steve don't even notice. Too busy playing. Guns are heavy, and so after around 20 minutes, I put them in a ditch and cover them with leaves so I could get them later. Carry on towards their camp. Get there and it's empty. Not a soul in sight. Rabbit leftovers are on a spit around the fire's remains. Since there's no one around, I decide to take a bite of the rabbit just to taste it. Easier said than done. End up accidentally breaking the spit trying to tear a bit off. Lose my balance and trample over one of the tents. Whoops. Draw a peace sign in the dirt in Kryptonian as a way of apologizing. The rabbit didn't even taste very good in the end. Make my way back home. I would return in the evening. Get Stark out and I've changed my clothes. I'd completely forgotten about the cherries on my face. Mary Jane must have thought I was some sort of cherry bandit. Face is all washed now though. Put on my best suit. After all, this is my last chance to make friends. Thinking about it, up until she ran away, me and Mary Jane actually got on pretty well. Maybe there's hope for us yet. Work my way back to the edge of the clearing. Their camp has a huge fire. They're all out of sight though. No stories or cooking. See that they didn't put the tent I trod on back up. See the other tents rustle. Weird Owl rushes out past the fire. In the moonlight, I just about make out him running 20 meters or so and then stopping. He stands still for another 30 seconds with his back to the camp before running back to camp. Just before he reaches the fire, he stops and looks in my direction. Has he seen me? Hurrah! I could finally introduce myself. He starts shaking and shouting. 
Not wanting a repeat of yesterday, I make myself visible by stepping out of the bushes so they don't think I'm a deer or something. Weird Al shouts at me, and this time, I hear what he says. Ben? Is that you? I repeat it back, then realize what I said. Of course I'm not Ben, idiot. Remember to smile. Find it hard to smile and talk, so just shake my head. End up accidentally shaking my whole body. By now, the rest of the gang has come out of the tent. I say the rest, but there's only four of them. One of the guys is missing. Oh, that must be the spend they were asking about. Begin to wonder myself where he is. They're all staring at me weirdly and shivering even though it's summer. Where's Ben? I shout. Angry Steve whispers to Weird Al and Weird Al shouts back that he doesn't know. Then he shouts at me. What have you done with Ben? If this is a game, I don't get it. Decide the only way to earn their trust is to impress them. Drop down in all fours and do my Spider-Man crawl so they'll see how agile I am. They immediately scream and all run away. How weird. Run after them. Matching their pace is surprisingly easy. Maybe because the girls had short legs. Follow Weird Owl into the forest. The forest shields the moonlight so I can only see a silhouette. He turns to me. Roger, did you see that thing? It looked human, but it's movements. Can't think of anything to say, so just nod. Weird Owl keeps talking, saying how useful his AR would be right now. No idea what he means. Eventually, meet up with the others. Celebrations all around. Finally, they accept me. They must have been impressed by my Spider-Man crawl after all. Angry Steve says they should try to find the car. What about Ben? I muster in my best Weird Al impression to show I'm one of many talents. I hate to say it, James, but I think he's gone, says the girl who's not Mary Jane. Who on earth is James? Suddenly, Mary Jane stops walking. What is it, Sam? Angry Steve asks. Mary Jane whispers in his ear. He raises his arm and starts pointing at us while counting. Ben's not here, he says, very slowly. Weird Al replies, Yeah? Before suddenly standing up straight, he just screams, Run! And takes off. Everyone scatters. Begin to think my new friends are a little weird. Decide to go home. Never did find out what happened to Ben. But that forest is full of ditches, so he was probably just playing hide and seek. Still can't believe Weird Al and Angry Steve were playing in the water. My dad says the factory's chemicals mean that bathing in it will make your hair fall out for sure. Anyway, that's my weird story. Heading into the woods on a camping trip with college buddies. Me, girlfriend, now ex, Sarah. Her friend, Jill. Jill's roommate, Rachel. Rachel was kind of weird, very petite always wore an old army jacket that was too big on her. Pixie haircut. She was orphaned at 14, refused to be adopted or fostered, basically struck off on her own at 16, did not like being touched, and rumor was that someone tried to rape her while she was on her own, got free ride through college because lol orphan. My roommate Steve, the nerdy guy. My friend Fred. He was Japanese and his name wasn't actually Fred. We called him that because his freshman year he dressed like Fred from Scooby-Doo. Fred's roommate, Bill. Bill had a reputation as a creeper, but he was a really nice guy, did charity stuff, and would give you the shirt off his back. Before I really knew him well, I called him for help when I got stranded on the roadside. He drove three hours in the middle of the night to come get me, and he didn't even know my name at the time. Bill was a survivalist and a nerd, so he was constantly bombarding us with random trivia and survival stuff. He once showed me some smoke grenades he'd rebuilt in chlorine gas grenades. Why? Because he could. Bill, needless to say, had never been laid in his entire life. We all head into the woods to stay at a cabin Steve's uncle had built. We get there and the cabin is… shit. It's literally made of plywood with exposed insulation. There are no windows and only three rooms. It does have a nice wood burning stove though. Set up sleeping bags on the old army cots in the two bedrooms, girls in one room and boys in the other. We start a fire in the wood stove to warm the place up and start talking about what we're going to do in the morning. Cook chili on top of stove. Fred and Bill start trading racist jokes aimed at one another. It's their thing. Bill is practically a white supremacist, and Fred is so nationalistic he thinks the Japanese Empire should have won World War II. Naturally, Fred and Bill get along, and that's why they became roommates. Girls are weirded out by their antics, except Rachel, who's ignoring us all and playing with the Zippo. 
Jill needs to pee. Only place to do it is behind a bush. Girls go together for some reason and we can hear them giggling and talking while Jill squats behind the bush. Ignore them and laugh while Bill tells Fred his ancestors weren't nuked enough and Fred calls him a filthy gaijin round eye. Girls suddenly come running back, complaining about a stench. What stench? Oh fuck. It smells like roadkill, rotting in the sun, and something metallic, like burnt copper or smoldering wire. Holy hell, did that come out of you? Joe squawks in indignation. We all head inside to get away from the stench. Bill and Fred finish their racist jokes aimed at each other and move on to mocking Jews and the Holocaust. Girls give them a look that says they will never get laid, ever. Suddenly, there is a loud screech outside the cabin. Sounds like a woman being murdered. Everyone but Bill jumps and looks at the door. Bill calmly announces, It's a fox. Chill. Conversation and dinner resume. Eventually, everyone heads to bed. Spend the next day hiking and exploring. Find a pond. The girls, minus Rachel, want to swim in it. Steve points out that it's too cold to swim and the pond is stagnant runoff from the hills. Bill suggests plinking and I get out my 22 rifle and we shoot at our empty chili cans. Everyone participates except Rachel, who just sort of stands off to one side, playing with her lighter. Bill suggests getting out his FAL and shooting with it, but the girls don't want to shoot a big gun. He's disappointed. I didn't even know he brought it, but this doesn't surprise me. Head back to the cabin to play Risk. Bill and Rachel end up wiping us all out and ending in a stalemate. Night falls. We build a fire in the stove again. Charades! Yes, we're that bored. Steve is pantomiming when suddenly there's a loud shriek outside. Was... was that another fox? Bill replies, Nope, that was a rabbit's death scream. That's the only time they make a sound. When they're dying. Well, thanks for that creepy trivia, Bill. Charades continue. Suddenly, horrid stench fills the cabin. Everyone complains and the girls retreat to their room to escape the smell. Thump against the door to the cabin, like a knock. What? Steve cautiously opens the door to investigate. Blood splattered on the door. There is a dead, disemboweled, skinless rabbit lying on the ground right outside the door. Did... did a fox throw a dead rabbit at our door? Creeped out, decide not to tell the girls. Nothing else happens. Stench fades away and we all go to bed. Next day goes much the same as the first. Hiking and exploring. Flirting with Sarah, my GF, constantly. Fred keeps hitting on Jill, who is doing her best to make it obvious she's ignoring his racist Asian ass. Bill keeps pointing out edible plants and other survival stuff to the group. I would suspect he was trying to impress the girls, but he always did that kind of thing. Did you know most praying mantises are actually agnostic? Lol what? Start a game of freeze tag in the woods. Girls cheat and combine tag with hide and seek. Everyone gets into it. Eventually, everyone has been discovered and tagged except Bill. Where the fuck is he? Give up and loudly shout for him to come out. Drops out of the tree we were all standing next to, grinning. You sneaky motherfucker. Head back to cabin. Everyone else plays Risk while I make out with Sarah in the back. Suddenly, Steve runs in and I yank my hand out of her bra. Dude, what the hell? What? How did you do that? Do what? Dude, could we get some privacy here? No, seriously, how did you do that? Do what? You were outside yelling for Bill to come out. When? Just now. Clearly, I've been in here the whole time and the only way out of this cabin is the front door. Dismiss it as a failed prank Steve was trying to pull on me. Back to sexy time. Yank my hand out of her bra a second time when Fred comes in and yells for us to come here quick. I'm pissed now. What the hell, guys? Shh, listen. I don't hear anything. What are you- Suddenly, I hear a voice out in the woods. Okay, Bill. Game's over. Come on out. It's the exact phrase I shouted earlier. Who the hell is in the woods repeating what I said? Fred looks at me and says, Dude, it sounds just like you. Whoever it is shouts again and it really does sound just like me. Who the hell is out there? Steve cracks the door open to peek outside. Doesn't see anything. Who's out there? Silence. Then, Okay, Bill. Game's over. Come on out. Bill shrugs and steps outside. I'm here. What do you want? Silence. Maybe whoever it is hadn't thought this far ahead. Bill stands there for a minute, then comes back inside. Dude, are you nuts? We don't know who could be out there. In typical Bill fashion, zero fucks were given. Instead, he calmly gets out his FAL, which is the biggest rifle I've ever seen, slaps a 30-round clip into it, and chambers around. It's a magazine, not a clip. 
Then, he turns on the flashlight, clipped on the barrel, and walks outside. If I'm not back in 10 minutes, leave without me. Dude, what the fuck? We wait. Steve's standing watch at the door. We can see Bill's flashlight bobbing around in the trees. We watch as he pauses, scans all around him, then continues deeper into the woods. After a while, we can't see his light through the trees anymore. Sarah and Jill are getting scared and retreat to their room. Rachel hangs out with us three guys as we wait for Bill to return. 20 minutes pass and no sign of Bill. If this is a joke, it's not funny. Fred swears it's not a joke. Or if it is, then Bill didn't tell him about it. I get my 22 rifle and load it. Fred retrieves a kukri knife from Bill's camping gear. Steve and Rachel are still standing at the front door. Suddenly, Steve calls out. Bill? I'm here. Fred and I come running back to the door and look outside. We can dimly see the silhouette of someone standing just inside the tree line. Bill, what took you so long? I'm here. Start getting a creepy vibe. Bill? What are you doing? What do you want? The hell? We want you to come back inside the cabin, dumbass. Then we see a dim light bobbing around in the trees in the direction Bill went. Wait. I'm suddenly deafened and partially blinded by the muzzle flash of a gunshot going off next to my head. Rachel has produced a snub nose revolver from somewhere within her jacket and fired a shot up into the air. We have guns. Whoever you are, leave us the hell alone. We can't see the figure out in the darkness anymore, but the light is bobbing faster as the owner runs towards the cabin. Bill bursts out of the tree line with his rifle. Why are you still here? I told you to leave if I took more than 10 minutes. I've been half an hour. Who's shooting? Dude, where the hell were you? Something was following me down the trail, so I fish hooked to ambush it. But it went back the way I came. I waited a little longer in case it was trying the same thing. Then I took my time coming back so I could hear if it followed me again. Then he gives us all a dirty look and says, I told you to leave my ass if I was gone for more than 10 minutes. It's lucky people have never seen these movies before. Jill and Rachel are freaked out over the person imitating us, and then the gunshot. Rachel just calmly swaps out the spent round in her revolver for a fresh one. I'm not sure she's even old enough to legally own a handgun. Well, now we know how she handled herself living on the streets as a homeless person. Bill gathers us in the front room and insists on a rational discussion of what's happened. We eventually decide it's someone pranking us, and they're just really good at imitating voices, and repeat the same phrases we shouted earlier, and is in the middle of nowhere fucking with some college students. Right. We all eventually go to sleep, but I noticed Bill kept his rifle within arm's reach. The next morning, there is a dead something or other with its skin missing and its guts splattered all over the front of the cabin. Bill thought it was either a possum or raccoon. The girls are thoroughly creeped out and insist on leaving. Sarah is convinced it's some serial killer and the dead animals are a warning or some sick gift. Bill isn't entirely convinced the dead animals weren't left there by a bobcat or something, but is also convinced there's a person out in the woods fucking with us. Steve and Fred don't know what the fuck is going on, but they don't think it's funny. We all eventually decide we're going to find whoever is messing with us and get them back. The girls are too scared to leave the cabin. Bill recruits Fred as his assistant and they spend the day building booby traps, digging pits, and rigging perimeter alarms from empty cans full of pebbles. Steve retrieves a hatchet from the woodpile and nominates himself captain of the creepy cabin self-defense squad since it's his uncle's place. Everyone basically ignores him and Bill becomes the de facto leader since he seems like he knows what he's doing. Finally, he and Fred finish whatever the hell they were doing out in the woods, and we all sit around the table, playing cards. None of us really know how to play poker, except Jill, who wipes us out. Fred suggests strip poker, which the girls immediately veto. Then we wait. And wait. And wait some more. At this point, I don't care how creepy the motherfucker is. Whoever is messing with us better show up, or I'm gonna be pissed. I regret that sentiment wholeheartedly. Just before sunset, Bill instructs Sarah and Jill to shelter in their back room and has me and Rachel guard the door with our guns. Fred and Steve, being armed with a hatchet and a kukri, are to guard the girls in the back while we defend the front door. What are you going to be doing? I'll be up in a tree, waiting to ambush whoever it is. They'll be expecting us all to be holed up in the cabin. Explain why this is a terrible idea. Bill ignores me and tells us not to shoot unless we know 100% for sure it isn't him. He disappears into the trees. Crazy motherfucker. Jill is insisting we all just go home. Sensible. And keeps asking how we know Bill isn't just an idiot who's making shit up to look good. Fred insists he knows what he's doing. We hear a rattle from one of our perimeter alarms. I crack the door open. I can't see anything outside. 
Who's out there? Come on out. It's my voice again. Who the hell are you? Come out where I can see you. I'm here. Bill's phrase, but my voice still. I'm seriously creeped out now. Come out where I can see you. I'm here. Come on out. Against my better judgment, I step outside the door and shine my flashlight at the trees. There's someone standing at the tree line with their back towards us. They're dressed the same as Bill, but they look filthy and its hair is longer. Who the hell are you? No response. Turn around so I can see you. Still nothing. It just stood there. I have a gun. I'll shoot you if you don't turn around. It didn't say anything, but whoever or whatever it was started convulsing like it was laughing hysterically, but there was no sound. You better leave us alone. This is our property. You better get out of here. It was still standing there with its back to us, but now it was jittering like it's hard to describe, but it's like it was under a strobe light or something. I take a step forward, keeping the flashlight and my 22 aimed at it. Do you hear me? I was debating what to do next and wondering where the hell Bill was when I smelled that stench again. It was so sudden and so foul, it was like being hit in the face with a brick. I gagged at the stink of a dead animal decomposing in raw sewage and mold, and my eyes watered. I looked back at the cabin, at the others, and Rachel and Steve both shouted in shock. I spun around and whatever the hell it was, was suddenly much closer. Halfway between the tree line and cabin, with its back still towards us, I scrambled backwards towards the cabin. I will never forget what happened next. Fred holds the kukri over his head in a two-handed grip and no shit screams, Banzai! Charges out of the cabin towards the creepy strobe light person. No wonder he gets along so well with Bill. They're both crazy motherfuckers. Fred runs past me, then immediately trips over a piece of stray firewood and face plants into the dirt, dropping his big ass knife. The person is convulsing like something is crawling under its skin and clothes. Rachel is shouting for us to get back inside the cabin and waving her revolver around. And suddenly, the night is shattered by a deafening boom. The creeper freezes motionless. Boom. Boom. Even louder than the gunshots is an ear-splitting shriek. If a banshee and a cougar were slowly lowered into a wood chipper, it wouldn't sound half as loud or disturbing as whatever the hell this scream was. The creepy person vanishes like they were never there. Bill sprints into view, switches on the flashlight on his rifle, and scans the tree line. I told you it needs to stay in the cabin. After some shouting back and forth, Bill and Fred investigate outside while the rest of us go back inside the cabin. They find some blood where the thing had been standing, or at least they think it's blood because it's pitch black. They can't find any footprints anywhere, and other than the alarm that was shaken when it first appeared, none of the booby traps were tripped. They come back inside the cabin and the rest of us have decided, fuck this, we're getting the hell out of Dodge. Bill calmly loads three rounds into his magazine to replace the ones he shot and asks if we really want to load our stuff into the van in the dark with that thing out there. Good point. We all pack our shit anyways so we could leave at first light. Everyone is too keyed up to sleep and sits up. The stench returns. The dead animal and burning copper smell. What the hell is that smell? Do you think it's the thing? Probably, but we didn't smell it earlier when it was- Something just smacked into the wall of the cabin. Dead silence as we all grasp weapons, makeshift or otherwise, and nervously listen. After a long moment, something thuds against the wall again. We don't move a muscle. Something began scratching at the door, like slowly dragging our nails down the length of the door, then starting again after reaching the bottom. Who's there? I'm here. Come on out. It was Steve's voice this time, and he paled visibly when he heard it. Fuck you. Who are you? What do you want? Game's over. Come on out. That's when Rachel fired a shot through the door. Despite the ringing in my ears, I could hear what sounded like the world's nastiest catfight as something screeched, hissed, spat, and slammed into the door repeatedly. She fired a second shot and the noise stopped. After a long, uncomfortable silence, we heard the screeching again, but far off into the woods. Bill opened the door and told everyone, Get your shit in the van, we're leaving. As we started throwing shit in the van, I noticed Bill had disappeared around the side of the cabin that the thumps on the wall had come from. I tossed the last of my stuff in the van, then followed. We found out what I thumped against the wall. There were two splotches of blood on the side of the cabin, and underneath each was half of a full-grown deer. Oh fuck. It ripped a deer in half and threw the halves at the cabin. Bill tells me not to say anything about it because it'll scare the girls, 
I'm pretty sure they're already scared, dude. We rejoin the others as they make one last trip inside the cabin for the last of our stuff. Bill grabs me by the shoulder. Steve, go start the van. Girls, go wait in the van. We'll get everything else. The girls made no argument and got in the van with Steve, leaving Bill, Fred, and me in the cabin. That's almost everything. Fred, you go check the back and make sure we have everything. Then Bill physically pulled me and Fred out of the cabin while we gave him a what the fuck look. And then I saw someone else in the back of the cabin, wearing filthy clothes, like Bill's, packing things up. Oh fuck, it was in the cabin with us. Bill quietly pulls us out of the cabin, and I pointed my rifle at it. I hear a pop, like a firecracker going off, and something smacked me in the leg. I looked down at my feet and saw, is that a fucking grenade spoon? I looked up just in time to see Bill pull the pin from a second grenade. One of those big smoke grenade types. Release the spoon with a pop, and throw it into the cabin. Then he shut the door, and locked the handle and the deadbolt with Steve's keys and stepped back. He looked at me and said, Thermite. Any second now. Then he pointed his rifle at the cabin and waited. Steve got out of the van and joined us, asking what the fuck we were doing. Suddenly, we heard that ungodly screeching again. This time from inside the cabin. It was like someone was electrocuting a burlap sack full of angry lynxes, who all had their balls in a vice. Bill calmly explains to Steve that he had just set the cabin on fire with fucking homemade thermite grenades he'd brought along on a camping trip for reasons that only made sense to Bill. What the fuck, man? You set fire to my uncle's cabin? Hey, my risk set is in there too. As if that made it even somehow. The screeching gets even louder and something slams into the door, hard. Bill calmly dumps 10 or 15 rounds of 308 into the door and the wall of the cabin. The inhuman shrieks get even louder. Smoke starts pouring out from under the door and we can see orange glow through the bullet holes. Uh, can we leave now? Nah. Bill casually responds. Need to make sure we don't burn the whole forest down too. Dude, fuck the forest. We can burn the whole state to the ground if it kills that thing and anything else like it. Also, I kind of want to shoot it if it breaks out of the cabin so it doesn't seek revenge. I don't want the shitty horror movie to have a sequel. Realize this makes sense, and not just because Bill's acting as if we're in a horror movie. Inhuman shrieks and something slamming repeatedly against the walls of the cabin continue for a good 20 minutes before falling silent. The girls get out of the van and join us as we watch the cabin burn to the ground. The heat from the fire is barely tolerable and we're standing 30 feet away. The cabin finally collapses and everyone but Bill gets in the van. He stands there, watching it burn, holding his rifle like he still expects a monster to come charging out of the roaring inferno. I know for a fact he's going to be bragging to the entire campus about how he single-handedly slew a monster when we get back. Finally, the cabin has burnt to the point that it's just a crackling, smoldering pile of charcoal and ashes, not even a dim orange glow visible in the darkness. Bill stretches his limbs, then gets in the van and tells Steve to drive into town so we can get gas and breakfast. We arrive in a town of maybe 400 people an hour later and stop at a combination gas station slash diner. As we walk in, Bill jokingly comments that if we were actually in a horror movie, he'd at least earned a blowjob from the heroine. Rachel grabs him by the head and pulls him into the back of the diner slash gas station. We don't see them again until after we've ordered breakfast and our food has arrived. I only have Bill's word for this, but he claims she pulled him into the bathroom and blew him on the spot. They've been going out ever since, for almost two years now. Steve told his uncle that the cabin burned down because the chimney for the wood stove got clogged or something and caught fire. His uncle doesn't care since it was a shitty cabin he built in a single weekend and is just glad we're all okay and didn't burn the woods down. We've never gone back there, but Steve's uncle has gone camping there several times since, mostly during hunting season, and hasn't seen or heard anything odd, other than the skeletal remains of a deer torn in half next to what's left of a cabin that is. Bill is the only one of us crazy enough to go camping. Eh, you murder one creepy monster in a fire, you sort of lose any fear you had of the woods at night. Speak for yourself, you nutjob. And that's my creepy skinwalker slash fleshgate slash windigo slash whatever the hell it is story. I have no idea if we actually killed it or not, and I'm not poking around in the burnt remains of that cabinet to find out. Don't know if this goes in slash fit or X? Whereas, here's the story. It's really long, but bear with me. Friend not in the story tells us about a place to get palm readings. Lifting buddy and I go to get palms read. Show up to this shady ass place at 10 in the morning wearing our workout gear. Ghost bitches are ready mirin. Stereotypical scraggly gypsy woman shakes her hands and seats us at the table with a crystal ball. Asks who wants to go first. Hispanic heritage kicks in and I nope at the last minute. Friend chads up to the plate. 
Woman grabs his hand. He flexes slightly. Woman goes from smiling to horrified. Starts grabbing and setting his hand like a last will. Feeling weird, man. Tells my friend he's got something following him. Ask him if he did any Ouija voodoo bullshit. He says he smashed a hole in the wall when he was drunk lifting at home. Says there was some type of decorative skull behind it that he now uses as a decoration in his bedroom. Gypsy lets us leave without paying. At the gym 30 minutes later. Spotting friend while he benches. Some newbie dumbass is curling next to us. Like, no joke, six inches away from us. Dude slips up and swings the 20 he's holding at friend's head. Throws the bar up and ducks just in time. Almost impale myself trying to catch the bar. Newbie apologizes while friend gets back up and I'm shitting myself still. Tell friend he should go home. Friend looks unfazed and wants to continue. Leave to Abuela's sister's house to get some sage and silver. Go back to gym and give it a friend. Next day, friend looks happier than normal. Tells me some shit went down at his house. Says the power was dead even though his bills were paid and the rest of the neighborhood had power. Heard rattling of silverware. Uses flashlight app to see. Saw a silhouette of someone crawling under the kitchen counter. Nothing under the counter, not even shelves. Friend doesn't believe in Ouija shit and believes it's an intruder or animal. Friend grabs his pull-up bar and gets ready for sweet fit justice. Yells obscenities while patrolling his house. Says he sees what looks like a small humanoid crouched in his weight room. Gives zero fucks and tosses the pull-up bar at the window. Shatters like linklet kneecaps squatting. Thing is nowhere in sight. Friend then starts to consider Ouija shit. Calls other friends for advice. Our lifting group has some odd characters. Johnny answers and tells him to burn the sage and carry the silver. Says he'll be by with some holy water. Drops it off. I'll call my grandmother tomorrow to help. She's one of the medium people. Friend sits down on his couch while the house smells like old. Watches American Dad. Looks at the sage. Dried up and out. Goes to his pocket for the silver. Fucking melted. Instead of warm, it was cold. Starts to see something dark back and forth across the room. TV goes off and static comes on. Says high-pitched screaming fills the house. Friend gets mildly annoyed. Walks over to the weight room and smashes the skull against the wall in a fluid motion. Like, imagine walking into a room, tripping over a vase, then going back to what you were doing. He did that, except he threw a skull against the wall. Says house shook, screaming out higher, then stopped. Lights go off again. Hears numerous footsteps getting closer to him. Tells me he's mildly freaked out at this point. I'm very concerned that he said mildly. Says he doused himself in holy water and started swinging as hard as he could into the darkness. Only hears the wind breaking on his fists. Says he heard the footsteps getting further away from him. Screams, Nuh-uh! Starts running around the house and swinging in the darkness. Bucks up his living room in the process. Tells me he swears he made contact with something fleshy a few times. Doesn't remember falling asleep. Wakes up and goes to the gym to tell me this the next day. Friend goes outside to make frequent calls throughout his routines. Ask him if he's trying to get in touch with a priest. Tells me he's been calling his home phone and leaving angry voice messages for the ghosts. Said he would buy a snake just to flatten it out with a rolling pin until it dies. Friend goes home again. Fast forward a few days. Looks completely normal. Ask Johnny if Lifting Buddy was alright. Tells me it's disturbing how well he's handling the situation. Says he went to Lifting Buddy's house to check up on the sitch. Feels a presence, but it feels scared. Lifting Buddy walks out of his bathroom, naked, wiping his ass with a Ouija board towel. Throws it on the floor and kicks it into the living room. Pours more holy water on it, then takes it outside to burn it. Asks friend if he is hungry. Uh, sure. Says he pulls out an open Ouija board he bought at Spencer's and uses it as a fucking cutting board. Says he repeatedly stabbed the cutting knife into the board when he was not using it. Breaks the board in half after he's done chopping up tomatoes and throws it in the trash. Washes his hands, then pisses in the trash can. Even I think this is disrespecting the spirits too much. 
They both eat grilled chicken salad. Then Johnny leaves. Says on the way out, Lifting Buddy goes into the lifting room and puts another crucifix on the wall. I'm putting Jesus on this wall and I'll be back to fucking masturbate on my bench press while thinking about Lucifer's whore daughter. Punches a hole in the wall before leaving. Johnny calls his abuela that night. Abuela goes to Lifting Buddy's house with a priest the next day. Says Abuela and Priest were also amazed and disturbed with how Lifting Buddy is fighting the situation. Priest actually cowered and mired Lifting Buddy pissing naked on the satanic bible he bought at some shady bookstore. Tells Priest he walks around naked a lot lately and talks shit about Satan. Priest leaves before cleansing. Abuela stays to do her medium thing. Tries to contact the spirits. Says it was a group of entities that were very pissed that their shrine was disturbed tells her that they have no power since Lefting Buddy isn't remotely scared of anything they've done. Lefting Buddy walks back into weight room with a dead snake. Abuela says the entities scatter like roaches. Check out what I found on the street this morning. Takes bite out of apple. A fucking dead snake. Throws the snake on the floor. Puts holy water and salt on it. Kicks it into the carpet a few times before peeling it off and throwing it into the trash can in the kitchen. Abuela is what the fucking at this man's mental strength or ignorance. Tries to contact the spirits again. They keep running away from her. Finally talks to one. Says they are scared of lifting buddy. Ghosts are scared of my bulky friend. Abuela asks what could make them pass on. Says they did black magic to get revenge on some asshole landlord from way back when. Says they had incriminating shit to shame his family within the wall with the skull. Abuela tells Lifting Buddy what he needs to do. Lifting Buddy goes into the weight room. Makes the hole bigger by throwing a 15 through the wall. Finds a folder with records of some sort. I'm not lying about any of this. I swear. And especially this next part. Lifting Buddy flips through the papers. Then wipes his balls with it. Abuela horrified. Crumples them up and throws them into the corner of the room. Tells the spirits to piss off. Then punches another hole in the wall. Total of 13 holes at this point. Abuela says, may God have mercy, in Spanish. Then leaves. Goes back to Lifting Buddy's house a month later. They immediately go to the weight room. More holes than wall. Destroyed AF. But, like a halo descending from the heavens, the bench press and squatting rack are still there. Tries to contact spirits. Nothing. Smiles and asks my friends if he did what he needed to be done. Again, I'm not lying about any of this. Tells Abuela he uncrumpled the papers and got the address of this bastard. Papers were only from 60 years ago, so the guy was still alive. Just old as dust. Finds the address of this guy in some sort of mansion. Knocks on the door wearing a get swell you must Star Wars Yoda tank top, board shorts, pink sunglasses, and a backwards Chicago Bulls snapback. Johnny said Lifting Buddy went into a lot of detail about his wardrobe for this. Some scrawny white guy in his mid-30s opens the door. Lifting Buddy holds out the papers and asks for the person in the paper's name. Hey dad, someone's here to see you. He has documents. Lifting Buddy lets himself in and finds the old man in his study. Who are you? Notices the papers. Where did you get that? Old man tries to grab at the papers. Lifting Buddy punches the old man in the face. Dentures fly out. Says it was like some shit out of a movie. Crouches in his face and sets the old man straight, Sherlock Holmes style. Guy's son runs in and jumps on Lifting Buddy's back. Lifting Buddy stops mid-sentence. Let's the guy down. Then, gut punches him until he hobbles out of the room and pukes in the hallway. Tells the old man to set shit right, or he will be back for blood. Leaves. Fast forward a couple days. Various cars outside of Lifting Buddy's house. Thinks the old man brought some friends and grabs his pull-up bar. Walks outside in his tank top and house shorts. Various families are thanking him and giving him home-cooked foods. Thank him for getting their grandparents' properties back. The documents were apparently deeds swindled out by the old man. Families say the whole will never forget you spiel and leave. Friend looks into the Tupperware. Nothing but calories and carbs. Cookies, brisket, gumbo. Throws it all away and goes back to lifting in his weight room. 
see old man's name in the news a few days later. Apparently, he was hated by the community for being a dick. Somehow only heard about him now. News doesn't disclose how he died. Don't know if it was from Lifting Buddy doing more damage than he thought, the ghosts getting their revenge, or natural causes. Hasn't had any paranormal problems since then except for one. Says he went to the kitchen for a late night non-cheating snack and saw full body apparitions. They smiled at him. Says he grabbed an apple, head nodded while taking a bite, and walked away back to his bedroom. He stops halfway and turns around. Holy fuck, you guys were real? Spirits fade while smiling. Lifting Buddy goes to sleep. Lifting Buddy still lifts and does inane shit like he always does. No one fucks with him since the ghost puncher incident. Abuela Myers every time she's around him. And I think the priest told his priest buddies in church because everyone Myers and cowers in grace twice as hard when they are around him. Again, none of this was made up. No walk the dinosaur ten shit. My friend legitimately beat up a bunch of ghosts. The Bad Jar. A couple of years back, my erstwhile friend and shenanigan ninja, Tony, went with me to explore an old busted up meat packaging plant. I don't specifically remember where the shit this place was. We had seen it while driving home from some adventure or another, and had a collective moment of, oh shit, when we get a chance we need to check this place out. The next night that neither of us were too drunk to stand up, we went ahead and ventured in with an assorted bag of goodies. Urban exploration, right? There was a thread around here about that stuff. It's pretty neat. Might have been near Chicago, and I say meatpacking plant because that's my best guess. I have no fucking clue what this place was. It had lockers and slaughterhouse type things, big old blown out freezers and truck loading bays, all kinds of cool shit. Breaking in wasn't difficult. Shitty wooden fence and no actual security to speak of meant our greatest risk of invading this place was tetanus. It was a multi-floored rectangle shaped structure that looked like it had been abandoned for at least 20 years. Some of the shit we found in there, like old newspaper and shit, referenced things earlier though, but it wasn't like a pristine site. People had been there before. Tony and I first inspected what we had hoped would be the office area. A small cubicle farm that was filled with rotting papers, busted up crates, fungal curiosities, and a fuck ton of erasers. They were the old pink pig type erasers and they had grown rock hard and cracked with age. Tony apparently used to regularly eat them as a kid. I was more of a crayon and Elmer's glue kid. At this stage of our exploration, neither of us had our creepy senses kicked. Yeah, we kind of expected it to be honest. Of course we were hunting for weird shit, I think that's why anyone goes into places like this. Mostly it was smelly, dark, and kind of boring. We hit minor pay dirt when in one of the side communal bathrooms, Tony found a broken bong and a stack of old penthouse magazines. They were shoved in the bowl of an old dry toilet, and in the tank there were some partially torn baggies of brown moldy stuff. Tony and I expertly deduced that this was some dude's secret lair where he got high, jerked off, and then wrote angry poetry about how he was too smart for normal society before passing out. The graffiti in here was much more boring than the weird absurd shit I used to find in Japan. Mostly illegible tag names and dicks. Lots and lots of dicks. Dicks. Everywhere. Anyways, shit got interesting when after about 3 hours of screwing around in the upper levels, Tony found a flight of stairs leading down into what we assumed at first to be a small basement area, maybe like storage for maintenance and shit or something. We had pretty solid flashlights, so the dark wasn't a big deal, but the stairs were as old as Babylonian dog shit and very small. You could put your back against one wall, reach out and easily touch the other wall. Most stairwells are a bit broader than that in my experience. So, we go down this tiny little staircase and find out that instead of a small basement area, there is instead a very spacious underground warehouse level down here. Lots and lots of empty space, and I presume somewhere back there were ramps leading up to bays and shit. The ceiling was pretty low, and just about everything was concrete. There was also a ridiculously large assortment of crap down here. Lots of shopping carts, trash bags filled with old clothes, and wooden pallets propped up everywhere. Tony found a pile of clothes hangers that was bigger than his car. Near this pile was a large amount of old fucked up shoes that were paired together and set side by side. Most of the shoes were mismatched, but you could tell that someone had at least tried to match them by relative compatibility. Not far from this area were some of those blown out walk-in freezer things, and they had been converted into small dens, and they had been and they had been converted into small dens. Lots of old rugs, carpeting, and fucked up sleeping bags. 
There were a couple of fire blackened spots near the doors, and the best we could figure is some old crazy ass, or a clan of crazy asses must have used this area as their chief sleeping spot. Inevitably, we found what we assumed to be the shitting place. And that was where we found the bad jar. It was a smaller chamber off to the side that was filled with old rank fecal matter, an enormous quantity of what we assumed to be bathroom mats and jars. Jars, everywhere, stacked up on top of each other, laying on the floor. Intact jars filled with vile what the fuck and broken jars, laying in a dark amber-black stain on the floor. We were hilariously grossed out by the thing, and immediately started daring each other to go further into the obviously hepatitis riddled shit chamber. Now here is where I must confess a weakness to taking stupid fucking dares. Tony is almost as bad as me. I mean, you could dare him to run up to an old lady, drop his pants, and shit on the sidewalk in front of her, and he'd take it gleefully. I have fury limits, and thankfully he checks his dares to prevent me from ending up doing time or paying fines I can't handle. This time he didn't ease up. Go in there and lift up those mats, says Tony. Fuck you, I'm not going in there. It's a literal pile of shit. It can't be stable, and God knows how many diseases are hiding in there. I'm gonna catch, like, a leprosy AIDS hybrid and die shitting my lungs out. Go in there, I dare you. If you don't, you are a- I can't say that, and I'm going to fucking tell everyone. First of all, Tony, I think that's a double fucking negative, and second of all, homosexuality is a valid lifestyle and not something to be used as a demeaning label. I mean, come on, this isn't the Dark Ages. I can't say that again. I find your choice of insults to be detrimental to your character, and the impact it's having on me is negligible. What the fuck did you just call me? I didn't call you shit, clown shoes. That last word, what the fuck did you say? Negligible? Yeah, fuck you, I'm Italian, you cunt. Tony, go in there or I'm gonna tell the girls you are a chicken fucker. Oh, fuck you. And so, there I go, boldly strutting to my doom in a room filled with an actual mountain of shit. It was old, it was crusty, and it was not stable. It was like walking on trash bags filled with jelly beans and road tar. It was disgusting and had this weirdly acidic, acrid smell, almost chalky. It felt like the stench was so bad, my brain was making up things as it went, and it was just grasping for straws. It smelled like stale root beer towards the end. When I reached the far side of the room, I saw a stack of mason jars, one of which was like a third filled with liquid. It was dirty as fuck. I grabbed this jar and squelched back to Tony, intending to throw it at him or something. Luckily, most of the shit chamber was dried out, but there was still some horrible moisture down in that heat. Tony was laughing his ass off at me. I was chuckling as I worked the lid off the jar. I was going to splash him with that shit. Fuck you, Tony, I climbed Shit Mountain and now you're getting a taste. It took a second and Tony was still laughing. Backing up, he knew what was about to go down. I worked the lid until it came off with a little pop noise. It was one of those two-part lids, like the screw-on thing is separate from the lid. Pop and clink. A mason jar, he means mason jar for fuck's sake. The effect was pretty damn immediate. The heap of clothes hangers across from us just fucking collapses. A split second later, those neat line of ugly shoes just god just go goddamn flying. There wasn't a huge amount of noise, just a crash of wire and these little plap noises as shoes hit the wall. Tony backs himself into one of the walls on the corridor and scans the room. I tense up and freeze waiting for something to react to, besides just shit falling over. Our weird shit o meters just went from zero to oh fuck me in half a second. There's a smell, like fresh rotten feces and overripe tomatoes from behind me that hits the back of my neck like warm breath. That smell was tangible. It gets dark, and it gets dark fast. Our lamps are still going just fine, it's just the range they had and the ambient spell shrank up. Within moments, all we had were these little limpid cones of light in the pitch black. I slid over to Tony, still a bit locked up. I didn't have anything I could properly react to. We could hear a disturbing noise, like someone taking cinder blocks and grinding them together. The smell is pouring in around us, and we can fucking see it. It's this hazy brown shit flooding in from around us. I'm trying to figure out the fastest way out, but I hadn't exactly committed this place to fucking memory. Tony's got his knife out of his backpack, and I'm starting to wish that he had gone ahead and brought his gun. That's what I get for talking him out of it, right? I figure we are fucked, but we can at least go down like badasses, and I close the jar, set it down, and get ready. Immediately, the freaky shit stops, like I had flipped a switch. Bam. The stench is gone, it doesn't pull back or retreat or anything, it just stops being there. Ambient light is back like it never left, smells go back to weirdly tolerable, shit's still scattered around and the hangers are thrown to shit, but the whole fucking impending doom thing stops entirely. We are quiet for a moment, Tony throws me a look and I shrug, 
I have no fucking clue, man. I says. Get one. He says. So I start thinking. It's Winnie the Pooh shit, really. I stop looking around and get to postulating. Tony is keeping an eye out. I reach down, pick up the jar. Lid's tighter than I had left it, I think. I unscrew it. Shit goes sideways. Stench is back, not oozing up on us like before. It's back right where we left it, right the fuck there. Lights go from workable to laughably worthless, and we can hear wooden pallets smashing into the sides of the chamber. Tony is not having any of this shit. Close the fucking jar. Close it right the fuck now. I closed the shit out of that jar. Like a light switch, it goes right off again. Tony, what we have here is a bad jar. What the fuck is in that shit? I thought piss, but apparently not. Or maybe just, like, cosmically bad piss. Fuck that shit. Throw it back in there and let's get the fuck out of here. I don't think that's such a good idea, Tony, if I throw it and it breaks. I have the distinct feeling we're going to get fucked. I'll just put it down. Shit, dude, I don't care. Let's go. Fuck that thing. If we leave it here, dude, some fucking teenager could come down here looking for a porn stash and, I don't know, knock it over or some shit. That is most seriously not our problem. Yeah, I, I don't know, man. I don't think we should just leave it here. Shit's dangerous. Shit is dangerous. Whatever, just don't fucking open it. Let's get out of here, and you're carrying that fucking thing. Roger that, princess. Buy me a tiara. Eat a dick. Which pretty much settled it. Tony and I vacated the area with all due haste and no other weird shit interfering with our aggress. I had the badger secured in my backpack, wrapped up in a towel, and it was pretty safe, as best I figured. On our way out, though, I kind of wondered about the other jars in that shit chamber. I mean, it was a real whisper of a thought, but if this jar was bad, it probably served to reason that all those other jars in there were also bad. Not exactly something I like entertaining. After our little adventure in that old ruined factory thing, Tony and I decided to lay off the gas for a bit and keep it cool. For a couple of weeks, we just kept it easy. We were sharing a little apartment thingy before we hit the road back to California. The bad jar went into the closet in my room. I was fascinated by the thing. It was gross as hell though, so I very carefully cleaned it up and attempted to at least half sterilize it. I'm not sure you can technically half sterilize something now that I think about it. I mean, it's either sterile or it isn't. Whatever. I soaked that bitch in hydrogen peroxide, iodine, whatever I had available at the time. We got bored though. Going to work and acting like normal dudes can last us maybe a week. And after that, we get weird. And before you know it, one of us is naked in a dumpster and the other one might actually be partially on fire. One night, not too terribly long after, curiosity gets the better of us and we take the jar out, set it on the table, and start trying to figure it out. Alright, so this jar. You open it up and batshit starts happening, Tony says. That's the general effect, I think, yeah? I says. Is the bad shit in the fucking jar? That shit seemed to be coming from, like, everywhere. Not entirely sure, Tony. You got a point, though. I didn't see anything coming out of the fucking thing. Maybe the smell? No, that definitely came from the sides. And whatever was throwing that shit around. That didn't come out of the jar. But it seemed to be moving towards us, for sure. Right. Alright. So maybe when we open this thing, shit comes towards it, like it's some sort of shit singularity, and when you open it, shit comes flying into it. Open it. Shit, dude, I don't think that's a good fucking idea. We knew we were gonna open it again, just stop dicking around and fucking opening it. Yeah, yeah, alright, get ready. Tony is sitting across from me on this shitty couch we got from a Goodwill type store, and he's got his gun this time. It's nothing fancy, just a 9mm thing he keeps around. I grab the jar, Take a second to chill out and pop it. Nothing happens for a second. We're both tense as hell and nerves strung like violin strings. Then from downstairs, there's a series of very loud, very rapid thumps. It actually sounds like it's coming from outside. Then a retardedly high-pitched screech, like someone's getting strangled or raped with four feet of rusted barbed wire wrapped around a stick. The windows crack and the lights go out. I shut the fucking jar. The lights come back immediately, Tony is scowling, and I'm halfway between terrified and elated. He gets up and checks the window, and I'm staring at the jar when I hear him. There's a fucking dead cat. What the shit? Yeah, I think it's the old cat ladies from downstairs. The yellow one with the fucked up eye? Walter? Yeah, Walter. He's right there. Look. I go over to check it out and notice a thin, bloody smear across the outside pane of our newly cracked window. Sure enough, Walter is sprawled out on the little railing just beyond the window. Looked like he'd either been killed and thrown at the window, or thrown at the window and killed by the impact. The last one was pretty unlikely though. 
If he had been thrown that hard, he probably would have shattered it. Walter was dead as fuck though. Looked like a cat bag filled with jelly. Alright, so, well, what now? I'm turning the jar over in my hands. Well, we have a jar that kills cats. I'm sure that's gonna be fucking useful. Tony says. He's got a funny look on his face. Mischief is afoot. Over the course of the next few days, Tony and I continue to fuck with the jar. Typically, we'll go somewhere and open it, for at most four or five seconds. On occasion, there would be little pauses before bad shit started going down. But, for the most part, it was goddamn immediate. Inside buildings or houses seemed kind of dangerous, so eventually, we started going outside to fuck with it. Whatever the hell it was, hated birds. The first time we opened it outside, like three dead pigeons dropped on us. And every time after that, somewhere we'd find a dead bird. Tony reckoned when we got back to Cali, he'd use it as seagull repellent, but I likened that to dropping a nuke to keep your kitchen clean. We tested it when other people were around as well, figuring maybe it only did it when we were around. Spooky shit a lot of the times doesn't pop up when a lot of folks are around. The first time we did that was at a little strip mall near the cigarette shop. It didn't care. Windows broke in rapid succession, and the owner comes running out and screaming at us in Persian before getting pale and running back in to call the cops. Streetlights went dark, and then blew out. We tried it at a church with pretty much the same results. It got darker, knocked over that thing with all the candles on it, I'm not sure what it was called, but we left. Neither of us are particularly religious, but we'd heard stories about nuns, and we didn't want one beating our asses for wrecking her shit. The only place it didn't seem to do anything was at a graveyard. Keep in mind that we were doing this for science. Of course we were going to do it in a graveyard. We found a pretty good sized one. It still had tombstones, but most of it was shitty little plaques on the ground. Popping it there didn't break anything, nor did we get any stomping noises. It fucking stank though, but the stink came from the jar, not from around it. For some damn reason, that made it a bit more unnerving. I sloshed it around, Tony fidgeted, I got irritated. Fucking do something, jar. Maybe it's a Freddy Graveyards, he says. Maybe. Doesn't make any fucking sense though. It's not afraid of cats, birds, or Persians. What the fuck can dead people do? Pissing it. Yeah, okay. So I piss it in. Not a whole lot. I had been running a bit dry that day. When I finish, we close the lid and go back home, feeling a bit dejected. Maybe we fucking broke the thing. Tony says, looking kinda let down. That's a good thing, right? I mean, shit. I don't know, we coulda used it for shit. Yeah, like, give it to some douchebag or something. Or use it to fight crime. Jarman! Fighting evil with a jar filled with Satan's piss. Beware evildoers or a break everything and possibly kill your cats. Poor Walter. Man, fuck Walter, I think he pissed on our door. Tony, I worry that your in factors entirely too much into our day-to-day -day lives. Your in can never factor too much. We put the jar back in my closet and pretty much forgot about it for a while. We ended up taking it to California with us, but during the trip, really didn't think about it. The trip itself was worth a few stores I'll have to get to sometime. Chiefly, it involved us hitting a dog that I think cursed Tony. Anywho, like two months after we get to Cali, we have a couple of girls over and decide, shit, let's take out the bad jar and fuck with it. We weren't really expecting anything since the graveyard, so Tony and I are being goofy and showing off for these ladies, and we pop it. Shit goes bad. It goes bad fast, and it goes bad hard. Lights out, couch just fucking collapses on itself, plaster falls from the ceiling, the table flips over, and I think breaks the brunette's nose. We hear glass breaking and the room fills with a stench that I could recognize fucking immediately. The blonde just starts this high-pitched wail that's both terrifying and fucking annoying. I can't see shit, I could hear Tony screaming at me to close the fucking jar, close it right fucking now, but I can't find the fucking lid, the inner part that seals it off. I'm reaching around the floor trying to fucking find it, holding the bad jar in my other hand. I can feel the blonde's leg and she recoils away from my touch. I could feel carpet, I could feel part of the table's leg, and then I could feel, oh fuck, something. It's like cold wet clay, squishy with a hard, thin outer shell that just makes my brain go completely apeshit. Tony's voice is sounding like it's coming from really far away and weirdly muffled like he's got a pillowcase on his head. I'm still trying to get the goddamn second part of the lid when I feel a hand come down on my shoulder hard. I nearly piss myself right there. But it's Tony, I can feel him reaching around and he bumps something into my face. Thankfully, it's not a dick. It's the other part of the lid. And I get that shit on fucking fast. There's a sound building, a low weird rumble that sounds like a stomach growling, but it's fucking loud and it's making everything vibrate. The lid goes on and the sound cuts off. It's still dark and the girls are alternately screaming and crying. I could hear Tony cursing colorfully and move off towards the kitchen banging into shit as he goes. I'm trying to feel around for the girls and I find one, 
I think the brunette. But she's curled up on the floor, and when I feel out her head, she fucking bites me. Tony manages to find a flashlight, and he hits us with the beam. Everything had gone to hell. There is weird brown shit all over the fucking walls. In this case, I'm not using shit as my general term for stuff. I mean, literal shit. Our furniture is fucking broke to hell. The brunette is curled up, bleeding, and the blonde is screaming at us. She is pissed the fuck off. I try and work some damage control, make sure the brunette is alright, but those two want absolutely nothing to fucking do with us. And when I go home, right fucking now. I don't blame him. But I think the blonde saw the looks on our faces and figured that while assholes, we weren't the bad thing that just happened. We were still responsible for it though. They left and we were not going to get laid that night. Tony and I managed to find some candles and another flashlight and inspect the damage. This is like 11 at night. There is actual shit on the walls. It is cold and has that muffled root beer smell going on. The walls have these black splotches of like mildew or something all over them and everything wood feels soft and rotted. We get our shit and get out, deciding that tonight we are going to go over to a mutual friend's of ours house and crash there. Z is rad as hell and has often sheltered us from the storms of our own stupidity. It's on our way to the car that we notice there aren't any fucking lights anywhere in the building. People are coming out of their apartments with flashlights and candles. Kids are crying in the background. Folks are asking questions. We get the fuck out. Halfway to Z's house, I notice Tony's got some patches of fucking hair missing. Like it just fell out. We collectively what the fuck and he points out that I have the same shit going on. Feeling it with my hands, I could find like two or three big spots where the hair just isn't there. And a couple of more where the hair just comes off in my hands. We get there and Z opens up the door in her pajamas with irritation written in large cartoonish block letters on her face. She lightens up real fast when she gets a good look at us and we start filling her in. We take turns dishing out the whole story. I start first while Tony grabs a shower and changes clothes. Then when he's done, we switch. It's like 2am when she's finally filled in and the general rule is that we could stay there until we get shit together. But we have to help with rent and we cannot, under any circumstances, open the fucking jar. Z's smarter than the two of us combined, I think, but I'm pretty sure I've got nicer legs. Long story short, our hair grew back, mostly. I still have a small patch missing in the back. We got in trouble for wrecking the apartment, never heard from those girls again, and Tony married Z. We didn't fuck with the jar for a good chunk of time, and when we went our separate ways, the jar went with me. I pretty much didn't fuck with the thing until a couple months ago, but well, that'll have to wait until Bad Jar Part 3 where I use the thing to become the king of Portugal. Flash forward a bit to more recent times. I'm happily married and living a life that I consider pretty nice, all things considered. It took me a while to get housebroken, but for the most part I am. The bad jar is on my bookcase, next to my grandfather's kissing jar, and surrounded by various odd paraphernalia that I've picked up over the years. I love my bookshelf. It has spooky shit, old talisman, weird books I haven't been able to figure out yet, and one of those voodoo grease grease thingies. My wife and I have plans for our future. They are pretty sweet plans, and our base is pretty damn stable. I mean, I'm not the king of fucking Portugal or anything, but I have a job and haven't been fired, and we won't go hungry anytime soon. My little sister, though, is having it fucking rough. I love her, but she has problems. We had trouble as we grew up. Nothing I'm going to whine about, other kids have it much worse. But it was bad enough to leave impressions. I've learned how to deal with it for the most part. She really hasn't. I think she had just gotten out of her second divorce and was living with my mother. She displays a lot of borderline personality issues. I think one of them is like cyclical paranoia. If you're around my sister for a month or so, she starts out loving you, then, not so slowly, starts to fucking hate you with every fiber of her being. Convinced you are out to get her, are talking shit on her back, and plotting her despair. The longer you are around her, the more you become the single driving force behind all her miseries. She refuses medication and eventually self-destructs, abandoning everything before finding shelter from someone and starting the cycle again. My mother gave it her best shot, but it happened and I was the next refuge for my sister. I knew what was going to happen, but figured as her brother, I needed to help her as best I could. I took her in and had a plan of getting her some professional help before shit exploded. Long story short, yeah, that didn't happen. I miscalculated pretty terribly. I had introduced my wife to the bad jars a ways back. She's got the most brilliantly rational mind. She grew up in a very fundamentalist Christian family, so I respect her bravery when she finally decided to break from that and go her own way. She's a bit of a Dawkins girl now, which has led us to some fun conversations. I'll usually start telling her a story and she'll listen. 
At the end, she always has questions, and some of them are brutal. She not infrequently calls me on my bullshit. My ace in the hole was the bad jar, though. I gave her a huge heads up on this thing during one particular night, and we set up for it. We weren't going to pull this shit at home, especially if my sister was around. She had been getting worse the past few weeks, and though she said she had been going to her therapist, we had doubts. Instead, we went over to a buddy's house and borrowed his garage. We told Erin we were going to have particularly vile sex, and we needed a place where we wouldn't get the cops called on us. He was cool with it. Anywho, Ash and I are sitting there, and I'm starting to second guess this. She and I are always conversating about shit like this. She is brave as shit though, and starts heckling me about digging around with it. It's not that she wanted to prove me wrong or anything, she was just genuinely curious. So I figure, fuck it, and I pop it. I have the lid off for maybe 2-3 seconds tops. Shit gets dark, the washing machine goes flying into the mini fridge by the door, and there's a horribly loud snapping sound as the chain in the garage door opener busts. That sound comes in too, that head achingly low and loud stomach rumbling roar. It's picking up where it left off this time, and it's coming up hard. I can hear Ash muttering, oh shit, oh shit, oh shit, under her breath, like some sort of mantra, and I seal the fucking thing up again. It's dark, my flashlight isn't working, there is the smell again. She finds my hand, and we make our way to the door. Using the light from the hall, we can see that, yep, shit's wrecked in Aaron's garage, and there is, again, literal shit on the walls. Aaron is coming down the stairs in his boxer shorts and asking us what the fuck is going on. I have a jar filled with what I think might be the physical incarnation of some obscure oriental hell and I opened it in your garage, I say. Eren scratches his balls. Did you shit on the floor? What the fuck is that smell? I shrug. Yeah. He goes back upstairs and goes to sleep. Eren is one of those guys who can inexplicably not give a fuck about anything. Since Tony moved to Montana, he's sort of become my surrogate comrade in tomfoolery. The guy just gives absolutely zero fucks. It's quite admirable, I think. Ash and I clean up his garage, of course. We have to change the light bulbs. The ones that aren't broken completely are filled with this fucking mildewy gunk. She wants to experiment with the goddamn thing now. I said she was a curious girl, and I wasn't kidding. She starts doing research and digging up stuff. Not too much avail, really. Anything appropriate is usually mired in some folklore or bullshit pseudoscience. We don't open it up again, but when she wasn't at work, she was usually messing around with it and thinking. It didn't, like, radically change her beliefs or make her less of an atheist or anything like that. A lot of stories I've read have weird shit happening to an atheist and they always end with, Oh shit, God is real, what have I done? Bullshit. Fuck that though, Ash was just curious as shit. I think she said something about wishing Dr. Egon was real so she could show him this thing. I do remember her bringing up stuff about ghost lores being used in different cultures as substances which could attract unclean spirits and shit to keep them away from more sensitive areas. The substance in one of these ghost lures was like bile and other bodily humors, and bad things found the scent of it irresistible. But nothing she managed to find said they would literally wreck everything and shit on the walls when they smelled it. I suggested it somehow summoned dead meth heads. The bad jar goes up on my shelf, right next to a much nicer, if more melancholy jar, and we go back to our routine. Most of mine is currently involving talking my sister down and trying to make sure she stays on her medication. I'm pretty sure by now you might see where this is going. And yeah, it's going there. My sister finally reaches her fucking critical mass. It comes up fast. I wish I could say it came out of nowhere, but I'd be lying more than I could tolerate if I did so. The thing that did honestly come out of nowhere was its direction. I expected her to blow up at me. I've had the most interaction with her, and to date, when given a choice between blowing up violently at a family member or somewhere else, she inevitably blows up at the family member. She blew up at Ash though. Started out accusing her of sneaking into her room and whispering in her sleep, putting poison in her pills, so she had been flushing them down the toilet instead of taking them, making unwanted sexual advances, all kinds of shit. We tried to talk her down, but she wasn't fucking having it, and started throwing shit and screaming. I tell Ash to bail, and I attempt damage control. The second Ash is out of her sight, my sister turns it right around on me, and starts screaming about how I'm trying to rape her. I go ahead and call the police. I'm not really big on involving the law, but she's one step away from grabbing something sharp and doing something stupid. Once she saw me actually calling the police, though, she got the fuck out of Dodge, and fast, which put me in a fucking awkward position. Ash was with the neighbors and had already called. When they finally showed up, we gave them details we could. Not that it served any real purpose as she was fucking gone. Turns out she went running back to my mother who took her in again. I love my mother, but god damn it. Things go back to normal for Ash and I for the next few weeks, 
but it isn't much longer before my sister comes back with a gaggle of little boy toys to pack up her shit. She is moving to San Diego to be with her real family, people who care about her and have always hated me so much and are going to let her stay with them forever. These kids she has with her are like seniors in high school, and every one of them is mad dogging me like they just can't wait to prove how tough they are. My father lives in San Diego. I haven't seen much of him in a decade or so, but I figure that's where she's going. I figure, fuck it. I can't fix her. Maybe he can. Maybe someone down there can do something right. I step back and let her stomp around the house, gathering her shit. She tries to swipe some of our stuff, at which point I say, no fucking way in hell. She throws a fit and her little guys start getting in my face. Here is where I'd like to say I got into this awesome fucking fight and kicked like eight high schoolers asses and then built like a fucking canoe out of their insensate bodies, sailed across a frozen river and founded an independent America. It didn't exactly go down like that though. I told this kid I'd call the cops before they arrived and they were aware of the situation and they had already been involved in the previous reports here. If anything at all physical went down, people would go to jail and they would go immediately, myself included. One punch, one push, everybody goes, end of story. To his credit, the little shit backed down. My sister threw her little fit and grabbed a bunch of her shit and cursed me out. I went in the kitchen and did the dishes, studiously ignoring her while keeping my eyes on them. Boys like that, they get all boner crazy and are liable to do stupid things. They left, it wasn't too long of an event. She hadn't made as much of a mess as I had figured, but sadly had taken a set of tiles she had given me long ago during happier times. That kind of bummed me out, but well, what could I do about it? I was cleaning up when Ash got home that night and asked me what happened. I gave her the lowdown. She sighed and said wifely things and helped me out. It was right about then we noticed my sister had stolen the fucking jar. She doesn't know anything about it. We never told her shit about it, actually. All she knows is that it's important. I was always fucking careful with it, kept it clean, kept it next to the kissing jar. I brag and tell stories about just about every rad thing I keep in that cubby on the bookshelf, but I never said shit about that jar. I assume she had seen Ash looking at it. I think she took it to hurt my feelings. Well, to date, I've purposely kept myself out of the loop. All I know is that my father has been calling my mother and stepfather quite a bit in the past few weeks. For the most part, everything for us has gone pretty much back to normal. Well, as normal as it ever gets. I told Tony what happened to the thing over emails, and he replied, Well then, we are not going to San Diego ever fucking again. Also, you are a retarded chicken fucker. I disagree with that statement though, as I'm pretty sure none of the chickens I may have allegedly fucked were in any way mentally handicapped. And so ends my involvement with the bad jar. A long time ago, I spent weeks in the Philippines with a group of people called Negritos. Pretty deep jungle work. The forest around the areas they lived could get really dense. And the smell? Oof. Jungle smells like swamp ass, smuggled in a dog shit bag. They were awesome people though. Very good at the things they did and from a much different world than I had come from. Weird shit and boogeymen were pretty much acknowledged as real. They would tell stories, but these aren't the make shit up to entertain your guests stories. These were more instructional, boring, and without embellishment. They also ate some bizarre stuff, and that was part of the reason we were there. Learning to survive in a place that's pretty much an evolutionary arms race, and everything else has had a head start on you. Couple of weird things happened while I was out there. Not the least of which was a conversation I had with one of our guides as we were rummaging around in the bush. We were setting traps and poking at different plants when I lit a cigarette. My guide made a short hand-waving gesture at me. Both hands, palm down, waved downwards. Put that out, put that out, he said. He had a kind of flat affect to his voice, and these guys are usually pretty quiet out there. Me. Dude, it's hot. It smells like dead whore and I got bugs on me. I'm not putting it out. Eat balls. Smoke keeps the bugs off. Him. Is that tobacco? Me. Yeah, I don't pack anything bigger than that. You want one? Him. Yes, but don't smoke here. Not near the trees. I hand him a cigarette and he tucks it behind his ear. Cigarettes are like currency in a lot of places. Even if you don't smoke and you go traveling in odd locales, carry a pack of smokes with you. You won't be disappointed. Anywho, he won't go any further until I put the damn thing out. So I dash it and give him a bored, pissed off look. Me. Alright, it's out. What's the fucking deal then? We got like feral baboons or something that's gonna jump me for it?
him. I don't know what you are saying, but this isn't a good place for tobacco smoke. Teak belongs love around here. Me. The hell did you just say? Teak belong. He points upwards. They like cigars. If you smoke around here, they will take you up into the trees and rape you. Me. Wait, what? What the fuck? Rape me up in the tree? Him. Yes, very uncomfortable. I could imagine it as very uncomfortable. The rest of our outing passed pretty uneventfully as I had put out my cigarette and thus avoided rape from something that lived in the trees. Later on, I did some digging around and discovered that take belongs are these retarded looking horse headed dudes that chew cigars and frequently abduct the shit out of people for little to no reason. While nothing supernatural happened there, it was just a flat matter of fact manner in which he had said such things that struck me as really bizarre. It wasn't a game. They had their games. This wasn't one. It was just instructions on how to not get raped by arboreal jungle ogres that lived in that specific area. One of the more flat out creepy things that happened was when I was called in to assist with a birth in the next village over. Having some medical experience, Corman, woohoo, I lived for this shit, and so hopped on this ridiculous little bike thing made out of 2x4s and scrounged wheels, rode down a couple of huge ass hills, and bam, there we are. The village was nothing fancy, same shit you see in documentaries, pretty basic accommodations and nothing more advanced than a simple radio. I don't mean to disparage the people when I say the place was pretty primitive. The people were awesome, just different and they didn't have any of the shit that we use and take for granted on a daily basis. The kids ate spiders. Oh, did I mention that they ate some crazy shit? No joke, first thing I see when we ride in is this little kid in a blue Superman t-shirt chewing on what I assumed was a cooked or pickled tarantula. Those taste terrible in my opinion. Anyway, there was a young lady who was in labor and showing signs of a difficult incoming birth, so I get together with the village's nurse midwife type, and we get to work. Signs are pointing towards a possible breech birth, and this girl is fucking tiny. We're in this little hut off to the side, helping her along, and I'm making sure she has enough fluids. Set up an IV and administer what meds I figure will do the most good. The midwife was puttering around, doing things by routine perfection, and made me look like a clumsy ass. Hours pass, and it starts getting dark. It's just the three of us when the birth really gets going, and this little thing is just screaming bloody murder and bleeding all over the goddamn place. The midwife is telling me it's likely the baby won't survive, but the mother is healthy and strong. I'm nervous about losing both because there was a lot of blood out where it wasn't doing any good, and the girl's breathing was getting shallow periodically. While we are working, I notice this old bat of a woman come in and stand quietly off to the side. I assume it's the girl's mother or something, and don't say anything about it. Shit finally starts to wrap up and the midwife manages some sort of judo birth canal arm wrestling maneuver and we have ourselves a slightly blue-lipped baby girl. After some work, she comes around and starts twitching and being a baby. I hand her to the midwife who is working on the placenta, and it looks like there's thankfully no tearing or remaining attachments that could cause some serious damage, at least from what we could tell. So pretty much mission accomplished. A messy and painful birth, like they all are, but not a fatal one. I'm feeling pretty good and give a smile and nod to the old woman who had come in and stood silently off to the side watching us the whole time. The midwife sees me do this, turns and notices her finally. She hissed. Women who hiss are scary. It's a weird and hateful noise. Old women are even worse. There's this old vitriol in it that just burns. It's vile and makes you feel so very bad. But old Filipinas hissing? Good god damn. If there's anything I learned from my time over there, it is to never, under any circumstances, be on the receiving end of one of those hisses. It's a poison green declaration of absolute contempt that just makes my damn bones shudder and my balls tighten. So yeah, she hisses at this old goat of a lady who came in, and the old goat just stares at her before hanging her mouth open and making this horrible smacking noise. The old bitch has no teeth, has a face like a wrinkled old anus, and is giving off this miasma of just filthy bad. Tagalog, or the local dialect thereof, comes from the midwife with a volume and rapidity that prevents me from ever translating it. I'm not good with Tagalog, 
but I got the distinct feeling that everything she was saying to the old woman was profane. The old intruder makes this weird inward moaning sound. There was a movie, The Grudge, with this dead Japanese woman who made this groaning sound. It was like that, but inward and hollower. Not as growly, but with this very weird hungry sound to it. Like a cat yelling, backwards. I'm sort of at a loss for what to do. So I'm standing there, watching this. The mother's fingers are digging into my arm strong enough to leave me bruises, and I have the baby in the crook of my other arm. The kid is still twitching and fussing but hasn't made any noise yet. The mother, I think, is praying, pretty frantically. The midwife keeps screaming and this old, toothless, howling woman thing holds her arms out towards me and makes this weird mewling noise before kind of grasping in my direction with her fingers. It was a comically, give me that baby, gesture. Its intent was pretty obvious. Awful kind of her since I wasn't proficient in the local languages. I was not going to give her that baby. Midwife is still cussing up a storm and I figure, well, I better make my position known. I shift the baby and sit it beside the mother and flip off the old woman. I know, it's a pretty specific gesture, but I think I got my intent across. This pisses off the old bat and she just lets out this awful slobbery noise. She's got saliva running down her face in thick ropes and her mouth is this wide, foul black spot on a face that's just looking more and more horrific by the moment. Old folks can be really creepy to look at and this ain't helping much. Without warning, the midwife grabs the placenta that she'd drawn up from the pan at the foot of the bed, screams some more, and throws it at the woman with great force. What happened next was sudden, far too sudden, and absolutely gross as all hell. Old hag, who'd been focusing her attention on me for the past few moments, just instantly turns, grabs the placenta, and shoves the whole damn thing in her mouth, like a fat kid eating spaghetti. Bam! Slurp! I'm not sure if the velocity of the placenta ever altered after it had been thrown. It was a perfect catch and redirect. She moved goddamn fast too. Way too fast for an old broken ass lady. I had hardly registered what just happened when the hag left. It was like she had bungee cords attached to her back under high tension, and she flipped a catch somewhere. Whoosh. Backwards out the door. She went out with such speed that the mat on the inside floor went flying. I wriggle loose from the mother and run out after her, intent on, I don't know, something. Perhaps more rude gestures, but there's nothing out there. Just jungle. The bitch was gone. After that, things went calm pretty quickly. The midwife continued her work with the mother, and the baby started squalling finally. I pass out in a chair in the corner and wake up the next morning to find the mom sound asleep and the midwife still going about her business, which happens to be her shooing me off. Many days later, I told that story to one of the Negritos, the same one who had warned me about the equine-aspected brutes of molestative intent in hopes of some sort of answer. I described it as best I could and he said I had seen a monongolin. It's a hard, weird word to say, monongolin, but you say it really fast. At first I thought he meant Penongolin, which I've heard about, but he told me it was different, or at least different here. Now that I think of it, he was pretty liberal with his bees, so he may very well have said Penongala or Penongolin. Long story short, the horrible woman was some sort of undead baby-sucking vampire thing that could be assuaged with either fresh placenta or dissuaded entirely with fire and thorny branches. I'm imagining massed firepower could probably dissuade her as well. This story takes place not long after I left the Navy and attempted to return to civilian life. It's an easy thing for some folks, but for me, there were tribulations that complicated it. I sort of went hobo for a few years there, wandering through various places and occasionally tracking down obscure branches of my family and spending time with them. I had a small line of cousins in West Virginia and this story took place there. First off, West Virginia can be absolutely gorgeous, very densely forested, lots of mountains and hills. It was amazing. It had its ugly side, sure, most of that being found in its people. But away from the cities and up in the hills, man, it's amazing. I guess the best description I could give is from a movie like Last of the Mohicans. 
There were waterfalls and pretty damn majestic cliffs. The forests were just mind-boggling and so open and clear. It's weird though, for all the goddamn grandeur of the place, the locals spent their time doing the stupidest things to keep themselves entertained. Hanging out in front of the local Dairy Queen parking lot seemed to be Richwood's chief social ritual. These kids would pull up in their pickup trucks, talk shit, and smoke pot until 3 in the morning. Occasionally, there would be some half-hearted racing, usually at least a handful of fights and screwing. They had some decent pot though, I'll give them that. Homegrown stuff. Some of it skunkweed, yeah, but enough of it was noticeably nice. I was shacking up at a great aunt's place and had just taken to heading down there with one of my cousins every night for the past week or so. Sure, I spent plenty of time just kind of wandering around in the hills, but these folks at the DQ were just sort of oddly fascinating. I could tell them stories as barter for various things and I made a solid amount of spending cash, cigarettes, and whatever else were doing it. These guys were stupid for tears too. Some guy whose claim to fame was high school fought by heroics made a name for himself one night by setting his beard on fire. I don't think he realized exactly how fast it was going to go up, or what kind of damage it was going to do in that short amount of time. But in under a minute, he went from looking like a rugged lumberjack to a screaming chemo patient. No one gave half a shit for him either. His brothers just loaded him up in their shitty pickup truck and drove him down to the clinic. One night, we're down there and I had made friends with this big doofus named Winston, or something or other, that everyone called Winnie. To put it politely, I'm pretty sure Winnie was either retarded or just inbred, or likely both. He was half again my size, his eyes were a bit too far apart, and he had this hilarious slow manner of speech, which combined with the local accent, a curiously exaggerated southernish sound, made him sound twice as stupid as he actually was. I may be mean-mouthing him, but we were friends. There was something I liked about the guy. Yeah, he was kind of like a kid, and sure, he could probably be dangerous if he lost his temper. But normally, he was just this really damn friendly guy who just seemed to want to be liked, and didn't get any of the jokes others had at his expense. They just liked that they laughed when he was around. These locals could get fucking nasty too. Something about the younger ones. They had eyes like raccoons just looking for something to grab onto with their grubby little paws and chew at. Winnie's best attribute is that he didn't even understand their bullying. Dude ate up my stories like they were candy too. And this encouraged me... And this encouraged me to elaborate on them further just to entertain him more. I could tell some real whoppers with this guy and he took him as gospel. It was beautiful. I'm telling him stories about how I saved a handful of beautiful Japanese women from evil World War II shoguns who just never gave up the fight and said rescue involved me at some point beating a tiger to death with my own severed arm, and he is wide-eyed and absolutely thunderstruck. This guy ended up following me around every time I went to one of these little get-togethers, which, if I'm not mistaken, is how they got to calling me the Tard Wrangler, which I wasn't much appreciative of. The one time the get-together deviated from the DQ parking lot was to have a bonfire out in the middle of the woods. There were sure to be some more liberties to be had out there, where the local cops couldn't idly cruise by. I was eager for it, and a few of the girls gave me directions on the promise that I'd either tell them some more of the, my weird stories about my travels, or bring a six-pack with me. I opted for both and then some, spending what little left of my money I had to buy a case or two, which Winnie was more than happy to lug around for me. Dude was tireless. He liked beer just fine, but was more partial to soda and Capri Suns. We showed up at 8 or 9, and the bonfire was already going pretty decent. People were drunk as hell and loud. The fire was big enough, I guess. Lots of random shit just set to burn. I distinctly remember a wicker chair in there. He had guns all over the place too, mostly shitty 22s and a few double barrels, but I heard handguns occasionally. They were shooting up in the air and off to the sides, plinking cans, and somebody got pissed when the back tires of his Toyota got blown to shit. I'm not big on guns, really. They bother me. That probably seems weird, but with that many drunk assholes around and most of them armed, someone was bound to do something lethally stupid. Winnie and I got to schmoozing and being social. I had initially decided for some god-awful reason to see if I could get the big doofus laid. There were plenty of pretty girls thereabouts. They had this farmer's daughter thing going on that's kind of irresistible, really. Clean cute faces, hell, freckles even, and then BAM, tits on display. I'd dipped around enough, and the girls were willing, no problem about that. 
I had figured I'd chat one up with Winnie in tow and maybe talk him up some and get a kick when she drug him off behind some bushes. I find a likely pair of girls and get to talking. I'm not really drinking much, and Winnie's pretty much just packing away the cokes. The girls were fairly fucking smashed though. The taller of the two had some amazingly dark brown hair that hung down to her waist and a body like a violin. She was wearing cut off shorts and actually had a pretty respectable tan going on. I have no doubt that this one had some Cherokee in her either. Her eyes and cheeks said as much. The other was a bit more like cello, but had a chest that pirates would kill a man over before burying somewhere. She was blonde though, and I'm not partial to those. Hell, I figured I'd take the violin and maybe do a duet with her off somewhere nice and give Winnie some pointers on the cello. I'd heard a kick-ass rendition of a Kansas song on a cello once, and figured Winnie should be able to figure out a passable version of that. Anyone knows are shared, ludities are dropped, and I may have pitched a horrible limerick or three. Winnie's over there being beautifully oblivious to the delicate interplay going on. One thing I'll give West Virginia's girls is that when they decide that they've really been sold on something, they can be pretty outright about getting to it. It's refreshing, really. A little bit of chat, and bam, her hand is in your pants. Throughout this, I'd been chatting Winnie up pretty solid, talked about how my cousin had a flat a few days ago, and the big galoot damn near picked up the whole first half of the car and whatnot. Blonde girl is swaying on her feet and giving him some come hither looks. I nudge Winnie and pull him off to the side and give him some basic rules of engagement. Now, I know how I was harping on about how dumb this guy was, but he caught on pretty fast after I laid it all out for him. I give him my basic rule. If she starts saying no or fussing and acting all unhappy like, then you just stop whatever it is you're doing. Take her hand gently and ask her to tell you exactly what she wants. You got that big guy? Winnie is all goofy smiles and bright eyes. Oh yeah, oh yeah, I seen the pictures. I smile and nod. Just don't start screaming or twist her head off or nothing like that. Winnie shakes his head. No, of course not, not a chance of that happening. Cello Girl takes him by the hand and leads him out of the firelight, off to some dark corner of the woods, and I take my Cherokee girl off to some high rocks on the far side. I will not go into any details, except to say that as best I could figure, that girl did not have any tan lines at all. Just kind of a nice coffee color to her all over. I am thoroughly enjoying myself when I get a poke between my shoulder blades. Now I am in sort of a state that might be called involved and don't notice it the first time. The poke comes again though, a bit more insistent and forceful, and I'm a bit, what the fuck? Violin girl's eyes damn near bug out of her head and she grabs her top, hissing out, oh for the love of Jesus. It's Winnie and he has this morose look on his face, completely unashamed of having interrupted my current engagement. Mr. Latron's, she done gone run off on me, what do I do, he says. I'm looking at him for a moment and my Cherokee girl takes this time to make herself scarce, damn it. I take a big sigh and look up at him while I'm getting my fix in order and ask him. What in the twisted snakes are you talking about, Winnie? She done run off into the woods. She ain't there no more. What do I do? Did you grab a rough or snap anything? No, I was being real gentle-like. She said it was okay. And then she just got up and left? Yup. Yeah. Right in the middle of it? Yup. Yeah. Oh shit. I figured maybe she just cut and run on the big guy or something and did it in a suitably crafty enough manner to leave him dumbfounded, which really wouldn't be too difficult. I calm him down and figure we might as well chase after and see what's up. I wasn't wanting to make a scene or anything, just make sure the guy hadn't had a black moment or something and done a thing we'd both regret. He takes me down to where they were doing their thing and I see his shirt and her clothes kind of spread out, so they'd have something comfortable to lay on. Her clothes were still there. What the hell? Winnie, she ran off naked? I asked. He nods. Yeah. I'm having a think and ask him which direction did she go and run off to, cause it sure as hell wasn't back to camp. He points off to a dark part of the forest, near where the mountainside is, more like a cliff, and jabs in that direction. Oh shit. Winnie, was she giggling and laughing and shit when she ran off? Yeah. Oh, you doofus. You're supposed to chase after her ass. You said to be careful and not to move too fast. Yeah, I did say that. Well, shit. Listen, it's this thing girls do. They make you chase them, and then they run around like idiots, and then you play wrestle them down, and you know what? Fuck it. Let's go make sure she didn't get eaten by a cougar, stupid ass drunk hillbilly. I ain't... I ain't drunk. I wasn't talking about you, Winnie. Come on. 
And so we went, leaving behind the bonfire and the gunshots and the noise, right out into the woods towards that cliff. If anyone here is familiar, if anyone here is familiar with West Virginia, they know it's very much a coal mining state. I'm pretty sure a large amount of horrible mine collapses and stuff have occurred over the years, if not in West Virginia, then in other areas nearby. The mountains are riddled with old shafts and openings. A few times while I was out wandering, I've almost stumbled right into a vent or a shaft that was all overgrown. I wasn't too surprised then when we came to a half-collapsed mine entrance on the side of that cliff. I'm feeling a little queasy, but I figured the stupid thing probably ran her ass in there for some privacy. Winnie's got kind of a blank look on his face at the moment and isn't offering any insightful observations. I didn't have much on me but a lighter, having given my old trusty little flashlight away to a friend before I left the service, so I light it up and head in. I figure she can't have gone too far in, right? It's dark as hell. We get a couple of feet in, and sure enough, just at the edge of the little circle of light my fire's making, I can see for a second a curve of pale thigh. She giggles and moves off deeper into the dark. I'm thinking, god damn it, the drunk ass is still playing her games and is likely more than not to get herself killed. I holler at her and we keep going. Listen chick, whatever your name is, enough games. Come on now, let's head back. This shit is unsafe, you hear me? All I get in answer is another stupid flirty giggle, a brief glimpse of some tits and maybe a shoulder and she goes deeper yet. I'm starting to get a little pissed. I was having some decent fun. Hell, Winnie was getting his too. And now we have to play games with some drunk hillbilly in an abandoned mine, of which there were hundreds of up in these hills. If something went wrong, the chances of us being found were nil, especially since the locals didn't tell the cops shit about what they were up to out here. I keep going, and we turn a corner, turn another one, keep going down chasing the staffy giggling bitch. Winnie stumbles a few times on the old rusted tracks that were splayed out every which way and gets to complaining that it's stuffy and smells bad in here. I'm about to whip into him when I realize something. He's right, it does smell goddamn bad in here. At first I accounted it was due to the trash and old condoms and shit, but we'd long since gone past that point. There wasn't anything down this far except rocks and dust. Bad shit maybe? No, guano smells different, makes your eyes water. This smells like that shit you get in the back of your throat when you've had strep. Those weird, grungy, yellow nuggets of congealed mucus that when coughed out smells like horrendous rotten ass. It smelled something like that. Meanwhile, the flirting ninja is still dancing out of my flickering little light, which is starting to sputter and has gone out two or three times now. It's also hot as shit. The feeling comes in slow and powerful. I can feel the hairs on the back of my neck go, Oh shit, Canis. I stop, and Winnie bumps into me. I turn and look over at him, and he's still got that blank look on his face. Rut roll shaggy. My name's Winnie. I snort back a laugh and give him a solid look. Winnie, we need to get ourselves out of here, I think. This girl is going to get us killed. We can't just leave her to get hurt down here. He's looking concerned now, and it's a genuine concern, which is pretty awesome. I'm trying to remember how long we've been chasing this girl and how many turns we've made. It's more than three, and hell, my ring of light doesn't do much. How many side passages have we passed that I hadn't seen? Oh fuck me. This place is a goddamn maze, and all I have to get us out is this big lighter that is currently burning the shit out of my thumb, and she is still fucking giggling right over there, a stone's throw. I start pushing Winnie back and say, Come on big guy, she'll follow us out. Let's get back up topside. This place smells wrong, innit? He gives me this mournful look and nods, and we start going back. The giggling is following. Always just out of full reach of my light. Can't see but bits and pieces of pale skin and curves. Never eyes and no hands either. How the hell is she getting by down here? I've been in enough weird situations to figure this might be one of them by now. We're heading back and she's following us when I slam right into an old knocked over minecart. Just laying on its side in the middle of the tunnel. Immediately, alarms go off by my head. Oh fuck me, we didn't pass a minecart. Oh fuck, we've gone turned around. My lighter goes out as I'm still reeling from this disturbing revelation and I hear from right behind us. I furiously get to clicking my bick, and eventually it sputters up half-acidly, and I can see her pull back into the shadows. She was close this time, touching close. I didn't see much. I saw her form and figure, the hips and chest, but the feet were all wrong. It was brief. 
that burned into my eyes there. I'm sure in hindsight it could have been a trick of the light, but at that moment, I wasn't wasting my time trying to validate and explain what I, what I had seen with logic or common sense. Her feet were pointed, featureless, like spikes. From calf down, they just kept on tapering until they reached a point that she was walking on and scuttled back into the shadows with. I can hear a giggle and that weird breathy come over here noise girls make when they want your attention. Normally, it's sexy as hell, but my blood's running cold and miserable right now because of it. Winnie steps in close and is staring off in her direction and says, That ain't her. I'm a bit aghast but manage to respond, You know, you aren't half as dumb as people say you are, Winnie. Which gets a smile out of him. We tried to find a way back as best we could. I had Winnie up in the front and warned to watch his footing because falling down a shaft now would be pretty much the end of our party tonight. As he was going forward, I had my back to his and was watching behind, walking backwards for every step he took. I'm breathing real careful. My lighter is going out of fuel and that light is just shrinking. And if I breathe on it funny, well fuck. She's keeping up with us too, always right at the edge and that edge is getting closer. I don't even have a goddamn knife on me, stupid. How the hell did I not bring one? Or borrow a gun from one of those sister fucking rednecks up at that bonfire? Stupid. Stupid. This is going so poorly. When he is concentrating on forging a path back up, but I can hear him sighing and getting a bit frustrated, banging his head a few times on the low ceiling. One, I've got this thing following us, and I can almost see it for what it is, and it isn't good. Two, I'm really hoping when he doesn't lose his temper and go apeshit with me right next to him. I'm missing Tony right about now. Then I hear the damnedest thing in between her steps. I can hear kind of a far off tapping. It's ringing, metal on metal, tap, 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 real regular like. Winnie immediately sort of hones in on that noise, zones out and starts moving towards it. Got taps in one direction and ticks in another. Her hands and legs are the same way. Oh god damn it. She has the same tapering points on her arms as her legs and I can just about see her face. It's smiling, but it's all wrong. It's all out of proportion. Her eyes are spread and her nose is flat, and I still have no idea where we are. I've given up figuring a way out to a big guy who's about as complex a thinker as Bambi the Prince of the Forest. He just keeps going though, and I'm trying to find something to burn so I can keep the light up. Searching my pockets for some paper or something, I manage to find the receipt for the beer we bought earlier and light that shit up. There's a brief small flare of light, and I see this thing kind of bounce back into the dark and go up the side like gravity doesn't matter a whit to her. Like a spider, moving weird now, not pretending anymore. That tapping is still calling to Winnie and my light is pretty much dead. Then I hear him tense up, and no shit, he actually says, yippee, or something damn close enough. My light goes flat dead and I'm sucking in a breath and getting ready for it. I figure if this thing grabs me, I can maybe scream like an ass or bite it or something, I don't know. It takes me a second to realize that even though my light's gone out, I can still kind of see. Oh shit, that's moonlight. Fuck this, we are out. When he is walking and I damn near bowl his ass over. Move, fucking move, move it man. Move, move, move. I'm out with my feet hitting dirt in seconds and when he is just kind of jogging after me. Whatever that thing was, it ain't coming out of that mine shaft after us. We're standing there, collecting ourselves, and I notice I could still hear that weird metal-on-metal -metal tapping noise. It's coming from inside the mine, which is weird because, to us, it sounded like it was coming from outside, right? I'm figuring echoes or some shit, but I'm getting that distinct gut feeling that tells me, no, it isn't just echoes, man. I know she's right there at the mouth of that shaft, though. I can feel it. I'll take care of it. Trusty guy, me saying that, immediately puts him back to normal. We get back to the party. Now, honestly, I have no idea how I'm going to take care of it, and in truth, I'm not really planning on even attempting it. As best I know, that dumb girl ran in there and got A. Lost, B. Eaten. And neither of those two possibilities mattered one fuck all to either me or Winnie, so the discovery of both those girls back at camp, clothed and irritated as fuck, was kind of a nice reveal. Those two were back at the fire and purely ignoring the hell right out of us. They were back to getting the drink on and chatting up with some local good old boys, and I'm wondering, well, what the fuck? Winnie, 
When that girl ran off, do you remember which way she went? When he shrugs and cracks open like beer number two, or possibly soda number thirteen, and nods, yeah, she went that way. What we went. I gave him a long look. You sure about that? He starts to smile and nod, and then frowns and shakes his head. Nope. Oh fuck me. Best we could figure from talking to the others was that cello girl had run off into some bushes wanting to play Catch Me If You Can and had been waiting out there naked for quite a while before giving up, getting her clothes and finding her friend. She had never even known about the goddamn mine, what was in it, or that weird knocking sound. Violin girl was giving me attitude because my big goofy buddy made an ass out of her best friend in blah 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 dumb shittery. It wasn't too long after that found me elsewhere out of West Virginia. Caught a ride with a trucker who was a solid dude and a former marine to boot, so oorah to that. I gave Winnie my empty Bic lighter though, and told him it was a good luck charm. I'd bet anything, he still has it. There you go. West Virginia? Beautiful place? Stupid people? Deep holes. The bloop was an ultra low frequency underwater sound recorded by the NOAA in 1997. It was unlike any other sounds ever recorded underwater due to its frequency and the fact that it was recorded by other sensors thousands of miles from its estimated source. It is consistent with other marine animal noises due to its rapid changing frequency, but it would be an animal many times larger than the blue whale, the largest animal to ever exist. The consensus by most scientists is that it was caused by geological activity. What is your view, slash x? Oh, that's the black carpet, allegedly. A bit of an urban legend amongst deep sea divers, I'm that diver Anon if anyone was in that last deep sea thread. I've heard about this thing a couple of times from coworkers and buddies. I don't remember the details of the full story right now to be honest, but I'll talk to my buddy sometime and see if he remembers and post him on here. But the basic gist that I can remember is that this thing is some sort of colony organism, like a giant moving coral. It's a giant black carpet of macrobiotic cells that crawls over the ocean floor sifting through nutrients with millions of tiny feelers. Nobody has ever gotten a good estimate of the size, other than, it's big, and apparently it makes a noise similar to this bloop thing. One guy apparently saw it swimming slash riding the currents as well, so it does more than just crawl on the ocean floor. I suppose you could call it a one-of-a-kind organism, but I'm not sure if that applies to colony organisms like this. Macrobiotic cells so, you're saying the ocean floor is covered by a giant jellyfish? Ah, what you just described sounds terrifying. That's actually pretty cool. Essentially, yes. According to how the black carpet has been described to me, it shares many similarities to a jellyfish. One story I heard had a diver getting stung by some sort of large feeler strand that apparently hangs off the top, similar to a jellyfish. There was this really old retired diver I talked to, who claimed to have seen it. He claimed to have seen an entire decomposing sperm whale being consumed by the carpet. I should really make a post compiling all the stories I've heard about this thing. So I talked to my buddy and I'm going to start writing up some of the stories I've heard about the black carpet. This is the first story I heard of it, from some Finnish bloke with a strong accent. He was doing a deep sea dive repairing some sort of cable. I assume it was probably fiber optic. As he told it, initially, he thought he was in the wrong spot because he couldn't find the cable anywhere. He starts searching and eventually finds one end, just the one, sheared clean through. He gets his dive buddy to stay with that end of the line while he goes looking for the other end, swimming in a straight line in the direction of the other line. In his estimation, he swam about half a mile before he found the other end of the line. He stressed to me that the entire half a mile middle section of the line was just completely gone. It was a huge deal, and everyone thought it was the Russians, but this guy was sure that this carpet thing had done it. Said he heard the noise it apparently makes, even though he never saw it. This next story is from my buddy. You heard it from a guy, you heard it from another guy, you heard it from another guy. So, take it with a heavy grain of salt. This guy is doing a dive. Depth, location, what he was doing never got specified just that he was really deep. He starts hearing this odd noise that gets associated with the carpet a lot. The way he described it was similar to that video of the bloop. Ultra low pitch, sort of like a super creepy distorted whale song. As he gets closer, he hears this 
almost static crackling noise as well. The way he described it was like a million prawns getting cracked open at once, if that makes any difference. As it gets closer to the bottom, the noises are getting louder and louder. At this point, he was thinking he's hearing some sort of sonar from a submarine, and that some jackass submarine crew is playing a joke on him. When the guy gets to the bottom, he shines his light around, trying to find whatever he's looking for. And what he saw was that the sea floor had literally come to life and was crawling past him. This is probably the best description of the carpet you're going to get. According to this guy, carpet is at least a mile long slash wide, made mostly of these strange black feelers that apparently make the strange popping noise. Most of the top is covered in various sand, rocks, debris, with feelers poking through. Also a few long transparent stalks, as he described them, that float upwards. Apparently, some of these were like 20 feet long. According to the guy, it was singing, which doesn't make any fucking sense to me, but whatever. Guy swam back up to the surface and claimed he had an equipment malfunction, came back down a couple of hours later, and got there just in time to see the last of the thing disappear. Apparently, it stretched as far as the eye could see, which isn't that far at the bottom of the ocean, but still. This one is an old urban legend that's been floating around the diving community for years. Never heard a concrete source of it, so, in my opinion, it probably never happened, especially since it involves a submarine crew, so I'm not sure how a diver would have heard about it, since, as far as I know, submarine crews usually stay inside their ship. Anyways, here goes. Submarine is doing something, either war games or patrolling for Chinese slash Russian slash North Korean slash bad guy submarines. The story isn't terribly consistent about this. I hear it different every single time. For whatever reason, they are not using active sonar because they want to avoid detection, floating dead somewhere a couple of hundred meters off the sea floor. They're just sitting there, chilling and listening with their sensors, trying to detect enemy submarines or whatever. When they start hearing the noise, their sensors can't make any sense of it and it's getting louder at an alarming rate. Starts out as something only the sensors can hear, but before long, the entire crew is hearing this strange, distorted humming slash singing that people always associate with the carpet. Captain thinks the only explanation is that it's some sort of new sonar slash jamming technology in order the sonar crew to send out a ping to locate the source of the noise. This is the part of the story that stays the most consistent, I assume because it's the most memorable. The sonar operator shouts out, New sonar contact, bearing. Sir? What's our depth? The captain replies, 500 meters, or whatever depth the submarine is supposed to be at. The sonar operator replies, But sir, the sonar says the seafloor is 10 meters below us. The captain says, That's nonsense. Then walks over to the sonar station, checks the readings, then walks over to the helmsman and checks the depth, checks the nautical charts for where they are. Somehow, apparently, the ocean has gotten about 200 meters shallower. Captain orders another ping from the sonar to try and locate the source of the noise. Sonar operator speaks up again, concerned. Sir, the ocean is getting deeper again. Captain asks him to repeat himself. Ocean floor is once again at expected depth, sir. Captain takes a look for himself, and sure enough, they are no longer 10 meters above the ocean floor. There is also a very, very large dot on the screen behind the submarine. Captain asks what the large contact is. Sonar operator. Equipment malfunction, sir. Captain pings again, just out of curiosity. The equipment malfunction has maintained its shape and is continuing to move away from the submarine and apparently taking the strange noise with it. Again, this is basically an old wives' tale amongst deep sea divers, so take it with a grain of salt. It's possible that a submarine detected the carpet, or whatever, on sonar, and that's the origin of the story. But I highly doubt this actually happened. Still makes for a cool story though. Last story for now. I'll see if I can dig up some more later. This is from the old guy I talked about earlier. Nice guy. Marine biologist who has done both deep sea welds and nature research slash studies with ROVs. Apparently, the carpet 
ate one of his ROVs on an expedition. According to him, it happened late one night while the rest of the crew was sleeping. He was pulling an all-nighter studying the sea life around volcanic vents. He's moving the ROV from one vent to the next when he sees what he described as churning sediments on the sea floor. A giant moving cloud of underwater dust essentially moving towards the ROV. He moves in closer and sees what he describes as a colossal echnoderm crawling along the sea floor, with long, dexterous filament probing the sea floor ahead of it. He maneuvers the ROV in for a closer look and uses the arm to prod one of the filaments. In the blink of an eye, he lost contact with the ROV. Apparently, it happened so fast he didn't even see it happen. One second, the thing was about 5 meters away from the vehicle. The next second, it had swallowed the thing whole. His excuse for not having footage was that the footage was all recorded and stored on the ROV, rather than being recorded on the operating station, which seems fishy to me. He was, however, very confident in himself, to the extent he claims that he is the discoverer of this new species. He even gave it a name, which I completely forgot because it was so stupid and boring. Giant sea carpet sounds cooler anyways. If it's similar to a jellyfish and is actually a colony of microorganisms, then it might be related to the Portuguese man-of-war. The way I've heard it described, it shares more similarities with a starfish or sea anemone than a jellyfish. The marine biologist guy who said he'd seen it had some interesting thoughts on what it was. His idea is that it's some sort of holdover slash descendant from the very first invertebrate forms of life on Earth. He did a whole long talk about how coral is one of the oldest forms of life on the planet, and the reason why the ocean is the only place teeming with large invertebrate creatures is because that's where all life first evolved. In his mind, jellyfish and all other sea invertebrates probably evolved from this thing, rather than vice versa. This giant sea carpet, or whatever, would have been one of the very first forms of life to ever exist on Earth, technically making it one of our ancient ancestors. It's a pretty cool theory, all things considered. The one at 409 looks almost exactly like a very small version of what I've heard the black carpet is described as. I'm going to try and get in contact with the old biologist guy who saw the carpet and ask him some more questions. It wouldn't happen if the majority of vast military spending then do kickbacks for juicy contracts, then actual development and manufacture of equipment. It's all a racket. That being said, or written, let's get on with weird ass naval shit. Way, way back in the mid 1980s, I read in a book on cryptids that there was something called the hide. Apparently, it was a flattish thing with eyes along the rim, about the size of a large cowhide, hence the name. From what I recall, the one observation was of such a creature rising up out of an underwater trench to absorb a shark who'd somehow become paralyzed by it. It was observed at some distance by a diver. Does any of that ring a bell to anyone? Supposedly took place somewhere off the Pacific coast of South America. I've heard some people who claim to have seen that thing, or similar things. A lot of stuff I've heard from other divers seems like they can be attributed to very large slash rare siphonophores that live in the deep sea. What you're talking about was described to me as some sort of pancake-shaped creature that would hide under the sand with a single small near-transparent tentacle floating upwards. The diver touched it, spasmed, and immediately the creature rose out of the sand to devour him. Don't touch strange shit in the ocean, people. May as well go on a tangent and talk about some other stories I've heard that might be attributed to siphonophores. There was this one cranky old retired diver he swore he'd seen a sea monster of unfathomable size on a dive once. I always assumed he was full of shit, but the way he described it sounds a lot like a siphonophore. The story went something like this. He was on a dive, doing something that I've forgotten when he sees an absolutely giant tentacle stretching up from the nearby drop-off. The thing was so huge, he couldn't see no beginning nor end to it. And so now, he goes around constantly claiming to have come within a hair breadth of devourment by a gargantuan sea leviathan of unfathomable proportion. And yes, that is exactly how he talked. Looking into these siphonophores, it makes total sense that something like this could exist. 
though it would be less of a sea monster than a giant serpentine jelly blob sifting through plankton and floating nutrients. Another siphonophore-related story I've heard is one about an absolutely gargantuan jellyfish-type creature that was allegedly about the size of a military submarine. The diver who saw it said the thing was so massive, it had somehow developed its own biosphere, with various species of fish circling around and swimming inside of it. He described it as having an appearance like a giant upside-down orchid suspended underneath a massive sphere of translucent jelly. The coloration was very dull, but that might have been just due to the extreme depth. Yeah, flat lifeforms can hide amazingly well. Just a regular skate or flounder is proof enough of that. A diver touched it, spasmed, and immediately the creature rose out of the sand to devour him. I found the book on my shelf, and it does mention that the shark made a convulsive spasm as the creature rose up and sucked the shark through some sort of orifice in the center of the creature. Source Living Wonders, Mysteries and Curiosities of the Animal World Authors John Mitchell and Robert J. M. Richard This story is off on a bit of a tangent, very much out there in terms of believability. It's not a very widespread of widely believed story, mostly because of how crazy slash supernatural it is. If you work as a diver long enough, you're bound to run into a few people like this. Ultra superstitious guys who believe in all sorts of curses, black luck, sea monsters, etc. A common belief you'll find among many of them is this sea deity slash god slash demon called Davy Jones, who roams the sea floor, searching for divers or sailors who have displeased him for one reason or another. Whenever someone or something is lost at sea and never recovered, Davy Jones has got it. What makes this X-related is the description one guy gave me of this Davy Jones, because it's pretty spooky. The guy claimed to have seen on one of his dives a trail of giant footprints approximately as long in length as he was tall, so about five and a half feet long since the guy was pretty short, and though he'd never seen it himself, he claimed one of his friends had. This Davy Jones was a bipedal humanoid that stood over 200 feet tall on tall, stalk-like limbs that was walking along the sea floor, kicking up great clouds of silt behind him as he walked. According to this guy, to look him in the face is instant death, for his visage be too horrifying for any mere human to behold. He was probably just fucking with me, but it's still a cool spooky story to put on here for you lads. Any other cool rare cryptids in that book? Well, there are globsters, Trunco, and what seems to be modern-day sightings of surviving Stellar's sea cow. The Queensland tiger gets a mention, and cats with some sort of vestigial wings. The man-eating tree gets a mention as well, both the one in Madagascar and the one in Central America. Ever see a ghost underwater? Yes, well, to be more specific, I saw a hallucination of my dead father because the oxygen injector on my rebreather malfunctioned on a dive and gave me a bad case of narcosis. I was definitely hallucinating, but it really felt like him, if that makes any sense. Thanks for sharing, Anon. Whereabouts in the world did this story come from? I met the guy while I was working in the Hibernia oil field in 2009. Fun story. I refuse to do any oil rig work now because a lot of it is really sketchy, and you end up having to pull a 10 plus hour shift while doing very delicate work deep underwater, and I was afraid after that big Mexico oil spill that I'd fuck something up and cause a massive spill. So yeah, I don't do jobs like that anymore, even though they pay really well. So I finally got hold of the old biologist guy on the phone and talked to him about the sea carpet again. According to him, it's not a siphonophore. He qualified that by saying that siphonophores are not fast or mobile. They survive by basically floating around and expending very little energy and occasionally snagging a meal with a neurotoxin stinger tentacle. He talks about for a while what makes the carpet seemingly a biological impossibility. According to him, something of that size wouldn't get enough food slash energy to survive and keep up its level of activity just from scavenging sediments on a seabed. Siphonophores can get really really huge because they sort of sit around and let food come to them without any energy expenditure. So the profile of the carpet fits more with an active predator slash scavenger than a passive one. 
I mentioned to him that I'd heard stories about decomposing corpses of whales being seen by some people being digested by the carpet. He got really excited about that. His working theory is that the carpet is an entirely unknown form of life in the sense that it is a colony organism similar to a siphonophore, but the individual cells are much more complex and capable than those of a siphonophore. Keep in mind, this is purely theoretical stuff he's pulling out of his ass to try and explain why something that should be physically slash biologically impossible might exist. He studies siphonophores quite extensively, and one thing that remains a mystery is how the cells communicate, considering they have no central nervous system or brain to speak of. They're basically just big bacteria. The key, apparently, is high-frequency vibrations. He hasn't been able to prove it yet because it's damn hard to get your hands on a siphonophore to study, but he thinks the individual cells vibrate to communicate with one another and pass a message along the entire organism. His theory is that the carpet is basically the siphonophore equivalent of a Russian nesting doll. Rather than being a colony of individual cells, it is a colony of individual multicellular siphonophores and is therefore the missing link between single-celled and complex multicellular life. The bloop noise, which the carpet apparently makes, is actually millions of these creatures communicating in their own primitive language. Since siphonophores can reproduce asexually, he envisions the carpet as constantly evolving in size and shape, depending on the environment and amount of food it can consume. So perhaps after it consumed the carcass of a very large creature, like a whale, or a giant squid, it would be extremely large and have a large amount of cells, but would eventually shrink as it self-consumed unneeded cells. The multicellular structure of the carpet serves a twofold purpose, both serving as a distraction from potential predators, similar to a lizard losing its tail while running away, and a long-term storage of nutrients, since big meals are few and far between at the bottom of the ocean. The carpet stores the energy it consumes by creating more cells and growing larger, which it will consume between meals whenever it needs energy. Not just that, but he's very convinced that the very first forms of life on Earth evolved in the deep ocean near volcanic vents, making the carpet the oldest existing form of life on the planet by far. He talked my ear off for a while, but I don't have much more information to tell you guys other than this for now. Though I feel that even though this is X, and people come here to hear about supernatural slash weird stories and shit, this is just the hypothesis of one guy who apparently saw the carpet once. It is by no means the definitive truth, and this guy hasn't ever actually been able to perform a real scientific study on it. He just saw it once and is drawing conclusions from what little knowledge he has. I've had a few ethereal tormentors along the way. When I was very little, a trio of faceless figures in black hooded robes would materialize in my bedroom and silently move in a procession from one side to the other. Sometimes they would stop beside my bed and stand there watching me all night. In hindsight, they were probably some sort of shadow projected by the headlights of passing cars, but they seemed real enough at the time. They only bothered me in the first house I lived in and I haven't seen them since I was about 7 years old. Later on, I was occasionally visited by a pale, thin, faintly luminous female figure with large black eyes. She was always naked, but rather indistinct and inhuman in appearance. Most often, she would linger near the windows, whispering softly, but at times, she would lie down against me in the bed and run her fingers along my throat. I had the most terrifying feeling of suffocation and impending death whenever she touched me. Usually, her visits lasted a few minutes, after which she would fade away. Not so sure of the explanation for this one, other than maybe a recurring hallucination. It's been about four years since I last saw her. In any case, if the hooded figures appeared, I wouldn't be particularly troubled. They seemed pretty bro tier. Maybe offer them some whiskey if they were corporeal enough to drink it. If it was the pale naked thing? I don't know. I suspect she would be more arousing than terrifying to me now, and I would be tempted to follow Descartes' advice regarding giving her the dick. This and I'm back again. A four year stretch without the pale luminous figure disturbing my sleep has officially come to an end. I woke up shortly before dawn and I'm quite certain I saw her watching me from the corner of my room for a few seconds before melting away into the shadows. How does TG recommend I proceed if she becomes as frequent a nighttime visitor as she used to be? Also, fuck you guys. I'm convinced this thread is responsible for her finding me again. My sleep had been peaceful ever since I moved to my current apartment, but now the horrors know I'm here. Alright, it's hard to say exactly what her height is given I'm looking up at her from my bed, but I'd guess she's around 5'10 tall. She has an unnaturally thin and elongated body build, but definitely feminine. 
narrow waist, small breasts, etc. You'd expect to see ribs sticking out given her emaciated build, but there are none visible. She does not appear to breathe. Her entire body is hairless, as is her head. Her skin is very pale, more like grayish white than normal human skin tone, and seems to emit a faint glowing luminescence. Not enough to cast light on objects around her, but enough that she is visible regardless of the light level in the room and shadows are not cast on her. She is always naked and appears to be anatomically correct, so to speak, but the ethereal glow that surrounds her makes the details rather indistinct. It's almost like she looks out of focus. It's difficult to explain, but there is something decidedly non-sexual about her nudity, like it's just her nature. As far as her face is concerned, she seems entirely expressionless. Her eyes are about 50% larger than those of a normal person, and are entirely black. I've never seen her blink. Small mouth, always closed. Small or non-existent nose, though there is sort of a hint of nostrils. Again, her ethereal and indistinct nature makes details difficult to pick out. Fap as you wish, hedonist gentlemen. So, I've got a bunch of votes for trying to fuck my supernatural visitor, and a couple for trying to ward her off with slash x fuckery. Anyone want to break the tie? What do, slash GG? Well, it's decided then. The next time she appears in my room, I will do everything in my power to make sweet love to whatever the hell she is. If I never post the results of this attempt, you'll know that either she has never reappeared or that you got me killed. And on reporting in. Shortly after 2.30am, I awoke feeling a cool body lying against my right side. I was on my back and she was on her side facing towards me. I have no idea how long she had been there. I opened my eyes ever so slightly in order to see that it was my usual visitor, but otherwise feigned sleep, concerned at this point that I was in danger. A minute passed uneventfully, but then she moved a bit closer and put her lips against my neck. It wasn't quite a kiss, she just pressed her lips against my skin and lay perfectly motionless. I had the sense at the time that it was more like she was mimicking a kiss without really understanding the gesture. The duration of this was about 2 minutes, during which time I did not feel her inhale or exhale. At that point, I whispered, Hello, and she drew back. I turned my head towards her for a better look at my visitor, but after a second or two, she vanished. Afterwards, I observed that the covers on the side of the bed that she had been lying on had been disturbed and thrown aside. Though I can't discount the possibility that I did that in my sleep. In this context, it would offer some evidence that my visitor takes on a corporeal form beyond my personal perception. Interestingly enough, unlike the instances in years past when she touched me, I didn't feel the awful suffocating sensation that made her visit so unpleasant. Whether this was due to a conscience choice on her part not to harm me, or because those previous symptoms were purely psychosomatic, I can't say. In any case, I am beginning to suspect that this will be a more difficult quest than I had initially thought. Though I don't appear to be in any particular danger of being killed, and she seems on some level to have perceived and responded to my amorous intent, I don't see how I will actually be able to have sex with my visitor, or even communicate with her, if she disappears as soon as she realizes I'm awake. Suggestions? Alright, turning up the heat a bit to sleep naked. Not sure if I have anything around suitable to leave as a gift. Do supernatural creatures like small uncut rubies? Shame it's winter or I'd pick a flower in the yard and leave it on my other pillow. I've placed the ruby on a silk handkerchief on top of the nightstand on the side of the bed my visitor appeared at last night. As for lube, I think I'll leave that issue for her to deal with if need be. As always, I will report in the morning if I'm still alive. Good night and good luck. And on reporting in, my visitor returned as expected and remained for most of the night. Did not manage to fuck it, but progress towards that goal has definitely been made. It's only a matter of time now. I'm still alive, more or less, though prolonged physical contact with my visitor seems to have had some sort of deleterious effect on my health. Anyways, I need to try to get to my securities law class. I'll write up a more detailed report later, probably a little afternoon. And on reporting in. As per your suggestions, I left a small ruby on the nightstand as an offered gift for my visitor. Slept nude and remained as passive as possible in order to see what she would do when left undisturbed. At 1.47am, I was awoken by a faint whispering sound that had often accompanied my visitor in the past. I looked towards the source of the noise and saw that it was indeed my pale visitor, standing a few feet to the right of the bed, staring at me. As far as I could tell, there were no words or even a discernible rhythm or pattern to the whispers just a continuous stream of soft atonal sound. I glanced at the clock and went back to sleep. Sometime later, I awoke to find my visitor lying to the right of me, facing me as she had the night before, not sure of the time as I could not easily see the clock and did not want to move. 
She had one arm across my body and was tracing a fingertip along the various bones of my torso. Collarbone, sternum, along some ribs, hip bone, and so forth. Eventually, this gave way to a more general caress. Several times, her fingers briefly brushed over my penis, but she paid no particular attention to it. I got the general impression that her touch was more exploratory than sensual. A few minutes passed like this before she stopped moving and simply lay motionless at my side. Sometime thereafter, I drifted off to sleep once more. Later on, I awoke to find her lying more or less on top of me. It felt as though some time had passed, but judging by the darkness of the room, it was still several hours before dawn. She was motionless, as usual, and had her lips pressed to the base of my neck. I will say at this point that sleeping in the nude was a most excellent idea. The sensation of her cool, lithe body, stretched out full length against me, was distinctly enjoyable, though it is worth noting that she has no observable heartbeat. Feeling increasingly cold, I pulled the covers in close around us, and out of curiosity, I placed my left arm across her back, hugging her against me. For a moment, I could feel my visitor tense, and I feared that she might vanish as she had before. On the contrary, she relaxed and sort of writhed against me for a moment, before resuming her habitual stillness. Unfortunately, the feeling of cold remained unrelieved. If anything, it seemed to grow worse. And while I did my best to remain awake as long as possible, at some point about an hour later, I lost consciousness and did not wake again until morning. Rather worryingly, I found that there have been some lingering negative effects to her visit. I feel as if I haven't slept in a week. Complete and utter exhaustion and mind and body. I could barely keep my eyes open in class. Hell, just breathing is tiring, and I have this persistent feeling of cold. The thermostat says it's 75 degrees in here, but I might as well be sitting in the refrigerator. Also, though I didn't see her take it, the ruby is nowhere to be found. Gift accepted? Anyways, I'm starting to wonder if I made a mistake. I suppose it's too late to turn back now. Suggestions on how I proceed from here? And on reporting in. I'm not sensing a lot of optimism about my odds here, and I must admit I'm feeling more than a little trepidation about the coming night. I am unfortunately more sober than I might wish, and feel as close to death's door as it did in the morning. I guess there's nothing for it but to see this through to the end. If luck is on my side, I'll have stories to tell in the morning, and if it is not, well, I suspect I'll have stories that I won't get to tell. Any advice before I head off to bed? It is my intention to proceed as I did last night and allow my visitor to do as she pleases. If I should die, let it be known that I went to my fate willingly in pursuit of knowledge and sensation. As always, I will endeavor to report my experience in the morning. If you have not heard anything from me by tomorrow afternoon, you will know what has happened. Good night and good luck, elegant gentlemen. It's been an honor. And thus, Anon fell silent. Good night, sweet prince. Finally, in pursuit of giving her the dick, there is no sacrifice too great. Descartes. 22-6-21 Sup slash X I was debating if I should post this story, but after a few weeks of nothing happening, I decided to say fuck it and post it. So first, some context. I work as a ranger in the Barganzinski State Natural Reservoir near Lake Baikal. Over the past years, I've come to find out that Lake Baikal is a very fucked place. So here's a few of my experiences. I'll start off with a few oddities. Aside from the usual ice rings, Baikal Zen, vehicles, animals, and people stuck in ice. There are oddities like unknown ships appearing on foggy days. I remember spotting a few unidentified ships in my time, and I've heard stories of really old looking ships appearing in the fog. Another creepy thing that happens is dead animals washing up. Now that's nothing out of the ordinary, but some of the animals wash up completely hollow. Anything from fish to birds to even seals. Speaking of washed up animals, sometimes people stumble across the corpse of a Golomayanka. Pick is what the fish looks like, so you can't blame people for being scared shitless when they see one. So onto the interesting green text worthy stuff. Be me. Be around 9 or 10. Me and friends go hang out. It's the winter. During the winter, Lake Baikal freezes up completely. So me and my friends are walking on the ice. We're hanging out and one of my friends calls us to him. He's crouched and is staring at the ice. He points and tells us to look. Two prints are pushing against the ice. They look like suckers, but with fingers. They start moving, so we follow. We keep following until we hear a crack. Mostly, Baikal is safe to walk on, but it's better to be safe than sorry, so we stop. The prints keep going. Then, the ice cracks open. Two massive limbs come out of the ice. They suck onto the ice, and then a creature rises up from the water. 
This thing looked like a cross between a lobster and a mosquito. Thing only walked on two legs. It was like three or four fucking meters tall. As soon as we see it, we run like hell. Slip on ice like a retard. Friends abandon me. Thanks. Think I'm dead. Thing just walks by and keeps going. I come back home, bawling my eyes out. Try to explain, but can't. Parents slap me and tell me not to go on a frozen lake without supervision. People commonly report seeing something similar in the north of Baikal. Dark color, two legs, straw mouth, crustacean. I think I've gotten around seven similar reports. On watch duty, I might have seen it on a few occasions, but it was always too far to really make out. First creepy thing that happened on the job. Boat goes missing. It shows up like a week later. We go investigate. The boat is completely empty, so we dock it while the search party looks for survivors. So I'm hanging out. Guy watching over the boat calls through the radio. Uh, there is an intruder on the boat. We go check on it. There's a dude with a hat just hanging out on the boat. Guy is really weird though, like he isn't even fully solid. Coworker tries to get near the guy. The dude fucking splits apart into a few pieces and they all jump into the water. Big what the fuck moment. In the past 20 years, there have been these two strange cases. In 2001 and 2013, bodies were found washed up with very strange markings. Their blood vessels very dark, their eyes were grayed out, and their muscles were all very tensed up. In the first case, forensics came back telling us it was just drowning and exposure. The second time, we struggled to even contact them. Eventually they came back with the same result, drowning and exposure. Thing is though, these people were incredibly experienced in their field. Another thing was that the second guy was reported missing two weeks before we found him, yet his body was in prime condition. So about two months ago, we get a report of a washed up body. We came to check up on him. It was an old person who hit his head somehow and drowned. His skin was pale and his vessel stood out. I could tell he didn't die like the other two, but the look reminded me of them. Just a preface, he did not die the same way as those two. Clear differences were signs of decomposition, his body being relaxed and his eyes having color. I brought up the similarity to my coworker. He didn't know about it, so I promised to tell him later. We met up at a local cafe afterwards. We were talking about the cases. Then we got interrupted by this old dude. We call him Starek. For the longest time, I just assumed he was some schizo. Dude is very dirty, mutters to himself, has no friends or family. Spends most of his times on the shore taking notes. He's not violent, but most people consider him a nuisance. So he intervenes and instantly asks if their eyes were gray. I tell him, yes. Starik jumps in excitement. This gets awkward, so we get ready to leave. Starik chases after us and asks us if they are decomposing. Now I'm intrigued, so I give him the benefit of the doubt and tell him to go off. Starik then starts laid out. I'll relay his words in bullet points. The thing that is responsible for those two deaths is called a crawling jellyfish. It can filter oxygen, both from air and water. Its cynicals produce an adhesive which lets it crawl on land. It also produces an insanely strong poison. It works by completely destroying blood cells and the slightest concentration of it can have disastrous effects on the body. The poison this jelly uses is 84% pure. The effect of the poison darkens the blood and destroys the pigmentation of the eyes. It also works as an amazing antibiotic which can preserve the body for more than a month. The chemical reaction between the poison and water tenses up the muscles, and they are exclusive to Lake Baikal. They used to be a huge problem during the first half of the 20th century. Post World War II, the government decided to use cyanide to kill off their populations. This poisoned the water supply, but it was covered up. He predicts their current population to be at the double digits. After this, I'm a bit taken aback. While Stardick was going off, some guy tells him to shut up and fuck off. Stardick leaves, but I'm really interested if he's got more to share. After a week, I kind of forgot about the whole ordeal. Then I spotted Starik taking notes while on my patrol. I approach him and ask, what's up? Dude almost jumped out of his skin when I did so. I ask, is everything okay? He tells me, yeah, with a shaky voice. Then I asked him about the dude that kicked him out the other day. He tells me it's nothing. So I ask if he could tell me more about that jellyfish. He apologizes and tells he has to leave. I think to myself, how can a fucking hobo be busy? I start following him around and try to get him to talk. Starek just gives me the silent treatment. Keep following him for 30 minutes. Have to stop, cause job. After work, decide to go ask around about Starek. Nobody really knows much about him. 
he's always just been a part of life. No one really knows when, where, or how he got here. He's just always been here. Decide to ask the dude from the cafe about Staric. You shouldn't hang around with that guy, Anon. He's probably unhinged. Ask why he kicked him out. The guy smells like shit, Anon. True. So, in my travels, I found out only one thing. The guy fucking loves chess. Damn good, too. Sometimes he challenges the other old folks. Next day, buy a chessboard and wait in the park after the hours. Bait worked perfectly. Starek comes out of the bushes, beer can in hand, and asks for a game. Try to get him to chat. Fucker is really focused on the game, though. I'm shit, and get beat in, like, three moves. He comes back for a rematch a few days later. Came up with the idea to give him something stronger. Russian standard. Works like a charm. He talks about how bad the pollution in Baikal is, and so on. Ask him how does he know so much. Oh, I was a biologist. Elaborate. Did research on the lake for almost 30 years. What happened then? Quit. Why? Didn't have a choice. How come? He looks at me. Hey, Anon, you want to see something cool? Uh... Come on, I'll show you something that'll blow you away. Agree. Don't want to get raped in some crack den, so get knife just in case. You know, Anon, you're a good kid. I'm in my 30s. Who cares? You're still young. That's why you have to see what I have. Okay. He gets to his makeshift home. Inside is a fucking VCR and two tapes. They're labeled, Baikal Mission, 1988, 1 and 2. What is this? Cool, eh? You kids probably never seen it before. Ask him if he's got a TV from the period. No. For fuck's sake, I have to get an adapter. No local stores have one, so I have to ship it. Fucker cost a leg and an arm. After four days, it's finally here. When I get a Starix Jack, he's not happy. Tells me that I used him. We get into a heated argument. Eventually, he breaks. For God's sake. Fine, if you want to watch them so bad, then let's go already. Told him that he's not going to get near my apartment without a shower. Eventually, he convinced me to let him use mine. After him, the shower... No joke, became a fucking gas chamber. So, we finally hook up the VCR. It's insane how much care you put into maintaining it. We boot up the first tape. It's two hours long. Around a third of it is just the inside of a sub with nothing happening. While this is happening, I ask Starek to explain how and why he has these. Here's what he told me. Turns out, Starek was an important researcher during the Soviet era. The reason for this mission happening is because while making topographical scans, the Soviet Union discovered that the lake is actually deeper than previously thought. The scans showed that past a 1,600 meter bottom, the lake continues. This is because stronger sonar can penetrate the false bottom. What is the false bottom? He explained it as a layer of dense, viscous underwater brine. Past this false bottom, the lake continues for another 1,200 meters. It is located at the center of the lake. The problem is that the Lake Baikal is a freshwater lake, and such a thing should be impossible. So the mission was supposed to retrieve samples, geological data, and maybe explain the oddity. The actual video finally begins, and three men enter the sub, one of which is our man, Starik. They descend, and the tape shows the usual shit you'd find in the lake. Fish, seals, etc. The weird shit starts towards the end of the first tape. Passing 900 meters, our first oddity pops up. Every creature shown in the tape was given an in-depth explanation by Starek. First thing the camera catches is a huge fucking jellyfish, and I mean massive. This fucking thing's body was about as big as a bus. The tentacles were definitely longer than a blue whale. Pick is the closest to it by looks. Starek walks up to the TV and points at its body. Its body is actually a separate ecosystem in itself. While feeding, the jellyfish filters water so well that it actually creates a separate environment inside the creature. The concentration of water in the jellyfish differs from the outside by about 6-7%. to This is enough of a difference to create a completely alien environment. Its size provides a safe home for many smaller creatures. The ecosystem is so advanced that there is a food chain inside. There is a plankton that can produce energy with a very limited amount of light, which is provided by luminescence of its host. They get eaten by a shrimp-like creature, which gets eaten by an apex predator. Then the predator's waste is used to feed the plankton, and so the cycle goes on. 
These creatures are not only exclusive to Baikal, but the jellyfish too. The men in the submarine don't seem all that surprised about it, so I ask Starik how long they've known about it. Ever since the 50s, they started washing up en masse after the extermination of the crawler jellyfish. As they go deeper, the lake bed is covered by whale bones. The thing is, Baikal isn't home to any known whale species. One of the whale skeletons begins to move. Holy shit, it's the fucking ghost fish. I remember a few reports of a massive see-through fish swimming near the ice. Here's how Starik explains it. It turns out that the bones are reanimated by a single-celled organism. This organism begins to build a colony by mooching off the minerals inside the whale bones. Eventually, they construct a membrane around the skeleton which vaguely resembles a whale. The inside of this colony is filled with an acidic sugary solution which keeps the entire organism buoyant. It then travels in the lake, its new source of food being microorganisms that it digests using the solution. Though, after a long time, the solution will damage the whale bones to the point where they can no longer support the construct. The organism most likely dies here because at this stage it can't filter water without moving. As they descend deeper, weird things keep happening. Crabs with legs the length of cars, a giant centipede-like creature, huge eels, tentacle creatures that connected in rings, what I think might have been trilobites, and more that I couldn't make out. Once they go down past the 1,600 meters, life becomes more scarce. Eventually, they reach the false bottom. It is a massive brine pool. There is zero life around it. One or two dead fish surface from the brine periodically. Starik said that they took samples of the water above the brine, said that the only life there were a few species of extremophile bacteria, but even they were struggling to survive. Okay, this is the part I was debating to post. Looking at what happens next fucked with my mind so hard I had to move away. So here's a content warning. I don't know if there really needs to be one, but here it is. Read at your own risk. They penetrate into the brine layer. At this point, Starik stops the tape and tells me to stop watching. I ask him why, but he ignores me and takes the tape away. I try to stop him, but he takes the tape and only that tape and runs off. For a week, I ask him to let me finish it. He constantly shoots me down. My curiosity got the better of me. I knew that Starik wasn't a vigilant guy, so when he went for one of his regular walks on the shore, I went to his shack and took the tape. So last warning, proceed at your own risk. They descend 300 meters below the brine. Their sonar picks up something massive. They approximated it to be almost 2 kilometers in length. Then it comes on screen. This fucking serpent. Serpent isn't even a good way to describe its shape. It just being in there fucked with the sonar, the cameras, and the crew. The entire crew spent like 10 minutes just screaming and raving. Its eyes stared straight into the camera, and no matter where I was, its eyes followed me. While watching, I felt this weird sensation. It's like I knew whatever I was looking at was fucking evil. Everything about it was wrong. In time, one of the crew managed to get a grip and sent the submarine upwards. After the tape ended, I could hear it. It was this feeling in the back of my head. It was beckoning towards the lake. Toward it. Fucker didn't even speak a word and I knew what it wanted. I couldn't take it and I wanted to talk to Starek. As soon as he saw me, he punched me in the jaw. It called a fucking retard. He takes the tape from me and snaps over his knee. This is why I didn't want you to watch these tapes. I begged him to tell me what's going on. After he calmed down, he sat down and asked me a question. Here's what he told me. Back in the Cold War, the Soviets were planning to use Lake Baikal for propaganda purposes. But their scientists could never figure out why exactly this kind of diversity was exclusive to the lake. And it's not like the Americans had something to hide. If they couldn't hide the nuke, then everything was on the table. They cross-referenced every sea, ocean, lake, river, and puddle and found that over 60% of Lake Baikal's life was not found anywhere else. Why is that? Starik believes that it's that thing that lures life to it. For whatever reason, it attracts life to itself. Though the better question is, why is that thing there in the first place? He says because it's supposed to be a prison. Think about it. Why has the Baikal not changed in over 25 million years? Why is there a kilometer deep layer of brine in a freshwater lake? Whether it's aliens, gods, or some natural phenomena, that brine is keeping it in and everything else out. After the mission went bust, 
Starik decided to quit and stole the only existing footage of that mission. He tried to get a job, but since then, he was blacklisted from getting one, so he remained here. I don't know why he chose to keep that tape, but at least it's destroyed now. Eventually, I couldn't take it. That thing fucked with my vision, senses, and even speech. So, I was forced to move in with my sister in Chelyabinsk. It seems like proximity to the lake is what affects me. I still get nightmares and shit from time to time, but I don't know if it's some psychological thing, or that thing. Under dark waters, dwell things even darker. That lake is a bulwark and on, pray it never fails. Interesting, and on. Did the snake slash serpent look like a larger version of a sea snake with scales, etc? Or is it merely just a large serpent-like being? Did you see the end of it, or did its body just keep going out of sight? It went out of sight, and no, it wasn't just a sea serpent. I'm gonna try to describe the creature the best I can. First, it's a face. The best way I could describe it is like a cross between a human, a shark, and a lizard. Its skin is definitely smooth. Its mouth was lined with sharp teeth and the shape of a smile. It had green eyes. I don't know if they were glowing or if that's how the light reflected off of them, and it also made this gross, deep chuckling sound. Its body also moved in a very strange way. Each visible segment seemed to move independently from one another. That's about all I can tell you. Hmm. Interesting. By chance, did the face resemble this pic? Holy shit, that is uncannily similar. Though the face should be longer, the mouth bigger, and there shouldn't be a nose. If you did this, combined it with the other pic, and got rid of all the fins and made its body smooth, you would get almost a perfect recreation. Yo, this part of your story reminded me of another Russian dude story from the last thread. Literally the exact same creature in everything. You even see hollowed out fish too. Crazy. I want to tell a few stories from the fishermen of Yakutia. Now, there are four islands on which these legends happen. First is the Strider. The Strider is a creature with two legs, completely white, and it strides on ice. Go figure. Many fishermen have seen it from a distance, but that's about it. One guy though, Peter, let's call him. He claims to have seen the Strider up close and personal. So be him in 2001. He's fishing off the coast of the Katolni Island. The boat he's on has some sort of malfunction, so they let it drift while they fix it. They drift near the ice, and because it's Siberia, they anchor down and decide to walk on it. So Peter's just walking around, and from the slight crack in the ice, two sharp appendages come out. They hook onto the ice, and the rest of the body rises up from the water. From up close, he described the strider to be crustacean-like. He estimated it being 3 meters high. It, of course, had two huge legs, and also had these weird lobster fins behind them. And it had a long proboscis. It walked right past them, then it used its proboscis to catch a bird right out of the air. It keeps walking until it's out of sight. I ask, why doesn't it just catch fish? Another fisherman tells me, it's afraid of the orcas. Tells me he's seen orca play with something really similar to the strider's legs. When the striders come out, it goes onto the ice to avoid them. Also tells how the proboscis thing explains many fishermen finding hollowed out seals, fish, and birds. I grew up in a small mountain town, literally surrounded by woods and swampy areas and a bunch of lakes, so you could say it was the perfect place for creepy shit to be happening all the time. I'm going to share one, well, maybe more than one story from that town. Be me, like seven or eight, live in an apartment building near cemetery and hospital. Yeah, the cemetery was literally two minutes away from the hospital. Both were in the woods. Go to sleep one evening after parents. Fuck yes, I'm a grown-up, Dodgif. Put on pajamas and make bed. Bedroom window faces woods. Dark as fuck, but somewhat calm. Keep looking at the forest before hitting the sack. Look at time. 11.45 AM-ish. I don't really remember. Not really sleepy, but know that parents will be angry if they found me up so late. Decided to finally lay in bed. One last glance at the woods. What the fuck? See three figures in the woods, clearly not lights. More what the fuck. Stare in their direction until figuring out what it is. My face when, people, but really pale, almost transparent. It's a fucking .webm. 
It's silent around, so I can hear them moan and kind of hum, I guess. Not sure what the sound was. Fucking weird nude people on drugs, I assume. Go to sleep. Wake up next morning. Nothing weird anywhere. Go to school. Tell classmates. Anon, you crazy. Never speak of that again until ten years later. Be ten years later, chilling with homies when one says, Let's tell scary stories. Homie numero dos goes, I know one that's real and happened in town. Go ahead, homie dos. He then proceeds to tell a story that back then got me fucked up. So, the hospital in town has two underground floors and you can reach them with one of the elevators. Basically, floor one is morgue and floor two is the vivisection floor. What the fuck is a vivisection? Homie number one. It's when they operate on living, conscious people, experimenting on them and shit. Lol, homie, you silly. Keep listening. So the story goes that back in the day, like 15 to 20 years ago, people in town went missing. No one knew why and no one spoke of it. Then, after some kids found a weird tunnel coming out of the hospital into the middle of the woods, people went to see and it was all abandoned hospital equipment and empty hospital beds. Later, they realized it was the vivisection room. Homie 2 proceeds to describe the room. Nothing intriguing, so I'll get to the point. They were performing experiments on people. They had taken their eyes out, cut their ears off, kept them in the dark for months, maybe years. Eventually, three of those people they were experimenting on escaped and were never found again. They are said to be really pale, almost transparent. People have seen them in the woods around town, and they say that they only scream, moan, and hum. They don't speak. Fuck you, homie too, that's not true. Whatever man, it's what many people are saying around town since forever. I say nothing more. Creeped the fuck out because I never told anyone about the white men group, and yet homie too knew all about it. Fucking shit can't be true. Wait, you literally told everyone in your class. Fast forward one weekish. Go to hospital with homie. Homie needs to take the elevator. Remember that one elevator takes you to secret floor goodness. Get into all elevators. Like four in total, I guess. One has two unmarked buttons underneath the basement button. Here we go, dot AVI. Push buttons. Nothing. Wait a bit, then push buttons again. Nothing. See homie's doctor and ask him about morgue. This hospital doesn't have a morgue. Okay. Go to elevator one last time. Push button. Surprise, surprise. Nothing. Fucking hell. Homie too was lying. Later at grandma's house. Ask grandma about white people. That was phrased terribly. Fucking hell, she tells me never to speak about that. Says it was probably someone just having fun, not being harmful. They were fucking naked. I face one. Grandma is a shill. Leave grandma's place. Spend the next two years looking for whites around woods. But nothing. Walk into abandoned military tunnels around woods. Still nothing. Leave it and just decide to be spooked forever about it. I have stories about abandoned military tunnels, weird figures and lights in the woods, a mass animal grave, and a story of the buttload of dog bones. We'll share more if anyone is interested. Some backstory before I start with the spooks. The building I lived in was literally across the street from the woods. It was my house, and then a street, and then the woods. At night, it was pretty creepy. But my best friend had it worse cause he lived down the same street but on the other side of it. So pretty much his building was in the woods. So he and I both experienced some spooks together. Mass animal grave. Here we go. Be me and best mate. Both be 15 to 16. Walk around woods at 7.30 PM. We spent a big portion of childhood in our teen years lurking these woods, looking for shit and just generally walking around. 
walked near a big water pipe that was going through the forest. We usually go there to hang out, smoke, and drink there. Be about 100 to 130 meters away from the pipe. Smell hits my nose with the force of Old Spice Double Sun. Fucking what the fuck is that? Mate. Dead animal or some shit. Me. Walk about 70 more meters and holy shit dot jpeg. A mass grave of dead animals in the middle of woods. Like 30 to 40 dead animals in there. Go back to get some sort of face masks. Pussies dot jpeg. Go back with cheap ass face masks. No help with smell. Whatever. Fuck it dot jeff. Mate goes into pit with animals to poke them with sticks. Fucking idiot pokes them with sticks for 15 minutes. Gets bored and gets out. Head back to town and call up our mates. Tell them what happened. No one believes us, so we get flashlights. It's dark at this point, and we want to go there as soon as possible. We head to the woods, and the smell is even stronger at this point. Get to pit and felt like even more animals were there than before. Not possible because it's late and we never saw anyone go there. Look around and tell mates to go because whoever did that is all sorts of crazy. Go back to town. Everyone fucked up. Tell even more people about it the next day. Fast forward like 17 hours. Go to woods with more people. Go to grave location. What? MP4. No smell. No animals. Hole is there, but empty and no blood. Everyone is laughing at this point. No one believes us. No grave there ever since. We still speak about that sometimes. Some mates say it happened. Some of the mates who were there say that they're not sure if it was really there or not. And this one guy says that there was nothing there. Well, I know what we saw and it was weird as fuck. Sorry for taking so long to post. I right now don't have them pre-written. Also, I'm at work. Let's do abandoned military tunnels. Around my town live many gypsies who make a living from stealing metals and other things that can be sold. TVs, car radios, fridges, literally anything. Near my building in my hometown, there's three entrances to military tunnels that were used like bomb shelters and defense against enemy forces, I guess. We started exploring them as kids, and then it gets interesting. Be me and my mates. 13 years young. Hey, let's go to the tunnels. Be in front of tunnels. Flashlights in hand. Walk in. Cell phones lose coverage because tunnels are literally going through a large hill. Walk in. Fucking cold, dark, and humid. Walls are covered in weird writing. Names of people. Numbers. All done with spray paint so we think nothing of it. We barely notice it. Walk further in. No outside light at this point. Ground is soft for some reason. Shine flashlight on ground. It's covered in black. What is black? Ask mate if he knows what the black shit is. Probably some carpets. What? Keep walking. More soft ground. Shine light at ceiling. Walls are fucking tall as shit. Pipes going through ceiling. Someone asks, what's in the pipes? Pipes are for air coming from outside. They used pipes to distribute air through the whole thing. If you follow the pipes, they will lead you out through the secret exit where the air was coming from. Walk into a room. Room is wider than any other room in the whole fucking place. Ground covered in black, dirt, and what looked like human shit. Shine flashlight on walls. A lot of writing on the walls. Again, some names, some numbers. One wall says, Area 51.2, and has some weird symbols written on with coal. Why coal, though? Wall across from entrance of room has a huge altar like shit drawn on it. Many letters and numbers that don't make sense. Okay, that's enough. Before I can say anything, someone goes, Hey, Anons, let's get out. Okay, let's. On the way out, hear loud banging. Like, someone's banging on the walls in the other room. What the fuck? No one else here with us. In there or out. No one knows we're there. Shine light back where we came from. Nothing. Keep walking forward. 
big hole in ground just before exit. Some sort of trap, I guess, because you can't really see it unless you've fallen in it before, or someone told you about it. Homie 1 jumps over hole. I'm next.mp3. Jump and hear a loud scream coming from inside tunnels. Homie 2 is last to jump. Jumps, and we boot it. Run outside of tunnels and head to town through the woods. Calls another mate to meet us with some sort of weapon. Gay friend is waiting with a stick. I repeat, a fucking stick. Like he can fight humid room McShitterson with a fucking stick. Nothing was chasing us. Mate didn't believe us. Rewinding a few years earlier, middle of winter. Be me, 10 to 11 years. Walk around woods with mates midday. Fucking tunnels, dark and spoopy as all hell. Probably because all dark in the otherwise snowy woods. A dog dying in front of tunnel, not even inside. Dog all bloody and howling at nothing. As we pass, dog dies. Many spooky shit has happened in those tunnels, and still some people use them to fuck in there. These stories don't end with us being chased by shadow people or demons or anyone being possessed. It's just spooky and weird shit that's happened to me and my mates. Not RP, so nothing movie-like will happen. Should I go on? If yes, next story is Grave in Middle of Woods, plus Tombstone Shifting. Be me and mates, 16 to 17 ish. We were all pretty much the same age, and we were doing the whole forest explore phase around this time. Walk uphill a bit, not using the stairs that lead to the top, but going through the thickest part. Walk midway uphill and notice something stone like. Go to check it out. First mate says it's a tombstone. Yeah, right. Me and other mate go closer. Shit, it is a tombstone. One mate who is not from town says that's normal because graveyard is in same forest. Yeah, like five kilometers away from here. No one would drag a tombstone to this place because the graveyard is near. Plus, you'd have to go through the whole forest to drag that here. Tombstone is old-timey. Writing on it is old-timey. Reads something like, Here lies forever the body of, insert female name and last name here. Don't remember her name. That face one, no middle name. What? What, is not having a middle name not common? What the fuck? Tombstone kind of stuck in the ground. We can't move it. Decide to mark it with sticks and ropes so we can come back. Mark the whole scene, like fucking CSI Miami. Go on exploring more of that part of the woods. Weird creepy ass field of flowers in the middle of area, full of huge trees. Everything else is lit but the field flower area. Scenery looks creepy cause flowers growing in shadows. Decide to call up more people. Tell them about the shit we found. The tombstone, not flowers. We used to call each other whenever we found creepy shit in or around town so that we could check it out. Many a time, the creepy shit had disappeared before we could get to it. Tell mates where to meet us. They show up to the lowest point of the woods and we take them up to the tombstone spot. Get there and tombstone has shifted about 3-4 to four meters from where it was. Now, remember how it was halfway stuck in the ground and three of us couldn't move it? Yeah, it shifted on its own. Start digging around, looking for a grave. Remember that shit is old timey and the grave could be long gone. Go back to town. Mate's house. Mate's grandma is there. She's lived there pretty much all her life. Straight up ask her about graves in the woods behind their building. Says she's heard stories of people getting buried there for a long time ago because they didn't deserve to be put in a regular graveyard. Didn't deserve? Says she can't explain it better than that. She doesn't know how. We tell her about the tombstone and how it shifted. Says that all tombstones have been moved from there so kids don't get spooked. Yeah, no, it was there twice. Says it's probably a tombstone that was covered in dirt and they didn't move it when they were moving all the other ones. Fuck that shit. We went back there some time later and there was nothing there. They could have moved it or something, but nothing. Not even plants were there. Or maybe we had the wrong location but I am pretty sure we knew exactly where to go and there was nothing there. Okay, so I'm gonna do Lake Death and then I'm gonna do Lights in the Woods. Lake Death stories are true around my town and all of them are tragic, obviously, but one of them is chilling. 
I don't know if it's a local urban legend or a true story, but I've heard it from two different people, exactly the same way. Anyway, here goes. There was a woman in town, a really sweet old woman from what I've heard. People loved her. She loved people, and her life was pretty much okay, like couldn't have kids for some reason. So, as I said, there are gypsies who live around my town, and this woman apparently went there to seek help. Now, no one knows what those gypsies did to her, or what they gave her, but she got pregnant within a month after going to them. Fast forward nine months or so. Baby is out, all good and alive and healthy. They release the woman a bunch of days after she has the baby, and being all happy, she takes the baby home. As night came, I guess she put the baby in the crib and went to sleep. But then in the middle of the night, she woke up to find the baby had been gone, and she had no idea where it was. Anyway, as time went by, baby wasn't found, and the woman decided to call it quits. There's this artificial lake thing, where they clean slash recycle water or some shit. I have no idea. It's really creepy there at night, and it's got those pump things on the bottom. Many people have went swimming in that lake. Many, I mean like three people, but that's not a lot for such a small town. And have died there, being sucked down by those pipes. So the woman decided that she has had enough misery in her life after her happiness had been taken away from her so soon. She went up to the lake, late at night when they turned the pumps on, and she jumped, got to the middle of the lake, and just waited there for the fucking pumps to turn on so that they could suck her down to the bottom. So far, the story is real. And then, the urban legend started. People started saying, you can still hear her at night scream for her child, and... She will come for your child if you leave it in the crib the first night after you come home from the hospital. That's bullshit, of course, but the story itself is creepy. The creepiest being, of course, that her child fucking disappeared in the middle of the night without a trace. Next story will be Lights and Woods. This one happened to my mates. I was abroad when the whole deal happened to them and couldn't be there for it. Be my friends in a hot summer night. Go out to the woods to make a bonfire and eat some grilled meat. They are in different woods. Not the ones with the tombstones, tunnels, graveyards, but all the way across town. The woods of Death Lake. Get there. Sun still up. Prepare everything. Gather wood. Start fire. All going well until they hear something fall in the area with trees. Fuck you. No. That JPEG. Best mate goes to check. A massive fucking branch fell off a tree for no apparent reason, just because. Branch wasn't dead or dry, so why did it fall? Friend thinks, who was phone? More like, why did it fall? Takes branch to fire, because free branch, yay! After they put branch on fire, they start noticing lights in the distance. They try to take pics of lights, only one or two good ones. They say they started hearing weird noises coming from sound direction. What? Not bothered by those apparently. Still ate meat and drank beers. I come back some months later. Tells me all about that. Holy fuck, that's creepy. But good thing there's pics for me to see. Fucking best shit that ever happened and I missed it. I'm gonna be sharing some pictures of the place they were at and some pictures of the lights. First pic is literally not even 100 meters from Death Lake. So, people in town like to grow their own vegetables and shit like that, and often they grow corn. And sometimes we steal corn from them and cook it on a bonfire. Anyway, here is a corn thief gone wrong. Be me, old enough to know better than to steal corn. Be out in the woods with mates. Start a fire. Oh shit, we want corn. No problem, me and three other mates go to get corn. Anon, don't you need money for corn? No, we are going to steal it from someone. Get to field all the way across town to steal corn. Flashlights in hand because it's almost midnight. Cars passing by so we lay low in grass and wait for cars to go away. Look around the field. No dogs, no people. Two friends keep watch. Me and a mate go in. 
Start stuffing our hoodie pockets with whole corns, cobs of corn. Stuffing like the end of the world is yesterday. I fucking look pregnant with corn babies at this point. Turn around to leave and see friends frozen in corn. Shut up, Anon. I shut up. Look around. See nothing. Hear a noise from inside of cornfield. Damn it, not a dog. Please, not a dog. Also, please, not a man with gun. Get low to look for paws slash feet. Nothing. Hear growling from behind me. Turn around quickly, but nothing there. Look at mate. Then, run with the force of a thousand suns out of there. Mates outside see us all scared and start laughing. We tell them what happened and that they should run. I throw away most corn because I am not a corn exporter. Thing didn't catch us, but mate and I both heard a growl and we never saw a dog. Still had enough corn for everyone at the end of it all. Stealing corn is bad, and you shouldn't do it. Moved to Kentucky for fire service. Buy 10 square miles of hilly forest with home at an auction. Old owner lived there his whole life. Died on the land. Family sold it to make a quick buck. Start planting more trees. Forest is dense, but could use more around the house. Put up trail cams because of homeless wanderers coming onto the property. Something is getting angry and ripping down trail cams from behind, including ones high up in trees. Find piles of them in tree hollows. Grab shotgun and camp supplies. Head out to find homeless man and persuade him to leave property. Can't find anyone. Only tiny four-toed prints in the mud by the streams. Think it's a raccoon, but spacing makes me think it was standing up. Make camp and hunker down. Cook up some tasty rabbit stew. Get into tent and go to sleep before cleaning pot because of how tired I am. Wake up around 3 in the morning. Moon shining through the trees. Hear weird grunting noises from outside of tent. Sounds small. Open up window flap. Stew pot is swinging, but I can't see anything near it except for a mossy rock about the size of a gallon jug that I didn't notice before. Think nothing of it. Go back to sleep. Wake up. Go over to Stew Pot to cook some breakfast. Stew Pot has been lit clean. Mossy Rock is gone. Think that raccoons must have cleaned it in the middle of the night, and the rock was the fat lump that did it. Pack up. Search some more. Can't find anyone, but swear the moss around me is alive. Notice the rocks seem to be moving whenever I look away from them. No sense of dread, just bewilderment. In the search somewhere, I've lost my knife that I've had for a while. It's cheap, but has a lot of sentimental value to me. Get home, tired and bummed out from not finding anyone and losing my knife. Go to sleep immediately. Wake up to light knocking at my door. Get up, kinda groggy, and open the door, eyeing where I keep my gun just in case. Peek through window. No one there. Grab shotgun. Open door and poke my head through, in case it was someone visiting their new neighbor. No one. Only forest noises and the occasional butterfly. Step through door and feel my foot kick something. Look down. My knife is laying there, on a small bed of flowers and grass. Look around. Really confused, but happy that someone found my knife, and then angry that someone was on my property and watching me. Shout out as loud as I can a quick thanks, and if they're out there, to come see me so I could talk to them. Notice about three rocks, all around the size and shape of a jug of milk, in a row just on the border of the forest. Pick up knife and walk back inside. Glance outside. Rocks are gone. Buy a border collie when I go into town that day. I have more stories about these things if anyone wants to hear about them. Okay, about a month later since finding my knife on my porch, planting more trees, working some land to make a small garden. Pupper, named Hugo, is walking around and sniffing things, doing puppy stuff. While tilling, I notice two rocks on the edge of the forest. Think nothing of it. They don't bother me, and I don't bother them. 
kind of getting used to it and expecting them by now to be honest. I don't feel afraid. Hugo doesn't seem to mind them. Start getting really into my garden, lose track of time, and look up to find Hugo to take him inside with me for a break. Hugo, gone. I'm freaking out because I love the little guy. Look around frantically and see him by the edge of the forest, sniffing one of the rocks. The rock he's sniffing shifts a little when his nose gets close to it. I get up to run over to Hugo to keep him from getting hurt or something in case a rock tips over on him. That's when I see the moss on the rock shift and sprout a tiny spindly little arm. I stop walking for a second and blink to make sure I'm not seeing something. It's hot and humid and I haven't been drinking as much water as I should. Arm continues to extend slowly and tentatively towards Hugo, recoiling a little whenever Hugo's nose touches it. I start back up, a little cautiously to not spook the rock thing. I'm getting near to Hugo, about 50 yards away, and see that it's petting Hugo's head. Hugo is wagging his tail and generally seems to be enjoying it. I get about 10 yards away when I step on a twig and make a loud noise. The creature's arm shoots back into its body and the rocks start tumbling frantically away. Hugo runs after them. I run after Hugo. I lose sight of Hugo and search for him until nightfall. I go back to my house to grab a flashlight and my camping gear to find my pupper. As I'm getting closer, I see a white and black lump on the porch. I start running towards my house, and as I get closer, I see that it's Hugo. He's laying on the porch, not moving. I'm getting more upset. As I get closer, I see red and pink around his head and neck. I start sprinting, thinking my dog is hurt or dead. I get 10 feet away, about to bound up onto the porch, when Hugo's head jerks up and looks at me. He stands up and comes to greet me with a slobbering mouth, clearly happy to see me. He has a little crown of red and pink flowers around his head and neck, and has a rope tied to his collar and my door. I hug him, tears kinda welling up because I've come to love this pupper so much. Stand up, shout a thank you to whoever brought him home, go in and go to sleep. I've been on this property now for about four years and have a lot more stories about them if people are still interested. I've gotten very close to them. I'm trying to build up my trust with the little things. About a year later, I keep seeing the rocks around my house and they are getting closer and closer. Notice one is living in my garden now, little different from the others. Greenish gray and very round almost spherical. Every now and then, I take a peek out the window and catch a glimpse of it moving around, very slow and methodical. Garden has never looked more beautiful since it moved in. I go out to my garden often and see it on the opposite side from me all the time. Decide one day to go up to it and try to show it I mean it no harm. I am unsuccessful at this. It just tucks its arms and legs in whenever it sees me. Looks like a chubby sloth carved out of stone, but no mouth or nose from what I could tell, just two beady little eyes. I decide to leave it alone. It seems to be helping me with the garden, and I appreciate that. Notice that sometimes, some of my veggies will be gone, or half eaten, and sitting by the stone. Let it have them. Leave some veggies near the edge of the forest. One day, notice that the stone is gone. Veggies are no longer being eaten. Garden is looking a little worse for wear. Stones are gone from the tree line. I am genuinely sad that they are gone. About two weeks later, go into forest looking for them. Come to the middle of my property where a massive tree has fallen. Was some kind of oak, possibly around 100 feet tall. When I get closer, I notice that there are dozens of the stones on it and around it all leaning on it like they're kissing it or resting their heads on it. I'm overwhelmed with a sudden sense of sadness, almost like a family member died. I walk over to the tree and place my hand on it, whisper some sweet nothings to the stones. 
I go back home after spending almost three hours at that tree, feeling bereft of an old friend for some reason. Remember, I have a white oak sapling in my yard outside my house. Dig it up and take it to the bigger oak in the forest the next day with Hugo. Plant it next to the fallen oak so that it will replace the giant hole the older one left. Hugo is walking around to the stones. Catch a glimpse of a few petting him. A few days later, Notice, the stones are back on the edge of the forest. Garden stone is back, and everything looks lush and vibrant again. I have one other notable story that was kind of scary that I'll type out. Well, I guess it's not really scary, but it does involve a crazy homeless guy. Go out into the forest one day with Hugo to look around for bums, say hi to some friends, and just to be outdoors. Notice more and more signs of a homeless person living here. Trash everywhere, broken branches and plants, etc. Finally, make it to where I think the guy is camping. Find a shelter and take it down, but neatly fold it for him so he can get off my property quickly. Starting to get dark. I'm getting a little worried that I missed him, or he is dead somewhere on my property. See someone moving deeper in the forest. Shout out to him to stop and talk to me. The guy has a pickaxe, so I keep my shotgun ready in case he gets violent. I see he's smashing something with it. Freaking out, thinking I just stumbled onto a killing. That's when I hear the unmistakable sound of rocks being smashed. I fire into the air and get his attention damn quick. He drops his pickaxe and puts his hand up, mumbling something unintelligible. My adrenaline is pumping. I'm shaking and Hugo is going mad on his leash. I scream at him about smashing the rocks. He starts saying how they were following him and throwing stuff at him. I almost shot him then and there, but instead I leave him at gunpoint to the edge of my property and told him to get out and never come back. A few days later, I get a call from the sheriff's office about a body they found near my property. Homeless guy, beaten to death and stuffed into a tree tells me there will be a deputy coming to talk to me. Deputy shows up about an hour later, questions me about if I had any interactions with a homeless guy. Tell him no. He starts to leave. Turn around on my porch. Mentions my stone fence is a little low, but looks good. Look around. See the entire edge of the forest around my house is surrounded by stones. Tell him thanks and see him to his cruiser. He leaves. I look back at my house. All the stones are gone, except for two. I've got a lot of small ones, like gifts and whatnot. They leave me flowers, sometimes moral mushrooms, things I've lost, etc. I've been giving them about a third of my veggies, and they seem to like that. More and more show up in my yard rather than my tree line and only seem to move when they don't notice me there. They're very slow moving, and the only time I've ever seen them move quickly is when they roll. I have a lot more animals in my area now, and the forest and yard slash garden are much more lush and green when they are around. They seem to disappear during storms. I think they either go into tree hollows or patiently wait it out under other kinds of cover. The garden rock likes to go into a small covered trellis I built it for when the rain comes. Never heard them speak, and have only seen their faces a few times. It's just an oblong rock with beady black eyes that look like polished black glass. Very spindly arms and legs. Not bony looking, but more vine-like. They tuck back onto the body and aren't noticeable. Four toes and three fingers and a thumb. Bodies are shaped like a bullet, and they are about the size of a gallon jug. The garden rock is more round though. Their head sits on the front of the body, rather than on top, and kind of blends into it. The eyes are wide-spaced, almost parallel to each other, and about the size of a small marble. They are covered in moss, and can range from green to a burgundy. I think that might indicate age, but I don't know. When they stand up and walk, they look hunched over, and they tend to waddle more than just walk with arms out, like they're carrying something under them. There were a couple of things left in the house, like some personal documents, 
mostly health records. Other than that, I know the guy came from Holland, and that he built a house when he came over in the 50s. None of his family wanted the land. They just seemed to want to make some quick cash. I did let them spread his ashes in the forest though, because that's where he spent most of his time, with his wife. Her ashes were also spread out here. According to their daughter, seemed like a sweet old man. He liked woodcrafting, and I find some of his stuff here and there in the basement and the shop. I left to figure out that he made on the porch, and the next day, it was gone. Not sure if they took it, or if it was some other animal slash vagrant passing through. I've got something fresh. You guys should appreciate this. Years ago, when I was 16 in high school, live in not quite a city, more like an old town that expanded more than it could really support. Decent amount of rundown and abandoned buildings. Get into a kind of urban exploration kick, sneaking into places and checking them out. Occasionally, engage in minor looting. Sometimes you find neat stuff. Manage to talk to a few friends into coming with me sometimes. But only three are relevant for the story. One was an old buddy of mine, who I'll be calling Bill, and another was a girl I had a minor crush on who I'll call Susan. The last one is the most important. He told us his name was Eli, and there's probably not much point in censoring anything for him. Bill, Susan, and I all went to the same school, but I met Eli while I was checking out some old restaurant. Spooked the hell out of me because I had just snuck in through a window, and he speaks it from right fucking behind me. He thought it was funny as hell. We get to talking. I tell him about my hobby and ask if he's doing something similar. Yeah, more or less. I like to keep an eye out for unusual things, or things that don't belong. Okay. Seems kind of weird, but he's friendly, and I'm running around, scavenging junk in a half-wrecked diner or whatever, so I can't really talk. We chat for a bit. Turns out, Eli doesn't go to my school, which explains why I've never seen him around before. He listens more than he talks, and doesn't volunteer much info about himself. But I don't want to pry too much, and he seems alright. We clamber back out. I startle a cat that was sitting by the window. Eli pets it before it runs off, part on good terms. A week or so later, I'm hanging out with Bill, showing him this old three-story apartment building, or motel, or something. Planning the expedition like we're getting away with the heist of the century. Suddenly, still exploring? Jesus, fuck! Eli from behind me again. Bill actually jumps, and I laugh at him like I hadn't nearly soiled myself. I introduce the two, and they seem to hit it off well enough. Ask Eli if he wants to come with us to explore the place Friday night. He just kinda looks at me for a second. Then, tilts his head and stares at the building. Good 10 seconds of silence. Yeah, might be a good idea. Neat. Friday night rolls around. I manage to talk Susan into coming with us. So it's me, Bill, and her. And Eli when he finally shows up. I'm watching this time, you bastard. Not again. He casually strolls down the street in plain view with his hands in his pockets. He's grinning at me. He knows I was expecting another jump scare. Whatever. I introduce him to Susan. We're all friends now. Let's rock. So it's about 7 p.m. Still got some light out. We're sitting outside the place. Building is kind of dilapidated and boarded up, but shouldn't be too dangerous to wander around in, and we've all got flashlights. Also, apparently, a nesting ground for stray cats because I can see three of them sitting in what was probably an old flower bed or something, and another just started under the front steps. The front is still locked up, but there's a side door that doesn't close properly anymore. It looks like it used to be boarded up, but that had rotted off. I may have helped it along. So we entered the building. This was a bad idea. The place is mostly normal. Old, dirty, has that slight moldy, decrepit wreck smell all abandoned places tend to have. We wander around the ground floor a bit. Nothing really interesting. It's mostly just a lobby. 
figure we might find something more interesting on the second or third floors. That's where the rooms are. The three of us are joking around, but Eli is pretty quiet. Whenever we go into a room, he'd just kind of stare into it from the doorway, then pace around the walls. Whatever works for him, I guess. The rooms are all empty though. Guess they cleared the place out pretty good when they left it. Only thing we saw was a few more cats starting down the halls. We look around for maybe 30 minutes before deciding to call it quits. Not a bad time, but I'm a little disappointed we didn't find someone's old luggage full of plus-sized ballerina outfits or something. So we head down the stairs, and keep going down the stairs. Conversation peters off. Why are there so many steps here? Did we get turned around and go down the wrong stairwell somehow? Maybe we're coming out at the basement, starting to smell kind of funky. Probably some nasty mold down there. But there's the door, so let's see where it goes. Eli hasn't said anything for the last 10 minutes. Turns out to be another hallway of rooms. The four of us are standing by the stairwell, looking down the hall, kind of confused. Subterranean apartments are kind of an odd choice. We decide to go back up and find the right stairs again. Eli is at the base of the stairs, looking up. I ask him what's up and look where he's looking. Something is standing at the top of the alcove. My first reaction is that we're about to get shanked by a drunken homeless man. Then things start registering. It's big but kind of squashed and wide, like if a person was stretched out from the sides, and its legs are even more disproportionately short and stumpy. What I thought was a really grimy coat is actually long, tangled, really ratty looking hair or fur covering its body. Can't even see any eyes, just hair. There's mouth though. I can tell because it starts screaming at us. The mouth is too wide. It looks like it starts on the side of its head, and there aren't any teeth, just thick lips and spittle. I almost would have preferred shark teeth or something. There was just something really revolting about the gaping empty mouth. The noise itself was just fucking terrifying. I can't even describe it other than to say it's not a sound that a person could make. Like, it went into my ear and started throttling the caveman part of your brain that identifies threats. It started to stagger down towards us, still screaming. We were all screaming. Except Eli, who was shoving me back into the hallway and manhandling the others into running. We didn't need much encouragement. We're sprinting as fast as we fucking can down a dark corridor with god knows what screeching behind us. It's not very fast but we can hear it chasing us with uneven stomps. The flashlights help, but we're moving so spastically, it's throwing crazy shadows all over the place, which does not help our state of mind. There's another stairwell on the other side of the hall. If we can go back up, we can find the way out. Except it only goes down. There's no fucking up staircase, just a wall. Susan's sobbing by now. I'm not far off myself. Eli shoves us forward again so we don't stop moving, and we go down. The hallway down here goes forward a lot farther than the other floors. The ceiling is a lot higher than it seems it should be for how far down we went. That rancid smell from earlier is a lot worse. And we can hear the thing, half tumbling down the stairs after us. I'm about to start running again when Eli sprints past us towards one of the doors and wrenches it open. In. It's safer. I guess we're hiding. No one argues, probably because we're all still so freaked out, we'll take even slightly helpful direction at this point. We run into the room. I almost freeze up because there's something in there with us. It's another cat. Eli's standing in front of the door, holding it closed. No one moves. No one even breathes. We hear the thing gurgle and scream then gallop towards our room. Then, from farther away, a loud feline yowl, then several more. 
The thing roars again, and we hear it go past us. I am looking at the cat, sitting in the middle of the floor. It's staring at Eli. A few seconds go by, and he quietly opens the door again. The stairs are just fucking gone. It's hallway in both directions. One of us is making a high-pitched whimpering noise. I'm not sure who, but I wouldn't rule out any of us right now. Stressful doesn't quite cover it. The screaming's coming back. I think to go back into the room again, but Eli's already moving down the hall. The cat's following him. Susan goes after him. So does Bill. I hesitate by the first room for a second, torn between hiding in there again and making another run for it in the open. Decide, I don't want to be more alone than I want to be in that room, and I run after them. I nearly freak the fuck out when something brushes my leg. It's another cat, running beside me, not hurting me, just ignore it. Eli's ushering Susan and Bill into another room ahead of me. I see them hesitate for a second before entering. Eli's staring at me now, holding the door open. I hear the scream again. I run through the doorway and stumble to a stop as Eli closes up behind me. Bill and Susan are there. And so are the cats. Like, dozens of them. The room's full of them. Bill's just standing there, twitching. And I can hear him repeating, Fuck, 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 fuck. Very quietly. Susan's sitting on the floor, half curled into a ball. There's a circle of cats standing around them. Some of them are watching them, but the others are staring out into the room. All the other cats are either stalking around or sitting and staring into space, getting freaked out again. This is not normal behavior. Hey. And then there's Eli, who is much too calm for the situation, and has somehow acquired a platoon of disturbingly focused alley cats. Seriously, there is maybe six of them at his sides and his back, following his steps. Stay here. You'll be okay. I'll make it stop. Too fucking panic to question him. Also, don't really know what the hell he's pulling with the cats, and suddenly don't want him focusing on me. Susan proves she has bigger balls than me, and manages to ask him what's happening. When he looks at her, so do all the cats following him, at the same time. What the fuck, Eli? Stay. You're safe with us. I'll come back. And then he walks out with his cat followers and closes the door behind him. The cats apparently left to guard us deliberately open a path for me to stand next to Bill and Susan. So I stand with them. They circle us again. Not sure how long we sat there. My sense of time was pretty screwed by then. Then I finally heard a new sound. Except, I didn't really hear it. It was more like I could feel the vibration. Like it was a very, very loud but too low a pitch for me to hear. It made my hair stand up on end and my whole body just locked up. Every damn cat is standing up and staring in the same direction. Ears back, tails down, eyes wide, and huge and reflective. It stops after maybe half a minute, and the cats suddenly act like normal cats again. The ones circling us get up and wander around. A minute later, Eli abruptly walks back in. He looks fine. Not a scratch on him, but he's lightly splattered with a disturbingly viscous pitch black liquid, except for his right arm, which is coated up to the elbow with stuff. I don't want to know. I do not want to know. The cats start filtering out the door. We can go now. I don't really have a lot of clarity for a bit afterwards. I vaguely remember walking, then running out of the building. Everything was normal again. The exit was easy to find. Bill booked it the second he was outside, no looking back. A couple of cats followed him though. Susan and I stood outside with Eli for a few minutes. She tried asking him what happened, but he just shrugged and said not to worry. He took care of it. If I wasn't still so terrified, I'd have been pissed at not getting an actual answer. We all went home. 
Eli walked back some of the way with me. Susan got another entourage of cats. We didn't talk about anything else. And when I could see my house, I felt Eli pat me on the shoulder from behind. He was just gone when I turned around. When Susan and I talked about it a few days later, she swore he'd walked home with her and that I had walked off with a cat party. Needless to say, the urban exploration fucking stopped. We never saw Eli again. I looked around a little, but I wasn't sure I wanted to find him. Susan did though. Holy shit did she want to find him. Pretty sure she put up missing persons posters at some point. No luck though. Torpedoed any chance I had with her. Eli was all she talked about. Bill refused to discuss it at all. Didn't even want to talk to me or Susan much. Think he was trying to put as much distance between him and that night as possible. He picked up a drug habit a couple of months afterwards, and from what little I got him to talk to me about, it seemed he'd apparently retroactively decided that night was just a hallucination from bad weed or whatever, despite him never having touched the stuff until well after everything went down, and all three of us having the same experience, but I'd never taken drugs in my life, and Susan definitely hadn't. Self-delusion's a hell of a thing. Back in the present, Moved the hell out of that town. So did Bill. Susan's still there. We still talk semi-regularly. She works at an animal shelter. She owns three cats. I don't have any room to judge. When I was looking to move out to my own apartment, the first thing I asked the landlords was her policy on pets. I bought a cat the first day I moved in. Bill actually left the state entirely. Still won't acknowledge anything weird happened back then. We still don't talk much these days, but once, when I spoke to him on the phone, he admitted that he keeps cats as well. Six of them. So, to sum everything up, I was attacked by Eldritch Hobo Bigfoot, then rescued and cockblocked by a magical cat boy. Thanks, Eli. You son of a bitch. Ten years ago, family moves into a new house. Great house. Parents couldn't believe how cheap it was. Weird things starts happening a month after we move in. Hear creaking noises upstairs, like someone is walking around when nobody is there. Dog keeps watching something invisible move around. Always acts nervous when upstairs. Inexplicable puddles of water appear on upstairs bathroom floor overnight. Weirdness starts escalating over the next few weeks. Hear drain an upstairs tub gurgling at night. Puddles on floor get bigger, but we can never find where the water is coming from. Start seeing shadows walk past doorways. See movement out of the corner of your eye, but nothing is there. Dog refuses to go upstairs at all now. Pissed himself in terror and ran when I tried to carry him upstairs one night. Start hearing whispering at night. After a couple of months of this creepy shit, she appeared. Roughly mid-teens, transparent and naked. She would appear at night, but only if you were alone. Never moved. Never said anything, just stared at you. Left a puddle wherever she stood. My sister ran, screaming out of the house, more than once. Freaked me out, too. My parents slept in the same bed, naturally, so they were rarely alone at night, and didn't see her at first. They decide this shit's real and do some research. Ask neighbors, look up records at county courthouse and library, etc., House's original owners had a teenage daughter who slipped in the tub and drowned in the late 80s. They didn't want to be where she died and moved shortly afterward. House went through a series of owners, none lasting more than a year, and finally sat empty for six years until we bought it for what we thought was a steal. Decide, there's no way we're putting up with ghostly bullshit. Call a priest to do an exorcism. He never believed us, but humored us anyways. Didn't work. See-through girl was still ruining our floors with puddles every night. Called a local psychic. She did a seance. Talked in a fake pirate voice. Then a fake little girl voice. Then demanded money. Kicked her ass to the curb. Tried all kinds of shit we read on the internet. Burning sage, holy water, lemons, etc. None of it got rid of the ghost girl. Eventually decided to just suck it up and live with it. Parents sleep together, so they almost never see her. 
Sister is always staying at a friend's house when she can manage it. Meaning, I have to sit in my room, alone, all night, with some wet ghost staring at me the entire time. Fun! One night, my sister is at a friend's house, again, and my parents are out late, so I'm home alone. Bored as hell, flipping through channels, trying to ignore Ghost Girl dripping on the floors and staring at me. Suddenly realize I have a naked chick in my room, and if you ignore the fact that she's see-through, she's pretty easy on the eyes. Eh, fuck it. Zip. Fap, fap, fap. She vanished right then and there. Never appeared again. No more creepy noises, no more puddles, not a single sign of ghostly activity. Bitch didn't even let me finish. And that's how I exercised a ghost from my house. Sam decides to start reading Skinwalker stories. He is doing it just to mess with me, but that knowledge doesn't matter. Midway through the story, we hear a screech through the dark trees. It was probably a fox or owl, but for my impaired mind, it was the Skinwalkers. They were coming for me. My friends were also kind of spooked as well. I was not going to die without a fight though. Remember my days on Slash K, reading about simple but effective traps laid by the Viet Cong. Light bulb duck if. I took out my shovel and started digging punchy pits all around our tent. Matt starts making an alarm system out of beer and empty bean cans around our perimeter. Sam decides more light is better than less light. How do you get more light? More fire. Did I mention Sam was a bit of a pyro? He collects a shit ton of wood and makes a fire circle around the tent. The final touch was to wipe the spikes I had previously made with our own shit. Finally, our defenses were finished. We were ready for the attack. Stinks of shit and the smoke is pretty bad so we all put on our gas masks. No stalker forgets his gas mask. Decide to drink more Soviet liquid courage. Matt starts yelling, Perimeter breach! Perimeter breach! At the top of his lungs and starts firing into the forest randomly. Not sure if there actually was a breach, but I wasn't taking chances. Start mag dumping into the darkness. Forest sounds like the Alamo. Blind myself because I'm an idiot. Run out of ammo eventually. Only one mag left. Need to make it count. I fell asleep at some point due to fatigue and alcohol. When I woke up, I finally could appreciate the marvel that we had created. The ranger that woke me seemed less impressed. Stage 4 autism takes over and I say, Previous stalker? Realize I still have my gas mask on, and probably look like a complete weirdo. I get arrested, and charged with a misdemeanor and fine $400 for firing a weapon in a national park, and am forced to fill in my skinwalker defenses. I'm a dogman. Ask me anything. Awoo! Who's a good boy? B19 walking along a dark country road alone. Suddenly, hear a strange humming sound. A bright light appears, coming at me at quite a speed. Wake up in the middle of the road with a broken leg and cuts all over my arms and back. Has anyone else been violently assaulted by a UFO like that? I mean, I have heard of people getting sick from UFOs and stuff, but never one physically attacking someone. You got hit by a Prius, idiot. Be me. 21. Frequent sleep paralysis. Fall semester. Hallucinated that my roommate had murdered someone and put their body parts in a box. Lights were off, but could see him grinning and whispering for me to look inside the box. His shadow was moving by itself. Told him I couldn't move, so he got very angry and pulled out a saw. His shadow was bouncing from one side of the room to the other. Panicked and shook myself out of it. When I came to... I was still shaken and not in my right mind. Woke him up, still saw the shadow bouncing from one end of the room to the other. He didn't see anything. He was obviously confused. Spring semester, no roommate. Sleep paralysis almost every night. Always a weird shadow thing. Started taking on its own character. Very sinister and erratic. Worst one, the shadow man wasn't there. Instead, a full-body demon was hovering over me, blue in the face, smelt awful. It wanted to possess me, but I was quoting scripture and it fled. 
Moments later, I shook out of it, and a rush of something came over me. Went to turn on the light and wake myself up fully. Turn on TV. Only static. Lights turned back off. I was so freaked out that I actually went and bought olive oil to sprinkle the doorposts in my room. Haven't had an episode since then. Also been here 10 plus years, so here is a story for you. Around 2013, I was at university and spent the summer break at my then GF's parents' house. They lived closer where I was working and they had a lot of room. Her grandpa had passed earlier on in the year, but her house began experiencing your typical ghost hauntings seemingly out of nowhere. We are talking thrown objects, moving items, footsteps, moving shadows, phantom phone calls with static on the other end, full body apparitions starting to manifest themselves. I was tapped on the head and back on two separate occasions. All this started happening around May and just ramped up as summer went on. Be me, hanging out with GF and GF's sister while her parents are out on a weekend trip. Hey gang, let's ghost hunt this bitch. Invite a couple of friends over so we have a group of five. Set up an area in the basement. Turn the lights off in the entire house aside from a couple of candles. Set up a recorder for EVPs and I download this app for ghost hunting. Gimmicky, but has a built-in EMF detector, and comes with a voice box function. It's not your typical voice box that scans through radio channels though. The theory is a spirit can manipulate the device, and it will say a word like a spooky speaking spell. We begin. First 30 to 45 minutes, nothing happens. EMF reading's low. App will randomly say words like cookie, or shoe, every once in a while, but that's it. Suddenly, there is a shift in the air. EMF starts to spike, and the air gets… heavy. Hard to explain, but there was just tension in the air and felt weird. Don't say anything about it or the EMF climbing. Just monitor while others take turn asking questions. GF speaks up. Is it just me or did the atmosphere change all of a sudden? Do you feel that? Everyone agrees. Ren stands up to go use the bathroom, which is upstairs. Follow his footsteps, and as soon as he reaches the hallway where the bathroom is located, the app speaks, Hallway! Lots of oh shits, and jokes that my buddy is going to get ghosted. He returns, and we continue on. Air is still heavy at this point. So, how did you die? App speaks again, like 20 seconds later. Famine! You know you're dead, right? Why don't you just move on? App. Can't. This continues on for a short period where we're getting responses within 20 to 30 seconds. Some direct answers, some others don't really make sense. Eventually, it slows down and the responses stop. We've been at it for an hour, so we start wrapping up. Once in a while, it'll speak something, like somebody in the group bang their foot on the table, and the app speaks foot. Eventually, we just go on with our night, hanging out, and nothing really happens after that. The house will still have little bouts of activity here and there from what I've heard. We broke up. But it slowed down. But when we were all there, we were always talking about it and thinking about it. I think the more you focus and put energy into whatever it is, just ramps up the activity. Like sort of a tulpa. I mean, you have five people sitting there intently focusing on this one thing. And then it just blew up all of a sudden. Years later, we were staying the night for a few days. I woke up to my GF shaking and smoking a cigarette out of the window. She was just scared as all hell. Apparently, she woke up to the lights flickering on and off in the room. And she looked over to the far corner and said there was some old man with grey, long, scraggly hair just standing there. And then he disappeared. Like, two nights later. I woke up to the lights flickering on and off, but I just noped and rolled over and went back to sleep. I was not going to look over and see that fucker standing there. Sleeping nude, as usual. Wake up. Sleep paralysis. Feel stroking against the side of my head. Here, there, there, it'll be fine. Feel imbued with power and rage. Suddenly, no longer paralyzed. Launch myself out of bed. Unmute computer. Turn on screen. Techno rocker Rob Maith Remix begins blasting at max volume, looping. 
grab Flamberg. Pick related. Run all through house, waving sword about while nude, flipping lights on, roaring, Come out and play, motherfucker! Did this for about an hour. 5.30 a.m. by the time my rage dies down, scream, Fuck yeah! Turn off lights. Go to sleep. No experience of sense. Also, neighbor asks me, what the fuck I was doing, running around naked with a large sword last night? Ask him why he was watching. He shuts up. Reality glitch thread. Post times where time and space goofed. Be me. Going to bed while staying at grandparents' rural farmhouse as a 10-year-old kid. Not tired at all. 100% lucid. Decide, eh, I'll just try closing my eyes. It's only 9.30pm. The moment I close my eyes, it's instantly morning. Literally within the blink of an eye, brother was in the twin bed next to me and he disappeared instantaneously. Can smell grandma making breakfast. You what me, Dodge Apeg? Never been able to reproduce what happened, or have somebody tell me the same thing happened to them. You fell asleep, you fucking idiot. Me about a year ago. Lifelong nightmares kind of gave me a horror fetish. Coworker tells me he didn't get much sleep. Says voices were keeping him up. Ask him if he means his family was being shit and staying up late. No, he has a big family and they're all crowded in a house. Says no. Says it was more than that. Keep pressing him to tell me what it is. He says there's some kind of entity or monster that lives in his room. Think he's fucking shitting me. He's serious. Demand more info from him. Claims that his room is haunted. Specifically, it's centered around his closet. Tells me at night, he hears voices and they sound clear enough, like they're talking to him. Says he suspects it's a succubus cause it seems to be a female. Harassed his GF, and he felt pressure on his chest before. Fast forward about a week. Party at his house. Start talking about ghost stories. I ask him about the closet again. He reiterates that it's haunted. His friends back him up. Say I brought my rosary with me. Carry it everywhere. Tell him, let's do an impromptu exorcism. He decides, sure, why not? Opens the closet. Looks like a normal fucking closet. Explains to me that every time it's been broken. Whoever broke it ends up breaking a lip somewhere down the line. Friends also back him up there. Whatevs. Start praying the rosary. Don't feel nothing. Coworker starts freaking out. Says he's feeling some bad energy. All things considered, according to exorcists, that means his house is haunted by demons, alright. Says we should stop. Tries to close the closet door. It stays stuck open. Says he can't sleep when it's open. Slams himself against it and tries to force it closed. It breaks. He starts freaking the fuck out. Eventually, after a few minutes, his friends and I fix the closet door. He starts to calm down. Have some drinks after. Says his house was built on native land or something. I tell him, you should honestly get a priest if it's that bad. Still, I didn't feel anything. Get in my car. Say a prayer to St. Benedict beforehand, just in case. Start car. Begin to drive off. It's pitch black out and pretty close to the desert. Live in SoCal. Turn on radio. It's some ungodly noise. It's set to the classical station. I listen to that normally. This is just some insane shit. Sounds like a combination of howling and instruments being played in slow motion. Other stations are just static. Sounds vaguely tribal. Kinda spooked. Look at GPS because the freeway I'm on seems unfamiliar. Tells me to do a U-turn in the middle of the freeway. Weird. Get off at the next exit. Try to follow its new instructions. Leads me back to my coworker's house. Check to make sure my address is correct. It should be leading me back to my house. Try it again. Start driving. Pitch blackout. No other cars on the road. Try the radio again. 
It's been quite a few minutes now. Still, horrifying ungodly sound on the classical station. Look at GPS. It's telling me to take a hard right on a fucking freeway. Literally into a wall. Then it changes and tells me to go back again. Really spooked now. Eventually, turn off GPS. Look at sign. Decide it's better to drive to fucking Los Angeles, which I'm familiar with, so I can find roads I'm used to and get home than trusting this fucking thing. Music seems louder, kind of reminiscent of a stampede coming towards you now. Mutter a few Ave Marias under my breath. Phone's GPS turns on again. Could have sworn it just says, turn around, in that text-to-speech voice. Say, fuck it. Shove phone into my pocket. Pull to the side of the freeway. Open glove box. Remove Eurobeat CD. Shove it into my CD player. Gas, gas, gas starts playing. Take advantage of the empty freeways to slam my foot on the gas. Roll down windows. Cool night air rushing through my hair. Yell as loud as I can. Fuck you, demon fucking slut. Entire car ride is me switching between swearing at a demon and muttering prayers I know. Pull to the side of the road. Make the sign of the cross one last time. Ask God for protection and say the prayer to St. Michael, the Archangel. Finally, say aloud that if some demon bitch follows me home, I will not stop fucking with her. I'm talking spritzing holy water everywhere and constant prayers of the rosary. I also remember what exorcists say about demons. Say she's just a bitch who can only act with God's permission, and he can withdraw it at any time, that she has already failed. Say, leave and never bother me or my friend again. Take out CD. Turn to classical. It's back to classical music. Other stations work too. Sleep soundly. Find out days later, my friend managed to get most of the activity to stop by threatening the bitch that he'd burn down his house just a spider if he kept it up. All in all, it went well. Storytime X, this shit is all true. B20, in college in Colorado. Live near foothills. Lots of cool wooded areas to drive through that aren't too far from campus. A friend, Simon, who is pretty into drugs. Occasionally, he'd ask me to do shrooms with them. One time he asks me, tell him I don't feel like doing them, but I'll babysit him and just smoke weed or whatever. He says, that's cool. Get a group together one Saturday and drive up the flat irons, pack in a bag of shrooms and a shit ton of weed. Five of us total, me, my friend Ian, and a girl I was into at the time, Sarah, are babysitting. Simon and our friend Kian are the ones doing shrooms. Park cars in one of those hiking area parking lots. No other cars. Seems pretty deserted. Middle of the day. At first we thought that was good, but then Ian checked the weather forecast and said there was a chance of rain. Our dumbasses didn't check the weather before doing this. Too late now. It's still pretty nice out at this point. Only like 2pm. So we head up into the hiking trail and go until we find a nice open area. We are literally 5 minutes from the car. Figure we don't have to go far considering it doesn't look like anybody will be hiking here anyways, and we're at a pretty remote place. The babysitters start smoking out of the pipe, and the other two discuss how they are going to eat the shrooms. Literally, right as Keegan pops his shrooms, Simon remembers he left his phone in the car. Keegan was a first-timer, so he was kind of paranoid and just wanted to stay where he was. I offer to go with Simon to the car. He just says, it's cool, just chill and he'll be right back. We all don't really think much of it because we're not too far from the car. Me, Ian, and Sarah are smoking, and Keegan is just chilling, waiting for the shrooms to hit him, laughing it up. Ten minutes later, Simon still hasn't come back. After about twenty minutes, we realize he should be back by now. Sarah considers going and looking for him. He probably just had to take a dump or something. We keep smoking. Start to worry a little. I'm about to go to the car to find him. 30 minutes after he left, we finally see him come up the trail, walking super slowly like he was being really careful where he stepped or something. Doesn't say anything as he approaches. 
We kind of interrogate him. He says he just got his phone, nothing else. We can't get more than 10 words out of the guy, and he's usually the most talkative motherfucker I've ever known. Like, literally everything was a one word response, or a shrug, and he doesn't smile at all. Kind of just go, fuck it, because Keegan is starting to feel his trip, so we turn our attention to him. Simon no longer seems to have an interest in the shrooms. Keegan is acting hilarious, describes shit he sees to us, laughs at everything. Fascinated by tree bark and shit. We are all laughing like idiots at him. All but Simon. I don't really bother asking him if he's going to take the half bag of shrooms. I just kind of figure he started feeling sick or something. It's been about an hour and a half now, and the overcast is getting heavier. Probably gonna rain soon. Me and Ian are discussing where we could go inside with a tripping Keegan, when Sarah just screams really loud and points out a tree a little ways away from us. What the fuck? Why are you screaming, bitch? She says she saw some huge furry animal go behind the tree. None of us believe her since we didn't hear or see shit. She says it moved totally silently, but she swears she saw it. Ian and I are kind of calling bullshit, but all of a sudden, Simon starts saying we should go check it out. You fucking serious? We all really want to leave now because of the coming rain, but Simon keeps insisting we go look at whatever the fuck Sarah saw. We kind of argued about this for what seemed like an absurdly long time. He kept saying we should go look, but not giving a good reason why. We said it was probably a bear or something that can maul us, and he would just say it won't hurt us. I remember very specifically him saying that it wouldn't hurt us. He seemed so confident about that. Like, he already knew what animal it was or something. Keegan is pretty much not moving from his little spot, and we can't just leave him there. I am pretty high at this point too, and don't really want to move either. Ian is finally like, Alright dude, if I go over there and check it out with you, can we just go? Simon agrees, and the two of them go out and kind of leave our view in our little clearing as they go towards the tree Sarah pointed out. We lose sight of them. Keegan is seriously noping out like on the verge of tears and tripping really bad. Sarah's trying to calm him down. My phone rings, which startles the fuck out of all of us, and I pull it out. It's Simon's phone calling me. What the fuck? Answer it and hear his voicemail message immediately. You know, like the message that would play if I called him and he hadn't answered. I swear on my life that I didn't pocket dial him or anything. It was an incoming call and my ringtone was going off and everything but his voicemail message played. Seriously, what the fuck out now? Hang up and start calling Simon and Ian's names. They don't answer. Heel raindrops coming down. Trees aren't giving that much cover. Suddenly, hear a weird moaning sound coming from the direction that they walk towards, not too far away from us. Kind of like a dog whimpering at first, but then it got louder and louder until it was on full wail. Sounded like something laughing, like a cackling noise. Kind of like a kick 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 but in no particular cadence. Okay, time to leave. Sarah and I have to lift Keegan up. He's pretty much in hysterics now. Start running towards car. I try calling Ian as we run. His phone is off or dead. We get to the car. Keegan gets in the back seat, seriously tripping out. Sarah is trying to calm him down. I'm outside the car, looking for any sign of the other two. See them only about two minutes later, coming on the trail. Except, they're both doing that super slow walk now, and both seem way too calm. When they finally get to us, I ask them what the fuck happened and if they heard that noise. Both of them say they didn't hear anything. Both of them say they didn't find anything. Both of them deny calling me, or receiving a call from me. They answer every question with one or two fucking words, and they don't seem to be phased by the fact that the other three of us are freaked the fuck out. It's starting to really rain, and we were out in the open, so I just really want to go home so we all get in the car. Ian and Simon sit next to each other in the back and barely talk on the ride back. Pretty silent overall. Keegan is huddled up, still tripping. 
I take us back to campus and tell everyone I'll just take them home and watch Keegan by myself for a while until he comes down, which would be hours from now. Simon and Ian both want to stay with us. They don't say fucking shit besides that they don't want to be taken home. They want to stay with us longer. I tell them I just want to go home at this point, coming down from my high. Sarah agrees. In the end, I agreed to drop them both off at Ian's apartment. Thought it was weird that Ian didn't want to go home. He and Simon were never that great of friends. Had never been there before. Need directions. Ian is being super fucking unhelpful, like he doesn't know where his own apartment is. I end up having to use my smartphone to navigate where I am. Notice that neither Ian or Simon take out their smartphones the whole time. Finally, find the place, and they all get out without saying shit. Don't even thank me or anything. Sarah and I kind of have a huge freakout after they are all gone and discuss how surreal the whole thing was. Discuss how Ian and Simon weren't acting like themselves at all, and make sure that the noise we heard wasn't just our imaginations. We both heard the exact same thing. Both describe it as cackling. Didn't sound human at all. Here's the kicker. Later, after I drop Sarah off, find Simon's phone in the front seat. On the way there, he was in the front. On the way back, he was in the back seat. In other words, he never got his phone from the car when he went back for it. Check phone call record. Outgoing call to me. I still have Simon's phone, and he hasn't made any attempt to contact me to get it back. This all happened a couple weekends ago. I figured maybe he was busy with finals and stuff, but now finals are over, and he still hasn't said a word to me. I'm kind of scared to give it back to him. I'm friends with his roommate who tells me that Simon is barely ever home anymore. He's always at Ian's apartment. Like, he'll just leave and sometimes won't come back until the next day, and then only for a few hours. When asked, he just says he's hanging out at Ian's. I'm really freaked out slash X. What the hell happened to my friends? Try calling Ian from Simon's phone and check up on what they're doing. Okay, so I tried this, and something weird happened. I called Ian's phone from Simon's phone, and I got Simon's voicemail message. When I call Ian's phone from my phone, I don't get anything. It just goes straight to voicemail. That's a little strange. Either way, neither of them are picking up. A commando fucks something spooky. Be me, 21 years old. My one popular black friend invites me to some inner woods rave. He's the drug dealer of our dorm. Carrying Gramps 1911 because I thought that some guy high on PCP would try to kill me. Also, slash K, three spooky five me threads. Middle of the night, full moon. Everyone but me is at least doing weed. I brought Stalaknaya because Maslavness, but I never drank any of it. I look around for someone to talk to because I look around for someone to talk to because everyone else is higher than a plane and listening to shitty rap. A minute later, see a girl that looks pretty sober sitting on a log near the edge of the camp. Brunette, kind of French looking. Seven out of ten would still bang though. Weird as fuck clothing, like we travel back to the sixties. Whatever, go sit by her. She's incredibly socially awkward, like 10 times worse than me. She also had a really thick French accent. Talk about where she's from. She's from Quebec. Start talking to her in French. I'm pretty good at it, by the way. She asks what my address is. I tell her the full address because my penis is starting to do the talking. When I tell her that, she does this thing where she cracks her neck by rolling about. Don't really think anything of it because I have OCD and do that sometimes. She asks me if I want to come into the woods and kiss her. Being a kissless virgin at this point, I'm okay with this. Leads me a mile in a woods. Get that coppery smell like in chem class, melting magnesium and acid water. Only sound is a nearby waterfall. Weird and kind of annoying because of my tinnitus. Start kissing. Really awkward. I pull away. She asks me, what's wrong? I tell her it's nothing. She tells me she can be anything you want. At this point, I think she's a trans friend. Think in my mind for a millisecond, 
How much better it would be if I were fucking this 10 out of 10 Ukrainian I found a picture of somewhere. Say no thank you and walk back to camp. I hear, wait, in this cute little Russian accent. I turn around. It is exactly what I thought of. Pick very fucking related. Now at DEFCON 1. Reach down and touch my 1911. Dick is 2000% erect though. My dick convinces me this might actually be worth dying for. My brain actually agrees. Have the best sex of my entire life. Nothing has been able to come close to that. Snuggle in the leaves for like half an hour and just talk about drugs and Russian music. She says she has to leave and just walks across the stream, but ass naked. I just murmur and, okay. I look for my clothes, but as I put on my clothes, I notice that her clothes and my 1911 have just vanished. Fuck. Walk back to camp. Use the belt method to CC my boner. Stare into the fire the entire night wondering what the fuck just happened. Wake up the next morning. Best friend asks what happened after I went into the woods with the girl. Basically tell her everything directly before it shapeshifted. Doesn't believe me. That's good. Buy an airshit 1911 until I can get another real one to try to fool my mom. A week later, still can't get my mind off what happened. A few nights, I had a nightmare that became way too spooky for me. At home, my mom goes to AC for a job-related reward. Listening to Vera Lynn. Hear knock on the door. Figure it's the pizza guy. It's the girl. She says politely, Hey, it's Kayusha. Do you remember me from last weekend? Decide it's best not to tempt fate a second time. Slam the door. Dynamically nope the fuck up to the attic. Burn some printer paper, smother some 30 odd 6 rounds in the ash, load up Gramps M1, stay in the attic the entire night cradling my M1. What exactly did I see there? It doesn't really match anything I've heard about before or since. I'm now pissed at myself for noping the fuck out of there. Every girl I've met after that I've ended up hating. I'm seriously debating going back into those woods and looking for it. And I want my Gramps 1911 back. Also, I wasn't wearing a condom when I fucked it. Does that mean anything? The Skinwalker. Human man comes into my home with a bunch of other obnoxious humans. But he's really nice. He's the only one who paid any attention to me and treated me like a friend. I wanted him to be my first. I ask him if he wants to spend some time alone. He says, yes, and I feel so elated. When I can't hear the other humans anymore, I start kissing him. His lips felt like they were made for me. He pulls away, and I'm scared that it went too fast or was too bad of a kisser. Maybe this form wasn't good enough for him? I read his mind and become his fantasy. Maybe then he would love me enough to spend more time with me. He comes back, and I feel so happy. I finally found a man who would be my husband. I hope I'm not getting ahead of myself. We make sweet love and he takes away my virginity. He was so gentle and considerate. It truly was the most special moment in my life. We snuggle for a bit afterwards, enjoying each other's company, but suddenly he starts getting nervous. I ask him what's wrong and he just says he needs to go. He quickly puts his clothes back on and runs away. He forgot his gun. It seemed very special to him since his scent was all over it. Luckily, he told me where he lived. It took me a while to get there on foot, but I managed to pay him a visit and return it back to him. But he slammed the door in my face and wouldn't answer it anymore. What did I do wrong, Slash Monster? He was my first love, and he's breaking my heart. I've never posted about my experiences before, but I was reading a green text that reminded me of an encounter I had recently. I figured it was enough of an excuse to open a thread for others to share their experiences too. Enjoy. Be me. Mindlessly shambling through Walmart one afternoon. Absolutely spaced out, not in this world, lost in thought. Think about dad. Think about his friends. Think about father's friend, Dave. Haven't seen Dave in years. Run cart into another person's cart at the intersection of arts and crafts. Oh god, I'm so sorry. It's Dave. And he looks horrifying, like a dead man walking. Shit snapped me back to reality, fast. 
Oh, hi Dave. Been a while. Didn't strike you as the kind of shop for art supplies. He just stands there without a word, staring blankly at me the whole time, eyes wide. His skin was dry and paler than I know it should be. His lips were cracked and his eyes were bloodshot. It was like looking at a crackhead's mugshot or an acid attack victim. Pick related, he was scarred similarly. Keep trying to make small talk, but to no avail. He's a fucking statue. Well, I better keep moving, Dave. It was good to see you. Yeah, it was good seeing you too, Anon. I better get going. He fucking spoke. Even flashed me a smile and a stiff wave. His teeth looked filthy. Thank God I couldn't catch his breath. Sounded like what I remember Dave sounded like, but raspier. Like someone who hadn't had a sip of water in days. Kept moving like nothing was out of place, but internally, I had escalated to DEFCON 2. The rest of my shopping went fine. Went home, pushed it up, went over to my father's home. Hey dad, guess who I ran into today? Dave. You remember Dave? Dad puts his beer down and his cigarette down in the ashtray I bought him for Father's Day a few years back. Looks me in the eye and goes, You're kidding me. The obituary section in the paper said he died Tuesday evening. You must be mistaken. Inspect newspaper. Sure enough, Dave had died. I was in disbelief. I knew he had gone down a dark path in recent years, but I never imagined he'd go the way he did. Laziness claimed his work opportunities, and from what I knew then, he pretty much drank and smoked all the time. Determined to get to the bottom of this, I reactivated my dead Facebook and reached out to his kids when I got home. Each of them had more or less the same to say. He was a deadbeat. He was always degrading and undermining our confidence. He was not a good father, etc. Learned from his daughter that he had been in some sort of accident prior to his passing that had left him facially damaged and scarred. My face one, I spoke to a dead man walking. Tell her I ran into him at Walmart. She's in disbelief. Tells me it's not funny to make up sick jokes, especially with the deceased having passed so recently. Threatens that her brother is coming for me. Plot twist? He doesn't. Tell the oldest brother about it. Well, call him Bill. He believes me. Gives me his phone number and tells me to call him that evening. Do so. Tells me about a call he apparently had the night his father passed. Receive phone call from his father. Apparently, his voice sounded similar to what I described to Bill. Raspy. Off. Hey Bill, I'm awful sorry I wasn't accepting of you as a kid. You're a good person, regardless of the fact that you like men. I love you, son. That's more or less what I was relayed. Hung up without another word. Dave to the grave always gave the oldest shit for being gay and doing theater. I believe you, Anon. I know my sister is just aching right now. It's a hard loss for all of us, despite everything. Chat with Bill for a bit longer before hanging up. The next day, I go back to my father's place and catch him up to speed. He's quiet for most of the rundown, though, as I went on, I could tell all I was doing was making him sad. Drop the topic. You know, Anon, he wasn't always an asshole. For context, my father's friends and associates have been dropping like flies since 2019. Needless to say, he doesn't have very many friends these days. Even though Dave had really cut ties with my father, he still wished the man all the best. I think even now he longs for his friendship. He turned out some good kids though. For a dead man? Maybe dad? You really saw him at the arts and crafts aisle? Yeah dad. Why? He always said only women and fairies shopped in that aisle. Laughreel.wav my face when Dave went to make his peace with the arts and crafts aisle before passing and bumped into me. Don't know why he was pushing a shopping cart though, since he's dead and all. My grandpa would never go in his attic, would never tell us why. Me and siblings grew up not really questioning it. All of us just knew that Pop Pop wouldn't go in the attic. Whenever he needed something from it, we'd go get it for him. Totally normal attic. Never got any spooky vibes from it. Years later, grandpa dies. Died peacefully in his sleep. I go stay with my grandma to keep her company. One night, we're up late talking about old memories. I bring up the attic and a story. Grandma gets really quiet. Asks if anyone ever talked to me about why he wouldn't go up there. Nope.jpg. She tells me that when they first moved into the house, Pop Pop couldn't sleep. He said something about the house just didn't feel right. He paced all night like he was crazy. 
went over every inch of the house with a fine-toothed comb. Grandma is really worried but doesn't say anything. One night, he goes up into the attic. She hears him start screaming. She sprints up the attic and finds him curled up in a ball. He's sobbing. Grandma asks him what happened. He looks up at her and tells her he figured it out. He points to where the eaves of the roof narrow down towards the far end. She looks. There is nothing there. Then, she looks closer and sees something she can't really describe or explain. All she could compare it to was origami. It was like space was folded up on itself. The angles were all wrong. She said that when she looked at it, she could feel herself going crazy, like something inside of her was melting. She drags Pop Pop down the stairs and puts him to bed. He sleeps for two days. When he wakes up, he says he'll never go into the attic again, as long as he lives. Never says another word about it. Ignores Grandma when she brings it up. Grandma goes quiet and I don't say anything. We moved on to other stuff and she hasn't brought it up again since. Turns out most of my family knows. That part of the attic has always been blocked with a huge old bureau. Now I know why. Now I had a very good friend who I will call Sherlock because he believed very much in similar philosophies to Sherlock, as in deductive reasoning, the purity of a priori logic. I've heard him over the radio when he's being shot at and having RPGs fired at him, and he sounded as calm and relaxed as somebody on holiday in an ice cream shop specifying what flavor they wanted. For example, Cucumber Crisp 071, I'm under fairly heavily sustained fire. It looks like part of my fuselage just gave way. Over. That sort of thing. I'm fairly sure he was slightly autistic because he just wait until base told him to pull out or whatever. He also had no mercy. If he had authorization to fire, he'd light them up. No qualms, no limitations. Anyway, I've seen Sherlock quake like a fucking leaf in the winter wind. It must have been around 3am and there was fuck all to do. I was playing poker against the computer and winning. Another friend of mine was reading Kant on my bed when he walked into my room. Pretty unusual because he always knocked. He'd delivered some supplies to an outpost about 70 kilometers away from the main base. Not deep in hostile territory, but hostile enough that you'd expect an RPG or two when you supplied them, or took out the wounded, which is mainly what Sherlock did, even volunteering to do it. He'd sat down in the afternoon and helped unload some supplies, mainly medical, ammunition, and tools, and stuck around taking requests from the CEO who was running low on water and water purification tablets. A few privates were on duty in the dusk, and one of them freaked, saying he could see something through the thermals that he couldn't see in person. This piqued Sherlock's curiosity, so he had a look. Sure enough, when he looked through thermals, he could see the shape of a man about 200 meters down the path, but looking with binoculars, couldn't see anything, even with night vision. This is quite common in Afghanistan. It's reported uncommonly. Despite this being an uncommon event, it's always quite unnerving when it happens. But according to Sherlock, he wasn't unnerved, just his deductive reasoning pricking up. First, he thought the thermals were dodgy, so he used another set. Then another set. Then he thought the binoculars were bad, so he used another pair, which weren't just thermal imaging, but infrared night vision. Rather than a shitty green tinted type, it was a grayscale type, which showed significant detail. Now, on the infrared grayscale, he could see it. Apparently, it was a human in everything other than having a head. The body was human, perfectly proportioned, but there was no head. Now, the other night vision didn't show this. Sherlock, armed with nothing other than our standard issue Browning high power and probably just a single magazine, strolled 200 meters down the path to see if he could see anything. Apparently not, though he said it felt unusually chilly and he did feel quite uneasy. It was on his way back when he heard soldiers shouting. Looking behind him, he saw four or five putrefied bodies shambling after him. He described the smell as rancid and their look as if they had contracted the vilest leprosy. They were moving pretty quickly, and he could see body parts. Fingers, hands, even an entire arm drop off. When he said they were like the walking dead, I felt a chill go up my spine. My friend reading Kant actually looked up at us. Sherlock said he shouted a warning to the bodies, apparently rotting as if dead for a few days, appendages and torso swollen from the sun, and as they continued to gain ground on him, begun opening fire. Despite one of them being hit several times, losing most of its shoulder and through the stomach, it single-mindedly continued pursuing Sherlock who, for the first time ever, sprinted away. 
a rifleman at the outpost shot them with a more high-powered weapon and killed, rather re-killed, one of them. As soon as one of them went lifeless, the others would single-mindedly stuff their faces full of flesh, just tearing it off limbs and bodies. No shame, no disgust, like they hadn't eaten for days. At this point, the fellow reading Kant piped up. He'd heard of similar stories in his journeys to outposts. Some American soldiers, badly injured and delirious in the sun, told him how they had seen their brothers in arms set upon by filthy mujahideens and ripped apart, alive. Limbs ripped from bodies, heads from necks, and how they would rip the flesh off with their long fingered nails, gouging it out or buying it off the bones. They said only fire or high velocity weapons, not small arms, could stop them. Afghan soldiers, when mortally wounded, prefer to kill themselves than be captured, because they've heard the stories and know the folklore. It is true, they kill themselves, I've seen it. As I became more experienced and hardened to the oddness of Afghanistan, I also heard quite a few of these stories myself, to the point where they don't even worry me anymore. I think I even saw a herd of them rampage through a village. But it's Afghanistan, so they could have been tripping on opiates. The bar I work at is haunted. I don't really believe the stories, but I find them interesting nonetheless. Most of them are pretty bland though. A guy goes to the bathroom and sees a man taking a piss in one of the stalls. Doesn't hear anything, just sees the guy's feet. After finishing up, he glances back at the stall and there's nobody there. Just little things like that. Another one I've heard a lot is when people are starting to get quite drunk, they'll see a nun sitting next to them. She doesn't say anything, but it usually makes them stop drinking. Obviously, since it's a bar, I tend to chalk this up to people being very drunk and open to suggestion. The ghost stories are kinda known. But recently, a barback told me one. This guy was straight laced, didn't drink at all and only worked there for a couple of months because he hated the atmosphere. One night after closing, he was hoping the bartender cleaned the bar. Bartender steps out for a smoke. Barback is behind the bar, sanitizing the well, when he gets an eerie feeling and happens to glance up. There's a man sitting opposite him at the bar, staring angrily at him. The barback is looking into this guy's eyes when he fades away. Not disappears, but fades, as though he melted into the background. Again, I don't really believe it, but the guy seemed genuine. Here's another longer one that I believe even less, but it just happened recently, so I'll share it. A fellow bartender was out for a smoke on the sidewalk and a homeless guy asked him for a cigarette. Long story short, the bartender ends up hiring the homeless guy to clean the bathrooms for $10 a day. Homeless guy's name was Derek. He was always a great worker. He'd always be out on the front stoop waiting for me to open up the place. Then he'd clean the bathrooms and mop the floors without saying a word. I'd pay him 10 bucks and he'd leave. But one day, I showed up at the bar and the door was already unlocked. Derek was inside, sitting on the couch waiting for me. I asked him how the hell he got in, and said the place was unlocked before he showed up. Nothing was stolen. The closing bartender insisted he locked the door before he left. Tells the owner, but he just seems happy nobody stole anything. This happens three separate times. Since nothing is ever missing, the owner refuses to fix the security cameras. They don't work. The owner is very shitty with money, by the way. Anyway, last week, we're about to get hit with a winter storm, the one that knocked out the power grid here in Texas. It's Saturday, and Derek's waiting out front, shivering. I ask him if he has a place to stay, and he says he does. Okie dokie. Once Monday rolls around, people are losing power all over the place. Since I live basically down the street from the bar, the owner tells me to see if the bar lost power. Thanks a lot, dickhead. I drive by and it looks fine, but I get out and run inside to check on everything. I find the door unlocked and Derek on the couch wrapped in a thick blanket. These blankets are kept in a basement that's always locked. The power is on so it's warm, but Derek is shaking like he just got in from the cold. I ask him if he's okay and how he got inside. He said he was sleeping on the stoop when some lady opened the door and let him in. He curled up on the couch and felt someone put a blanket on him. Then I showed up. There was nobody else in that bar but us. Like I said, it's hard to believe. Maybe the fucker just figured out a way to unlock the door and was lying to me. But I double checked the basement that we keep those thick blankets in. It was locked up, tight. 
be driving home from a work trip with my coworker Mark. Be late, around 11.30pm. The road is leading through a forest, no other cars in sight, cloudy sky too, so pitch fucking black. Hey Anon, I need to take a piss. Okay. Stop the car. He gets out. Walks about 20 meters into the forest. I'm not sure how far since I can't see shit from the car. Hear him trip on some stick or some shit and curse. Laugh at his shy bladder. Next time just take a piss next to the car, you idiot. Didn't really say it out loud though. Mark finishes pissing. Walks out of the forest and gets back in the car. Continue driving for 10 minutes. Mark just silently stares out of the window. Suddenly, my cell phone rings. Pull out my cell phone and look at the display to see the name of the caller. It's Mark. Cold sweat immediately floods my entire body. Every muscle clenched. Start shitting myself. Oh god, the thing who got back into the car with me isn't Mark. Put the phone to my ear and accept the call to not look suspicious. For a second, consider just jumping out of the fucking car. Remember I have a switchblade in my pocket. Fuck, should I go for it? Hear a voice from the phone. It's Mark's GF. That retard left his phone at home and so she was calling me to make sure the work trip went okay. Close off the stream of soft stool pouring down my underpants. Mark will never know how close he actually came to having a knife in his neck because his coworker is apparently a mentally damaged retard. Alright, here goes. Not gonna pre-write because fuck that noise. Have dad that lives in the middle of the Ozark Mountains. Stay with him for a few weeks to a month every summer. Mom has custody, but she and dad are on good terms. House isn't great mate, but he made a lot of furniture out of the local cedar, and he's a pretty skilled carpenter slash engineer type. Has his own sawmill and wood shop that we, brother was with me, used to make candlesticks and tables and things when we got older. House had this little screen wall porch, important litter, on the side 90 degrees away from the door. It has a sliding door, but it's busted, so you have to walk about 20 feet around the house each time you want to go in or come out. Anyway. B11 or 12. Few days left until we go home to mom's. Excited to go home and play video. It's nighttime. Me and bro's bedroom is on the second floor. Only window has a good view of the front yard. Read, trees to left and right, driveway and road to front. Trying to fall asleep, but too excited. Hear dad and stepmom talking downstairs, which is weird cause they're always asleep by 10ish. Front door opening dot WAV. This is weird. Look out window, see dad walk out with a flashlight in his old double barrel. Don't know model, sorry commandos. Goes to leftmost tree line and shines light here and there. Debate waking brother up about this, but he gets pissy real easy. Hear a gunshot and nearly shit myself whipping back to the window. Look back in time to see dad thumb another shell into the breach. Whatever he was doing, he wanted two shots at the ready. So nervous, I actually hear the clack of the gun. See him walk backwards all the way to the house, trying to hold his gun and flashlight up at the same time. It was one of those big clunk fucking ones that used the massive battery. He makes it uneventfully. I'm too wired to fall back asleep. Next day, he seems weird and more quiet than usual. Doesn't want to do any of the stuff he normally leaps at with us. We left a few days later and I was too chicken shit to ask him about it. The next year we visited though, Things were different around the house. Drive up to his house. Rode there with a half-grown English Mastiff taking up 80% of the back seat. Friendly enough to us, but slobbery. Finally make it around late afternoon. Suddenly, lights. Fucking everywhere. Floodlights at each corner of the house. Lights on posts. Goddamn Christmas lights strung up around the outside. Honest to God watchtower set up on three sides of the house. Sawmill's been moved. New platform on top of the wood shop. Four or five new guns. All high-powered rifles. Again, no model because I was a kid. All I have now is a 700 ADL for dirt hunting. My fuck. There's even a concrete bunker. It's Kay's wet dream. And before fake, I shit you not, my dad's place is still set up like this. It was in the days before camera phones. Early 2000s and it never occurred to me to take pictures of his shame until now. Ask him what it's all for. Platforms. Ah, there are deer stands. Four of them, all within 200 feet of the house. Bunker. It's auto maintenance. Nice roof on your auto maintenance pit. The lights. To make the place more cheery. 
or to blind commercial aircraft, the dogs and guns, to keep weirdos off the property. The ways he answered my questions still bugs me. They sounded 100% rehearsed. Anyways, thanks for reading past all the expository bullshit. Needed to set the stage for next post. Right, now for the shit my dad doesn't like talking about. Go to bed that night. There's a new heavy curtain on the window. Why? Because the lights are always on. Wake up that night to a gunshot. Look outside. My eyes dot JPEG. See dad on one of the deer stands, working the bolt on one of his new guns. Something's up. Next morning, he's practically vegetative. Ask him about last night. Trying to get us a deer to barbecue. Shrug dot GIF. Ask if I could go outside and play. He thinks for a moment and says, yes, but not to go off into the woods. Super intense eyes when he said that last thing, despite being raccoon-eyed. Go outside. Make a beeline for the stand he was on last night. Feet clink on a pile of 30 caliber shells. If you've been doing your math, all the new gear, plus those expensive-ass rounds, should be adding up to quite a sum. His job's not terrible, but that crap must have been expensive. Fast forward a few days. Dad got a pig from one of his neighbors. Closest one is at least five miles in any direction, and we spent the day learning to barbecue properly. Dad has the shoddy on standby, and Fonzie, his old German shepherd, nearby the entire time. That evening, we're all sitting on the screen porch, licking our fingers when Fonzie starts barking his head off, staring at the ravine behind the house. The dogs on the other side start barking and growling too. Dad starts up and nearly knocks the plate off his lap. He grabs the gun and stares down the ravine. Cat. Stepmom. Take the boys inside. Suddenly, hear the sound of branches snapping from trees near the bunker. We are being flanked. Brother and I are swapping nervous glances, just about pissing ourselves. Without a word, Dad hands Cat Fonzie's leash and takes the rear while she leads us inside. Once inside the greenhouse, it's a straight shot to the door and the six of us go in. Dad grabs a flashlight a new gun, and a bug-out bag filled with rounds and goes outside with Fonzie. Cat tries to keep us entertained with a stash of old kids' tapes, but neither of us are interested. Brother wants to go out and help Dad. I'm pissing my britches. Is this guy British? There's no way an American's his britches. For about half an hour, it's nothing but gunshots, growling, and the occasional yell from Dad. The window-mounted AC is running, and there's a weird smell to the air. Old barbecue, gun smoke, and something absolutely awful. Not trying to copy OP, but it's almost exactly how he put it. Rank horse sweat mixed with something like old manure and hot death and stale piss. Cat decides to risk it and opens the door to see what's going on. When she does, the house is immediately flooded with a stench. She shouts out to him. He barks back. Keep that closed. She keeps that closed. Eventually, Bodily needs overcome fear, and I walk off to the bedroom. It's set on the wall that faces the ravine. This next bit's gonna sound seriously fake, but it's the reason I keep all of my windows covered to this day. As I'm shitting, I look up at the bathroom mirror. Something in the reflection looks back at me. It's illuminated by the light from inside and outside, so I get a better look at it than I ever would have wanted to. Bullet-shaped head. But not in the traditional sense. Stand a 9mm round on its base and you get the idea. Rough, grey-red fur with a forward-facing whirl, that little swirly thing on the back of your head, and what looks like a part on one side. Eyes? Fuck me. The eyes are the absolute worst part, just no thank you. Its face is sort of lopsided, but the nose is large and squashed. The mouth is hanging open a little, and the teeth are sort of tombstone-shaped and cruddy. My butthole nearly explodes from the sheer force of my fear shits. I just sit, shit, and stare at the thing's reflection, my mind failing to change gears. Then it leans forward and I hear the clunk of its face hitting the glass above my head. Thanks for reading. The more I type this out, the more it comes back. Like it always does in stories like this, yada yada. I'm at my mom's on winter break right now. It's in a woods and I have a thick blanket tacked around my window. Well, let's continue. The new source of input recalibrates my brain. It realizes that this thing is right the fuck behind me. I start wailing like a banshee, hear the thing gurgle, 
fucking gurgle through the glass. Flail sprint my way through the bathroom door, trip on my pants, still around my ankles, and get a chunk of wood from the kitchen's shitty particle board floor launched into my knee. Too scared to feel pain or embarrassment, Cat and brother come into the kitchen, see me panting and sobbing, sprawled on the floor, pants around my feet, staring at the bathroom. I didn't even have time to wipe. Cat asks what happened as I pull my pants up. Dad comes barging through the door. Guess he heard my screams and thought I was being fucked by some big gurgling monkey dog bastard. He sees me on the floor, bleeding, and immediately starts yelling about how I raised that much of a racket over a busted knee. I see his fear slash relief slash anger, and raise him the hurt and pure terror of a tween that lost his staring contest with a fucking monster. Tell him about the thing I saw. He tells me and my brother to go upstairs. Don't remember much after that except he went back out, left one of the dogs with us, and that cat helped clean and bandage my knee. The next day, dad wouldn't let us go outside, but the smell was still in the house. He called our mom up to come to Springfield, halfway meetup point, the next day. Pig was gone, about 80 pounds of exquisitely barbecued leftovers and carcass that dad had promised the neighbor in exchange for the pig. One of the dogs was missing. Dad stayed inside with us that night. I was too afraid to go downstairs to the bathroom, so he gave me a milk bottle and an extra blanket as a privacy tent. And that's really it. He took us to Springfield the next day after, making us promise not to tell mom. I might not have shown it very well, but he loved the hell out of us and didn't want her to stop bringing us. I was there again a year or so ago. We barbecued in his new, hand-built smokehouse. Drank, shot the shit, but the second I brought up the incident I've been posting, it killed the mood immediately. All he said was, we haven't been having any trouble for the last few, and went back to drinking. It's worth mentioning, though, that there's another new addition to his place. A concrete slab off past the trees in the back of the house. It's not raised off the ground, and it's not very cleanly laid out. It's about five feet wide, six or seven long, and if you kick up the dirt around it, you dig up a thin layer of black shit, like soot. Now, I'm not saying that he managed to kill one of the things, burned its corpse in a spit, and buried it all under concrete. But if he did, I hope it was that big gurgly bastard. Alright X, I have a story for you, so sit a while and listen. This takes place three summers ago during a boar hunting trip down in a very rural area of the Ozark South. My main reasoning for sharing this is that, ultimately, I don't believe in the paranormal. However, I believe I may have run across something that I couldn't explain and I want some input. Fair warning, I'm no good at green text. However, I'm not going to assault you with a wall of text. In any case, enough pretense aside. B back from college and wanted to go out into the woods. B bored as fuck on a Friday night and decided to head out super early for boar hunting with a buddy of mine, JD. JD is an eagle scout, not prone to being spooked very easily, and I have been hunting in places ranging from the deep south swamps to Alaska. We pack up our shit and leave this place around 12.30am. After stopping for energy drinks and beef jerky, every hunter's best friends, we end up getting out of there at around 12.15am. We just hunted this area for boar many times in the daylight seeing tons of deer, squirrels, and even a baby fawn that fell asleep by the warmth of our car engine once. Basically, a nice place. We pull off into the gravel tract, 40 miles from town and 3 miles from a podunk gas station slash deer check station. We decide not to fuck about in the woods at night. We'd had a lion mountain walk in our tracks on a previous hunting trip. Roll down the windows and decide to take a short nap. Instantly, we're hit with this nasty, cloying, sickly sweet odor. I just brush it off going, just some wet deer, <laughs> shouldn't mean our scent won't travel far in the heavy damp air. JD looks back at me and says, that smells like death bro, like a cow that's been out in the sun too long. I launch into a diatribe about him being a gigantic pussy and how he should deal with it. In any case, since we don't want either to be mucking about in the woods, home to mountain lions in the dead of night, or be accused of night hunting by some gay friend ranger we decide to go check and see if the Podunk gas station is open. Surprise! JD's shitty old four-banger won't start. Fine, looks like it's a nap followed by hunting while we wait for some toothless mechanic to come jumpstart his car. 
All the while, this smell just seems to be seeping in through the vents, and the cracks in the windows. It gets to the point where I'm actively retching in the car. Enough's enough, and we decide that if something had gone and died, we'd prefer not be stuck in a giant tin can right beside the corpse. We get out of the car, parked in the middle of this gravel parking area surrounded by tall grass on the north side and woods on all others. Why the fuck would you get out of the car? Just turn on recirculation. What the fuck? A swamp was to our direct west, full of boar, deer, and critters. As I'm sitting there, load up the magazine to my rifle. JD just keeps scanning the tree line with his eyes. To the Europores and Northerners, hunting in a swamp is close quarters. We hunt boar with semi-automatic rifles in the south. You want a quick follow-up shot in case the 400-pound ball of muscle with 8-inch tusks decides to charge you from 25 to 30 yards out. Something's got his hackles up, but I'm feeling fine, so I just dismiss it as him being a pussy. Anyway, suited up, we make our way down to the small footpath, one to two feet wide, that winds its way down into the swamp. However, reaching the tree line, we both just stopped, staring into the woods for a few minutes before either of us spoke. It was almost like shining a flashlight down a mine shaft, where the darkness sort of dissipated the light. I could feel my skin crawl, and something deep in the hindmost parts of my mind told me just to walk right back to the center of the clearing and wait for light. Nope. So, we do what any caveman would have done in that situation. We grunted out a few excuses to preserve our manhood, and went and sat the fuck down by his car. Like fuck, I'm going to bumble through the woods with a mountain lion, weed growers, and god knows what else at 3.15 by that point in the goddamn morning. The mood lightened and the smell seemed to recede a bit, so we just busied ourselves checking our rifles and talking about girls, politics, and history. We're a weird bunch. After a while, the smell started coming back, and we began to voice our concern that something that smelled fucking dead was moving around. As the smell starts growing more and more oppressive, I hear branches and twigs break in the undergrowth. Whatever it is, it's moving. I don't like that one bit. At this point, I'm thinking it's a mountain lion that's covered in gore from a recent kill that's about to go full territorial mode. That wouldn't have been out of the question, but it wasn't. As I strained to hear where it was, I noticed that the snapping didn't come from the pat 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 of a four-legged animal. It resembled the crunch 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 of a novice hunter picking his way through the undergrowth. My first thought was that we either had a ranger with a sick sense of humor, or a drug grower with a great sense of humor, or worse, a motherfucking serial killer. Either way, weapons were shouldered, bolts closed on loaded chambers, and lights pointing towards where the sound was. Nothing. It's fucking nothing. Just the smell. And a slower now, crunch, crunch. And it stops. The smell is everywhere now. And, whoever it is, is sitting far enough back into the tree line not to be silhouetted by our lights. Smart asshole. No eye shine either, which ruled out just about any animal other than boar, which makes enough noise to be easily noticeable. Once again, the caveman brain rears up deep within my psyche and tells me, Fire. A fire, you idiot. Build a fire. So, what do we do? JD and I build a fucking fire. Throughout this whole affair, other than a few moments, we'd been mostly quiet. However, the fire gives us comfort, and whatever it is seems to back off into the forest, if only for a while. As the fire burns hot, we start joking again, having a decent time, convincing ourselves it was only a cougar. However, there is only so much timber in a gravel clearing, and after a while we'd have to venture out of the firelight to keep the fire going. That time came, and as the fire burned down to embers, the smell came back, more oppressive than before. And with that smell, came an almost oppressive feeling of fear. Not regular fear, but an intense guttural fear that made your muscles tense, your stomach turn, and your eyes go wide. Every fiber of our being told us to get more wood, to keep the fire high. Only with fire would we survive the night. So we cautiously walked to the closest tree line, Barely able to see the dying light of the fire, we'd been trying to save our flashlights. I was on guard duty, as we figured that my set me, 308 semi-automatic, would be a better standoff weapon than JD's small carbine. 
I'm tattling the fuck out at this point. Adrenaline flowing from a profound feeling that something just isn't right. JD leans down into the undergrowth to pick up a stick, reaching into the tree line. He screams and falls backwards while branches break right in front of him. He gets up, freaking out, dusting himself off, saying he saw something, staring at him first. Sunken eyes, a thick brow ridge, ashy gray skin. Then it smiled at him. Not so much smiled, but curled back its lips into a Cheshire grin. We are at NopeCon 1, gentlemen. I'm going to ignore the next hour of this hopscotch game with the fire dying and the smell growing more intense. Him, as we call it now, drawing near, building the fire back up, and him retreating back to stay away from the firelight. However, it should be noted that this entire time, he was circling us, probing our defenses, seeing if it could find a way to get up close without being seen. By the time 5am rolled around, we'd exhausted almost all of the dry firewood that wasn't within the tree line, except for the tall grass on the northeast side of the road inn. We, of course, do what we have to do, and slowly pick our way over to the tall grass. By this point, I have taped a flashlight to my rifle, and switch it on as we leave the firelight to get some dry grass. As JD is filling his hands with tinder, I check my right hand side and look down the road. I wish I hadn't. Just as I swing my flashlight over to the road, I see him for the first time. It's grayish black, with either sloughing skin or matted gray fur. I honestly couldn't tell. It crossed the 10 yard wide track what seemed like instantly, hunched over maybe five and a half to six feet tall, moving like a gorilla does. It's over. Something in my head just starts screaming, it's over. It knows you've seen it. It's not just territorial. It's circling like a predator. It is a predator. That feeling hadn't been one of fear, but of impending predation. Somehow, the lower parts of our subconscious had known what was going on long before we did. In any case, we ran back to the fire, popped the dry grass on top and waited for the smell to recede. It didn't. It was close. Very close. And this time, it wasn't moving. So we pussed out and got in the trunk of JD's car and listened as it passed behind the front of the car back into the trees. In a burst of brilliance, I decided that we either make the three mile run through the dark countryside to the gas station and pray the lights are on, or we build a fire big enough that one of the farmers or someone driving the main road can see it. We end up deciding that sprinting three miles through the dark countryside, guns on our backs could at worst get us devoured by him or shot by a terrified farmer. So we do the next best thing. I pull a fucking small tree out of the ground. I'm not talking about a bush. I'm talking a small eight to nine foot tree. It's amazing what adrenaline can do for you. So much adrenaline where your facial muscles are drawn tight and your eyes dilate to being nearly black. JD's description of my face. In any case, the fire burns bright, very bright. And after a while, he retreats further into the woods. This fucking tree burned a long ass time. Eventually, maybe 30 minutes after throwing the tree on fire, three lifted trucks come barreling down the road and flying into the gravel parking area. The first truck had an obscene amount of those off-road lights on the bull bar and roof, which lit up the whole glade like a fucking sun. The smell almost goes away entirely, still there but almost imperceptible. No one gets out of the first truck. A man wearing a National Guard t-shirt and ACU pants hops out of the second truck with his hands on his hip, concealed pistol. He questions us for about 10 minutes, makes us disarm, clear our chambers, and set our rifle in JD's car. He tells us there's a burn ban, we shouldn't be out here fucking around etc etc. We explain our car died when we came out hunting and made that as a signal fire. He just looks at us strangely at the word hunting, walks back to truck number one, comes back, tells us not to come back there unless we have all our ducks in a row. Truck three drives over and a man hops out to jumpstart our car. I shake his hand and thank him profusely and he gives me a worried but sympathetic look. He doesn't say much but walks back to his truck and drives away. Truck two drives away shortly thereafter. Once we've got all our shit packed up, truck one's window rolls down and a rather fat man in a polo calls me and JD over. There's no boar here boys. If you're hunting for boar, you'd best be looking further on down the road. 
at least on the other end of County Redacted. Bullshit. Tons of boar in there. But I don't say that. I'm not going to mouth off to the hillbilly militia that just saved my life. So I thank him for his advice. JD and I get back in his car, debating whether he had gone away with all the commotion. Just as soon as Fatty McLightbar had pulled out, the smell returned yet again. Nope, we're out. Hop on the gravel road, drive to the highway, drive past a few farms, and make our way towards the western border of County Redacted. We notice we're being followed by a small white Honda. Guess who's sitting in the front seats? Fatty McLightbar and Hillbilly Militiaman. They follow us all the way out of that county, then turn around. So ends my experience. It's hard to get green text to express emotion, the exact description of the smell, or the fucking primal fear we felt. I wrote an after-action report of sorts the morning after that hunt, but haven't been able to find it after I moved, hence the green text. In any case, I've debated going back with more than two people to hunt him, but I'd like to know exactly what I was dealing with. This is, of course, not touching the fact that the Hillbilly Militia Patrol seemed to know more than they were letting on. Ideas, X-Files? Uncle was dying of cancer. On hospital bed. Doctors said he had one day left to live. Sad. Go to my room and lock the door. Randomly decided to do a blood sacrifice by sacrificing my life for his. Drew a pentagram on a piece of paper, then cut my palm with a knife and soaked the paper with blood. Prayed that my uncle gets better in exchange for my life. Next day, uncle makes a miraculous recovery. This was just a coincidence, r right? Anon is so fucking dead. So, let me describe how I spent the last three summers. Live in Ohio. Couldn't fucking be me. Be camp counselor at Inna Woods, camping in Hawking Hills region of southern Ohio. Clear Creek Valley is one of the most biodiverse areas in the entire world. Not kidding, more than some rainforests. Nearest civilization is town of Rockbridge. Tiny, many miles away. Everyone lives in cabins with no air conditioning, power, or lights. I'm assigned to the older boys because I'm better with the bushcraft. Teach them batoning, fire building, debris huts, edible plants, the works. One night every week, we camp out, use the skills, and sleep under the stars. Every week, each cabin has to do a camp improvement project, or glorified chores. Little kids pull weeds on what few, unpaved, barely maintained paths we have. Big kids, 14 to 17, use saws, rakes, and shovels to clear out new campsites, or refurbish old ones. There's always been a rivalry between the older boys and girls, especially among the counselors. That's the camp. It's a nice place. I'm there for six weeks every summer, but the kids only stay for one week sessions. After three years of romping through the forests there, I know the place like the back of my hand. There's still some places I haven't been, but there are few and far between. As a side note, every counselor has a camp name, so campers can't find us on Facebook and stuff. I'm Hawkeye. My friends in the story are... Turkey, certified EMT and my co-counselor. Magenta, old friend and engineering student. Khaleesi, business student. Magenta and Khaleesi are counselors for the older girls. Turkey and I are counselors for the older boys. The last week of camp. Everyone happy to be going home. What camp improvement projects don't get done have to be done by counselors after camp is done, but before they can leave. Fuck that. Turkey, Magenta, Khaleesi, and I all agree to have our kids do all of the hard chores so we don't have to do them alone. We clean up at a campsite on the side of the hill called Black Feather. The girls clean up a site called Human Nature. They're bragging because it hasn't been used in around 20 years. Camp is 90 plus years old, and we finally get it up and going again. I'm a bit jealous because I've never been to that site. The only clue as to where it is is a dotted line on a 30-year-old hand-drawn map indicating a shitty trail. Magenta says she knows where it is. I think she's bluffing, but she's a smart girl. I figure if anyone can find it, it'd be her. Next day. Head to Black Feather. Find Box Tortoise and explain Tortoise vs. Turtle. A tree has fallen right in the campsite. Go go Gadget Saw! Fifteen teenage boys attack the fallen tree one foot diameter, with hacksaws. That bitch didn't know what hit it. 
Show them how to split wood. Black Feather will have firewood for many years. Return to camp. Now, it's time to select overnight spots. Magenta has a smug grin on her face, looks me in the eye, and says, We're going to human nature. What do you think about that? Never been there. Where is it? It's in a new part of the forest. We found where the firing was, but all the rocks were strewn about. That's weird. Nah. Walks away. Turkey comes up to me and says that he let a younger cabin take Black Feather as it's not too far a hike for them. Where are we staying? Tatanka. I was very excited because there is a very cool clearing right by Tatanka. Perfect for astronomy. It's right on top of a hill, so it's a tough hike, but that makes the food taste so much better. Next day, overnight day. 15 boys plus two counselors. We made hamburgers on a grate that we carried up. Seven pounds of meat to divide. We ate like kings. Campfire jacks for dessert. Basically, ten full wrap tortilla with chocolate and marshmallows inside. Uh-oh. Person who packed the food gave us no tortillas. I'm fine with going without, but some of the guys were looking forward to them. Don't worry guys, I'll just pop over to another campsite and see if they have extras. Quietly to Turkey. Where are the other campsites? I have heard the girls from downhill all evening, but I don't know where they are. I don't know, man. His first year counseling. But Magenta said human nature was in the valley. Did you see that raggedy ass trail leading downhill when we were headed up? Like 20 meters past the last cabin? I did see it, but it didn't look like it had been used recently. You sure that's right? Yeah, man, that's where the trail is on a map. It is around the right area, but the map even has written on it. Not to scale. Some sites may be overgrown. Alright man, that's about right. I go down towards the trail. 9.30pm, so it's dark. I've got a whistle. My Mora companion. Blade bathed in white ash so it works on demons. And headlamp. Get to trailhead. It's a bit dark, but not so much that it's oppressive. I head into the trail. About 5 meters in, it suddenly turns from undergrowth to grass underfoot. This is odd. All the undergrowth is getting thinner too, but the path is still very defined for something 20 years old. Suddenly, no undergrowth. Just trees. Almost eerie brightness. Don't even need my headlamp. It's a new moon, so this is fucking weird. The section of forest I'm in looks very new. Thin trees, low ground cover, no bushes or mid-level plants. The feeling I get in it though, it feels old. Like, walking inside a tomb old. I keep walking, more to distract myself from how weird this section of the forest is. I realize that I don't hear the girls anymore. They are normally very loud, being teenage girls. I stop. Everything in the world stops around me. Not even insects are chirping. I see fog slowly filling into the valley. It's now bright in there, despite being a new moon. This place is not good. I'm actually getting goosebumps describing it. A stream runs down the center of the valley. Shallow, but still a stream. I don't know why, because every fiber of my being said otherwise, but I continued on the path, crossing the stream. Once I crossed, a wave of the most powerful feeling hit me, one I can't even articulate to people. The best way I could describe it is feeling with every ounce of your body that something is the most despicable evil that has ever existed. This place was bigger than me. Bigger than the forest. I should not be there. I was more scared than anything. Since there was nothing to fight, I ran, further down a path. I don't know why the fuck I did it. Every step carried me further into it, but I couldn't stop. I felt like I had run at least a mile or two, but it was probably no more than a few hundred meters. I'm not afraid of admitting that I was almost in tears at that point. It's so much easier when there's something to focus your fear on, but when there's nothing, it just takes over. Suddenly, offside of increasingly dispersing path, glow of campfire. Sound of girls talking in low voices. Stumble towards campsite. Magenta's voice, much shakier than normal. H hello Who's there? I try to be as calm as possible to avoid spooking the campers, although I realize that they're already unsettled as is. Hey, Magenta, it's Hawkeye. I'm coming out of the bush. Oh, good. W what do you need? I totally forgot what I was there for. Just popping by. Cool. She says, then gestures me to come over to her, away from the campers. Hawkeye, what the fuck are you doing? Was that you? 
Where did you come from? Why are you here? I was getting something. Wait, was that me? What do you mean where did I come from? You took that path, right? She looked at me in the eye, and for a second, I see the same look that must have been on my face minutes earlier when I realized what I was feeling. She shook her head just slightly, and I could feel the color drain from my face. This was a bad idea, Hawkeye. What are you going to do? She told me how it felt much safer at the campsite with a fire going. She certainly wasn't going to lead them out through the forest in the dark. Khaleesi was also new and didn't know how to get anywhere, so it was up to Magenta. She said she'd stay up all night and tend the fire, keep the flames hot and large. I looked her in the eye and asked her if she'd be okay. She said yes, but didn't sound convinced. I remembered why I was there and grabbed some extra tortillas because, damn it, I'm not going to go back home empty-handed. Magenta shows me the path that they took. Old, but completely different from my ingress route. I make it back on the other path. I feel it as I leave the campsite, but it fades as I walk away. Make it to a big, well-maintained path. Holy crap, this is the same one the other path led out on. Walk back towards camp. Pass where it should have been. What? It's not there. It's like the forest path closed up. Some of the thickest forest I've ever encountered where that damn path should have been. I know that's where it was because there was a large boulder opposite of it. Anyway, make it back to Tatanka where my boys have been waiting for me. Turkey yells to me as I walk up. Hey Hawkeye, where have you been? Did you walk all the way back to the kitchen? <laughs> I realize it's like an hour and a half later. Uh yeah, the girls didn't have any. Come up, let the older boys take over teaching the younger ones how to make campfire jacks. Pull Turkey aside. The girls had tortillas. What? Don't ever go to human nature. There's something else in that forest. What do you mean? I have him look me in the eye. He sees that I'm not joking. Turkey, it's not a good area of forest. Never go there. Okay, man, I won't. We go back to bed, but I can't sleep on my hammock. I kept having dreams about the forest. The next day, wake up. Have campers rekindle fire since it burned down. Pancakes on griddle we hauled up. Clean up site. Pack. Head back to the camp. Get equipment put away. Send campers with turkey to get showers and stuff. Magenta pulls me aside outside the dining hall, but away from the campers. She has bags under her eyes, obviously from lack of sleep. Hawkeye, did you sleep last night? Not well, I kept having dreams. About the forest? Y yeah Hawkeye, if I tell you something, do you promise you'll believe me? You felt it, you know what it was like. Sure, Magenta, go ahead. Every girl either talked in their sleep last night, or woke up crying at some point in the night. We didn't eat breakfast, we just got out of there. Every girl? Every damn girl. I swear to you, I heard them. I didn't sleep a second, I was tending the fire. I don't know what would have happened if it would have gone out. Okay, Magenta. It's okay. I believe you. That's about it. Go home four days later. I don't know what the hell it was, but that's it. Sorry for the long post. I'll compile it into one big image and post it next time. Dude, I know that feeling. Went through an old brickworks near my house. Rumor has it that some kid got stabbed in the tunnels, and as soon as you step into it, you have that feeling of instant dread. You feel as if your body is being gently squeezed by something. Oh, on the master map, which is a hand-painted, contour lines and everything, map on a wooden board, which all the other maps are based upon, there is a red smudge between the path to human nature and the last cabin, right where my path would be. I shit you not. I think someone had a double meaning when they named the campsite human nature. Whenever I think of human nature as a concept, I think of conflict, war, hatred, and violence. The first person to found the campsite gets to name it, but nobody I've asked knows who's founded human nature. It's just always been there. I'll never go back. Camp is a wonderful place that has a special meaning to me, but human nature is something else entirely. Exactly. Trying to articulate it to someone who hasn't felt it is impossible. You need to feel the fear inherent to the place. It's everywhere. I can't ever go back. Magenta won't even talk about it. She yells at me whenever I bring it up. We have been close friends for years, but she won't talk about this. I have one, and it is about Great Uncle Donnie. Afghanistan, 2010. Deployed in the Horn. 
Six months into my first tour, on a dismounted patrol, suddenly, boom. RPG impacts over us. We start taking fire from RPKs and RPDs. We deploy and take up firing positions. I am firing my saw. Then I see a flash of light. Then I go deaf and blind after the flash and boom. An RPG exploded right in front of me. I am breathing heavily on my back when I regain my sight. Bleeding from several parts in my body. It fucking hurts, man. All I can think about is when to sleep the pain off. I feel like someone just punched me in the chest. I open my eyes and see a man wearing an old helmet. He's looking over at me and yells, I got you, buddy. I feel myself being picked up on my feet and he walks me back to our MRAP. He puts me down on the ramp and disappears. I wake up in a field hospital. They got most of the shrapnel out of me. My command team come in and tells me the story when I blacked out wounded. I apparently got up in the middle of the firefight, held out an arm and staggered like I was a zombie, all the way to the medical MRAP. I was medically discharged from the army in mid-2011. At home, helping my grandparents rearrange and organize. Going through old boxes of photos. I freeze at one photo. It is a photo of Great Grandma, Great Grandpa with Great Aunt Minnie, Great Aunt Stella, Great Uncle Paul, Great Uncle Bob, Grandpa Mike, and a soldier in a uniform. The soldier. It was the man who saved my life in Afghanistan. Grandpa Mike tells me about Great Uncle Donnie. Great Uncle Donnie was in the 32nd Infantry Division. He died July 27, 1942 on Papua New Guinea. He was posthumously given the Bronze Star with valor for braving heavy enemy fire to save a wounded comrade. After dropping off the wounded man, he turned right around to rejoin the fight. He didn't make one step forward before he was hit in the chest by a bullet. Be me, 16 years old, live in a shitty small town. Often meet with 5-8 to eight friends and go to the graveyard. Edgy. Always fuck around. Climb on big tombstones. One night there with about 7 of us. Same shit. Notice weird light in the sky. Mention it. All watch it, making split second 90 degree turns. Moving fast, turning on a dime. Not like any plane or satellite or shooting star. All of a sudden, it goes up in a mini explosion. No sound. The lighting changes, like the whole environment lighting changes. You know how sometimes at dusk, it's a little blue as the sun goes down. Well, the lighting went about three shades different at a snap of a finger. All look at each other and sense something bad. Run away. Long dirt roads through the woods to get back into town from the graveyard. Me and girl are at back of group. Slow down about halfway out. Hear twigs breaking in the woods near us. What the fuck dot PNG? Slow down and look into the bush. See a pale figure. Looks like a kid. Naked. Kind of hunched down, crawling through the woods, slow, with face pointed down. Look at her with some what the fuck type shit. She sees it too. Hang there for a second to make sure eyes aren't playing tricks on me. Nope. Definitely a pale naked thing crawling through the bush. Yell, What the fuck? Run fast to catch up with the rest. Didn't look back. Once we catch up, explain to the others what happened. Reconfirm with her what we both saw. Yep, same thing. Be me, now 24. Message girl. Haven't spoken in years. Ask her if she remembers that night and what we saw. Yes. Okay, just making sure. Continue living life. Spooky times. Scary story slash urban legend thread? Here is one that happened to me a few months back. I want to stress that you can literally google this instant if you want proof. Although the articles I've been reading have been highly sanitized, which is part of the reason I am posting this. Be me. South African. Going on a trip to Botswana. My sister is marrying a guy who's a game ranger, and I'm going on this trip to spend time with the dude and get to know him. I'm supposed to be the best man at the wedding even though we barely know each other. I arrive after a really long drive. Spend the first day drinking and driving dirt bikes around, generally having a great time. Next day, sister's fiancé suggests we go driving around the outskirts of the Okavango Delta in an attempt to see some wildlife. I agree. We go driving around and manage to spot some giraffes, leopard, hippos, and some different birds. Really fun, but insanely fucking hot. No elephants spotted. This comes up later. 
Eventually, we head back to the place we're staying at each night. We start to cook and drink. Sister's fiancé, I'll just call him John, gets a call as the sun's going down. I notice how weirded out he is by what he's being told on the phone. He hangs up, but definitely seems freaked out as we eat dinner. I ask him what's up, but John just dismisses it. Says it's nothing serious. After dinner, we start drinking more and more. John starts ranting about his boss. And that's who was on the phone. Says they found some dead elephants, and he wants John to go check it out. John tells him it's too dark to see anything, but he'll go tomorrow. John apologizes to me, tells me he'll be busy working tomorrow. I say, it's no problem. John, kind of drunk, feels really bad, says we're supposed to be bonding, but now he's leaving me in a shitty little chalet with no company. Night goes on. After a few more beers, John tells me that I should come with him tomorrow. I'm reluctant. I don't love the idea of inspecting dead elephants. John insists. Says they'll go by helicopter. Says it'll be much better than driving in the heat. I agree to go along. Next day, we eat breakfast and head to a small airstrip. Helicopter looks rickety as fuck, but I feel like complaining would just be rude. There are a lot of pre-flight procedures and we end up taking off just after midday. We fly around for about an hour, able to search a huge amount of area really quickly. There's me, John, another ranger, a dude who I think was a ranger in training, and the pilot. John and the other ranger have trank rifles ready in case they need to inspect a live elephant up close. Finally, spot something. About three elephants lying in the sun. We land a few meters away and hop out. The stench is horrible. Flies are everywhere. The corpses are half rotten and half eaten. I think it's weird that three elephants are dead together, but not too shocking beyond that. John and the others are discussing something. Conversation seemed pretty intense. I try to join the conversation so I don't seem like the silent autist of the group, lurking in the background. Uh, so I'm guessing some poachers shot them, huh? Everyone looks at me and they all seem annoyed. I think they were pissed that John invited a normie who didn't know shit along with them. Eventually, John says, Doesn't seem like poachers. The elephants still have their tusks. I hadn't thought of that and now I feel like a dumbass. They keep inspecting the bodies, and both rangers seem really interested in one of the smaller ones. It was lying on its side, but its face was pointed at an odd angle towards the ground, like it had been trying to stick its head in the ground. Finally, the other ranger suggests we keep looking to see if there are any others. We get back up in the air and fly around for about another hour. Ranger seems really troubled, but we see nothing. We land and they have another conversation about what to do next, while I just sit awkwardly in the helicopter with my feet hanging out. We have some lunch and John informs me that we're going to do one more search before heading back, as we only have enough fuel for about another hour. We were flying back and forth, so we were only about 45 minutes away from the airstrip. Before we finish eating, I overhear the ranger tell John that the smaller elephant really seemed like it had a broken neck. I blurt out, how the fuck does that happen? Ranger just glares at me and keeps eating. We finish eating and take off again and continue searching. After about 30 minutes, the pilot tells us we're heading back and turns home. But after just 5 minutes, the ranger in training starts pointing and shouting. Lying on the ground near a clearing of trees are about a dozen dead elephants. The sun's going down and the shadows from their corpses are easy to see stretching along the ground. We land nearby and make our way over. Smell is even worse than last time, and the bodies are ruined. I'm not much of a nature lover, so I don't know exactly what animals can do to other animals. Even so, I could tell some bodies had been picked at by scavengers. 
Their stomachs were torn open, and intestines spewed out everywhere. I asked John if maybe somebody had shot at them just for the fuck of it. He says, probably not. To kill this many, you'd need a helicopter to fire from above, and when that happens, like when they're tranked. They form a circle around the younger ones. But these bodies were all spread out over the distance of a kilometer or two, like they had been running away in a full-on panic. He then pointed out the state of some other bodies. A couple had feet and legs missing, which may be possible after being chewed on for a few days, but I can't imagine why some lions and hyenas would go for the legs and feet first while leaving the stomach untouched. After some inspecting, we all end up standing around the body of a smaller elephant, maybe a teenager who was missing its head. I don't mean its skin and flesh had been picked off by birds and wild dogs. I mean its head, neck, and right shoulder were gone, like they had been pulled off. Also, while this body was smaller, it was still probably a couple of tons and twice the height of a human. I actually wondered if someone had magically fed this thing a stick of dynamite or something. At this point, John and the other ranger are swearing and ranting about how fucked this all is, but I think the rest of us all knew that they were using anger to cover up their growing confusion and worry. After I let them vent a little, I asked, what do we do now? The other ranger snaps at me and says, we're going to go home and try to figure out how to explain this to the Department of Environmental Affairs. We all start to head back to the helicopter when the ranger in training says, What about the hole? We all turn and look at him, and John says, What hole? The ranger in training starts leading us towards a small hill while saying, I thought you all saw it when we flew overhead. Sure enough, there in the side of this hill is a hole dug at maybe a 15 or 20 degree angle downwards. This thing is fucking massive. It looks like a mole's hill, except it's as big as a subway tunnel. I ask John what I'm looking at, still thinking this is some natural phenomena I've never heard about, but he just mumbles that he has no idea. Finally, the pilot asks if we're going in. What the fuck? Dutch Apeg. What did this man just say? I just look at him like he's a fucking crazy person. Why the fuck would we go in there? Luckily, the other ranger says, Nah, it's almost dark. Let's just take some pictures and get back. We'll report this and let someone else figure it out. I'm beginning to like this dude. We start walking back. The pilot and I take our time checking the bodies some more, because the other three are taking pictures, and there's no hurry. Although I did feel really creeped out, I didn't say anything. Eventually, we all end up in the helicopter except for the ranger who has climbed up a body and is taking his last pictures. For some reason, I only noticed then how silent it was. No animals except for flies, which I thought was weird considering how much raw meat was present. As the ranger jumps off the body and starts heading back, we all hear a massive grating noise sounded like something huge was shifting against the sand. I immediately assume one of the elephants is still alive and trying to stand up. We all pile out of the helicopter and make our way towards the noise. I can't see anything because the light's fading fast and the horizon is dotted with giant elephant carcasses. I notice John and the others making their way up some bodies and I jump onto a nearby fairly intact corpse to get a vantage point. As I crest the elephant, Never thought I'd type that sentence. I stare out at the black silhouettes lying on the ground against the afternoon sky. For a while, I see nothing. But suddenly, my eyes pick up movement. At first, I think it's something coming out of the hole, like a fucking worm from Dune or something, and I tactically shit my pants. Then I notice that it seems to be an elephant trying to drag itself into the hole. John and the other ranger are already down the carcasses and heading for the hole and the rest of us are following. I'm not sure why. Maybe we just wanted to see a living elephant after all these dead ones. I won't pretend it was rational and I can't speak for the others, but I just felt like if we saw this thing up close, we might be able to get some understanding of what happened here. 
we all come around to the side of a truly massive dead elephant and stare towards the entrance of the hole. At this point, the light was dying fast and a lot of the detail was lost in the shadow of the tunnel. But, I swear to God, I saw enough to know I wasn't imagining anything. Standing at the entrance to the hole is a person, crouched over like a gorilla. The hair was long and matted, and they were completely naked. But the real problem was their size. This person was crouched over the elephant. Their body was actually slightly cramped in the subway sized hole. The elephant's body looked like a big gray dog next to this literal giant. Its proportions were completely fucked. Its top half was stretched out and spidery, with arms as long as a truck, folded so that it could fit inside the tunnel, ending in these wiry fingers with needle-like claws. Meanwhile, its bottom half was stubby and emaciated. This thing's legs were human enough in appearance, though each was the size of a fully grown man. But they were so withered compared to the rest of it that they almost seemed vestigial. We came to see it just as it was getting back into the tunnel. What had seemed like an elephant crawling into the hole had actually been an elephant's body being dragged by the leg into the earth. We all stood in abject horror as this thing pulled at the elephant's corpse like a sack of potatoes. We hadn't made a sound, but at some point, it turned its head around. Not like it heard something, but rather like it was a wild animal, checking its surroundings from time to time. Its eyes immediately snapped towards us. This thing's face was so fucked up. The eyes were white and milky, but I could still tell that it saw us. The nose was upturned like a bat, and its mouth hung slightly open as it breathed, revealing massive slab-like teeth, like something you'd see in a hippo's mouth. They were all crooked, and some protruded out at odd angles, but they all looked as hard as steel, and I could immediately imagine them tearing through the legs and heads of the bodies we'd seen so far. The strangest part was the shape of its head. It seemed disfigured and bulbous, like a fetus's skull. It also bent in on one side more than the other. The best way I can describe it is like the lady from the painting in It, except wider and obviously far larger. The skin was veiny, and although its shoulders and back were covered in dirt, it seemed as white as a sheet, almost to the point of being translucent. The skin around its eyes had enough wrinkles to act like eyebrows, which gave it a very surprised, slightly confused look. After a split second of confusion, this thing's face contorts into a look of absolute rage. It lets out this awful fucking roar. Sounds almost like the scream a deaf person might make. Sort of low and monotone, but it's loud enough that my hands instinctively slam into my ears to try to block out the sound. We all start spraying towards the helicopter. John's shouting something, but my ears are ringing, and it's too muffled to make out. We all climb into the helicopter in complete terror. I strap myself in and look back towards the hole. This giant fucking monster is clawing its way towards us. It's clearly moving as fast as it can, but it's still pretty slow. Its back legs are dragging along limply, and it's only moving by clawing at the ground in elephant corpses. It moves like someone who's paralyzed from the waist down. We all just sit there, petrified, and stare at it while the pilot starts the helicopter. I remember watching it grab at one of the larger elephants to try to use as an anchor to pull itself along. The elephant corpse literally slid towards it, like a fucking elephant corpse wasn't heavy enough for it to use as a weight. The helicopter starts to lift off, and this thing reaches out for us. It's still a long ways off, but it came a hell of a lot closer than I would have thought possible. Its whole body is probably longer than two school buses placed end to end. The ranger fires his shrink gun at it, but I honestly didn't even see it hit or not. Although I'd be amazed if he missed that thing. We don't stay around. The pilot turns the helicopter towards home, and we shoot back faster than I thought possible. I think I heard another dull roar as we flew away, 
but my ears were still ringing too much to be certain. Rest of the night was a blur. I don't remember much of the conversations after we landed, but I wasn't content with being back at the chalet. I just felt like the thing was still crawling towards us in the night and would eventually smash through the little wooden chalet I was in. I told John I was leaving right away and drove for another six hours before pulling into a petrol station and falling asleep in my car. When I woke up the next morning, I kept driving until I got home. I got in the shower and just stood there under the water for about an hour. Eventually, I called John and we spoke for a while about everything that happened. Apparently, they got a massive group together to go search the area, but when they arrived, they only found eight bodies and the hole had partially collapsed. Over the next few weeks, Jean told me about the attempts to track down whatever the thing was, but eventually they gave up and some of the other rangers started to think that maybe we all just had a few too many beers and came up with this shit. Apparently, he had quite a few arguments over what happened that night. Elephant corpses keep showing up near those holes, but nobody's willing to go walking into them to see what's inside. After another two weeks, John quit that job, and now he's working as a delivery man. You're probably wondering why you haven't heard about this. Well, you can find some stories about it, but most of them attribute the deaths to some kind of pandemic that spread through the population. You'll also notice they omit most of the pictures. They'll only show you pictures of the most intact elephants, so you don't wonder how such massive creatures can get pulled limb from limb, and they'll never show you the holes dug in and out of the ground. Here's an article in case you're interested.